Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Committee on Veterans and Legal Affairs. Uh, we've got a quorum present, and we're assembled electronically today for the purposes of inviting um, public comment on legislation that's pending before us. Uh, before we get started, we'll have the committee members introduce themselves, and I'll uh, call on each member kind of as I see them on the screen. So we'll begin with Chairman Chiazzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everybody. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, Representative Chris Chiazzo, House District 28, beautiful Western Scarborough. Uh, Representative Tuttle. Representative John Tuttle from District uh, 18, a part of Sanford, mostly uh, Sanford's east side. Mr. Chair, I'd like to wish everyone a happy St. Patrick's Day and congratulate my cousin Ed Snow on his fifth, fifth victory as mayor of Walton, New York. He lost uh, his seat uh, three years ago, but regained it yesterday in a landslide. I guess that bad gene runs in our family, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Representative. Uh, Senator Farron. Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Senator Brad Farron, representing uh, Senate District 3, which is the majority of Somerset County and the town of Rome and Kennebec County. Okay, Representative Dolliff. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Happy St. Patrick's Day. I'm Representative Josanne Dolliff from District 115 in the Western Mountains of Roxbury, Romford, Milton Township, Wick, and Sumner. Representative Kinney. Good morning, I'm Marianne Kinney. Um, I too am gonna to wish a happy St. Patrick's Day to all of those who either are Irish or want to be today. Um, I'm half <coughs> based not on my DNA results, but just based on my the history, the oral history that's been passed down. And I represent District 99 in Waldo County. Representative Wood. Good morning. Hi, I'm Barb Wood, and I represent House District 38 in Portland, which I think is the most Irish district, at least in the, in the city of Portland, maybe in the state. Uh, very high concentration of the Irish here in the western end of the peninsula in Portland. Great. Representative Corey. Good morning. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Patrick Corey. Um, I represent House District 25, which is part of Wyndham, and happy St. Patrick's Day. Okay. Representative Supika. Good morning. I'm Laura Supika, and I represent District 126, a portion of Bangor, and of course, happy St. Patrick's Day to all of you. Okay. Representative Riley. I'm Representative Morgan Riley. I represent uh, House District 34, which is part of Bangor. Great. Thanks. And I don't know if Representative McCrate is here. She's in two committees at once at the moment. Um, she's got a bill in a different committee. So if you're here, Representative, you can introduce yourself. If not, I'm sure she'll be joining us uh, shortly. Okay, uh, we were also uh, joined by our uh, committee clerk, Karen Montel, as well as our committee analyst, Janet Stoko. Uh, and today we're, we're also joined, and we just wanna recognize that we're joined by uh, Chief Kirk Francis of the Penobscot Nation, as well as Chief uh, Clarissa Sabatis of the Holton Band of Maliseet. Um, so just to begin, we'll share a few pieces of information about uh, the procedures for our electronic committee hearings. Um, thank you all for your patience as we work through the technological issues. Uh, but this meeting is currently being live streamed on the committee's YouTube channel. Um, that means that anyone who is a participant in the meeting via Zoom can be seen and also heard if they're a panelist and if their uh, microphone is unmuted. Uh, people on the Zoom meeting waiting to testify uh, can't cannot be seen or heard until they're called upon to speak and bring in when we bring you up into the meeting. And just as an important, to, it's important to note that as we upgrade 
or bring you into the panel, uh, it may look like you're being dropped for a second. So you may lose some sound, but then once you're here, uh, you'll be able to unmute yourself and turn your camera on. Um, again, it's one of the interesting features of a, of a YouTube or Zoom public hearing. Also, this meeting is being live streamed on the legislature's website. Uh, regarding the chat function of the Zoom meeting, uh, this is for technical assistance only. It's not for any substantive committee work. Um, and just a reminder this that we're, we're going to have three public hearings today. It's our chance uh, as legislators to hear from the public on committee on pending legislation. Um, so for our bills today, we'll begin with the sponsors, followed by those who are registered to testify. Um, and we'll, we'll move down the list of those who wish to testify in favor, followed by those in opposition. And lastly, those who are neither for nor against. And for members of the public, just another reminder, when you're called upon, please state your name, uh, your place of residence, and the organization you represent, if any. Okay, so in, in working uh, with the sponsors, I believe we're going to begin um, with LD 587 today. That will be followed uh, with LD 554. I think we're waiting for a few more people to join for that bill uh, and working with the sponsor. And then the final bill that we'll hear today is LD 623. Um, so with that, we'll open the public hearing on LD 587, an act regarding the licensing of persons to conduct advanced deposit wagering. And we'll welcome uh, Representative Millett. Good morning, um, Senator Lucchini, Representative Cayazzo, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Veterans and Legal Affairs. I am Soan Millett, and I represent House District 71, which includes the towns of Norway, Sweden, Waterford, and West Paris. I'm pleased to present LD 587, an act regarding the licensing of persons to conduct advanced deposit wagering. I sponsored this bill on behalf of a constituent who feels that the current law, which allows only one party to be allowed to conduct advanced deposit wagering, or ADW, is not adequately meeting the needs of the wagering public. My bill simply amends current law by increasing the number of licenses that may be granted from one to no more than three. After submitting the bill draft, I learned that this committee in the 129th legislature had been working on a comprehensive rewrite of the ADW statutes, but was prevented from reporting that proposal to the full legislature when we suddenly adjourned a year ago today. It is also my understanding that a version of last year's more comprehensive approach is also before you today, I believe to be sponsored by Representative McCrae. Assuming this VLA committee is similarly inclined to continue the work of the 129th VLA committee, I would expect that my bill will not be the vehicle you will use for your committee report. Nonetheless, I present LD 587 as an alternative if you choose to take a simpler approach. I um, applaud the work that you did a year ago and I hope you'll continue with that. And I would be pleased to answer any questions that you may have of me. I thank you and I thank you, Senator, for taking me out of order. And I wanna thank Karen for attempting to navigate me in this uh, technological role. Um, I'm sure I was not a very good pupil, but uh, <laughs> I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, uh, Representative Millett. And I met with a constituent yesterday who's very fond of you, uh, former Thanks Senator Foster. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any questions from the, the committee at the moment? Seeing none, thank you, Representative, for presenting your bill. And thank you again, sir. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to thank Representative Millett for his years of service. He's been a great servant for the people of Maine. Agreed. <laughs> Great. Okay, so next up, we will we'll move to the public hearing uh, testimony uh, portion of the hearing. And again, just a reminder uh, for members of the public to state your name, 
uh, your residents and the organization you represent, if any. And also just a reminder that testimony is limited to three minutes uh, during the hearing. So we're gonna begin with James Day and then we'll be followed by Robert Moore. So Mr. Day, if you're ready. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. I went, I, I disappeared for a second and I didn't see myself come back. We, we can hear you, but we can't see you, just so you know. Oh. Uh, I'm probably challenged. Oh, start it, again. There we go. It's a different world right now. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. And happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody. Um, I actually did not, plan on testifying on this bill and just submitting my written testimony. I tried to cancel it, but that didn't seem to, to work uh, at least, um, but I got your, um, I'll read my testimony that I had submitted as writing uh, as well. Good morning, Senator Lucchini, Representative Chiazzo and distinguished members of the Veteran and Legal uh, Affairs Committee. My name is Jim Day. I reside in Scarborough, Maine. I am president of LRI Inc and we operate the Lewiston off-track betting facility. And I'm speaking in favor of LD 587, as well as in favor of LD uh, 623, which I'll testify to later. Um, I thought it was appropriate to uh, not just um, let Representative Millett's bill go without uh, some words of encouragement to expanding the number of ADW um, Bill's Senator, I mean, Representative Millett has uh, been a long supporter um, of the industry and I appreciate his efforts. As an operator of the OTB in the state, I think I can speak for all of us and we support increasing the number of ADW sites available to our state, to our in-state customers. As long as the new ADWs pay a similar tax that is shared by the racing industry. Given all is the same, the more sites offer different apps and different preferences. Uh, they offer uh, promotions, they offer uh, rewards for continuous play, they have different tracks uh, possible and um, uh, different wagering uh, uh, events. Um, the customers prefer to have their choices and I think this will increase uh, the wagering that is being done on the ADWs. Um, again, I am registered to speak on LD623 where I have more testimony. I just, again, want to thank Representative Millett and um, both Representative Millett and Representative McCreet for their work in this area. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Great. Thank you, Mr. Day. Uh, any questions from the committee at this time? Seeing none, thank you. Free testimony. Thank you. Have yep. a good day. Okay, next up we have Robert Moore. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Lucchini, and uh, greetings to all the members. Uh, this is my first time ever to participate in a, uh, a, a hearing uh, in, in Maine. Um, and the reason I'm doing so is because this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I am a long time racing fan, but I have no connection to any uh, off track betting facility or anything else. I'm here strictly as a, as a fan. And uh, I've submitted written uh, testimony about um, LD6623. And uh, I appreciated the explanation that we got uh, about 587. And the reason I said that I was neither for nor against it is because uh, I think three is better than one uh, in terms of the number of um, ADWs. But I agree with um, the uh, statements that have been made by everybody else because I read the, the written testimony uh, just shortly before the, the start of this meeting. Um, I don't really feel that there's any need for the, for the state to um, judge uh, which bids, uh, which um, ADW should operate. 
I think that uh, setting up uh, the licensing requirements and conditions is, uh, is satisfactory. I don't see any added value in, in getting the state involved in, uh, in the process. And I believe it ought to be left up to the uh, customers to decide um, who they want to patronize. There are just a limited number of ADWs in, uh, in the whole country. And those who are interested in coming to Maine can do so. Um, if 623 is approved. So I certainly hope that is the way you'll go. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moore. Can you say where you're from? Oh, Cumberland, sorry. Okay, great, thank you. Any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Okay, and that concludes the list of registered people uh, for this bill. I think there's more on the uh, LD623. So seeing no other uh, registered testimony, I'll close the public hearing on LD587. Okay, so next up we will, I believe we're ready to go with LD554, which is an act to create gaming equity and fairness for the Native American tribes in Maine. And for that, we'll bring in the bill sponsor, uh, Representative Collings, as well as the bill's co-sponsor, Representative Newell. And so Representative uh, Collings, when you're ready, you can uh, begin your bill testimony. Hello? Gotcha, yep. Oh, okay, wanted to make sure you could hear me. Uh, good morning. Uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, Senator Lucchini, Representative Cayazzo, distinguished members of the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee. I'm uh, Representative Benjamin Collings. I represent House District 42, the uh, eastern part of off Peninsula Port Portland. If you can tell from my accent, though, I'm originally from Fort Kent. Um, so I am once again presenting a uh, bill uh, on behalf of the four federally recognized tribes, um, Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq. And um, this bill is uh, unique. I don't, um, in my recollection of about 20 so years working on um, tribal issues in the state legislature, I don't recall an effort um, proposed in this manner. So what this bill does in, in essence is um, for those of you who um, are new to the committee, uh, welcome, and um, I look forward to working with you. So just a quick um, history here, uh, probably most of you know this, but in um, 1980, the um, three of the tribes signed a, a settlement act with the state of Maine and the federal government um, over a, a land um, that had been taken illegally. And um, there was a settlement to, to give some land back to the tribes. There was some compensation. And then they negotiated some terms about jurisdiction. And um, so in that um, settlement, um, most of the, um, the jurisdiction around some, some federal laws um, kind of went more towards the state's favor. So about eight years later in 1988, um, the federal government passed the, um, what we call IGRA, and it's the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. And basically what that law uh, did was, it, it was in the spirit of just like here in Maine, um, you know, most of the, you know, we, our tribes are in a, a rustic Washington, Penobscot County and rural areas all around the country. Many tribes had been pushed to rural areas. Uh, they had, um, very little means of economic development. And so with uh, a vast bipartisan support in Congress, including uh, the former Senator John McCain being one of the leaders of this, they passed a federal law to allow uh, some sort of framework for um, gaming with uh, tribes and for the states to work with the tribes on this under this federal law. Now, when this was passed in 1988, um, the tribes in Maine were not automatically included because going back to that 1980 Settlement Act, there was um, a line that said no federal laws passed hereafter will apply to tribes in Maine unless specifically um, written into the law by Congress. And of course, when Congress passes a law to benefit federal 
federally recognized tribes. They don't say this law benefits all federally recognized tribes, including in the state of Maine, Passamaquoddy. And I forgot to mention that after the 1980 Settlement Act, about 12 years later, the Mi'kmaq, uh, which are headquartered in Presque Isle, um, had their own uh, settlement, uh, federal recognition and, and act with the state. So they came in a little bit different. But anyway, they're four federally recognized tribes. So, so, um, so Indian gaming has been a huge success around the nation. Now, I don't know about the pandemic. Um, I'm sure you'll, you'll hear more later that there's probably been some downturn in, uh, I would imagine, economic activity at the um, two, um, uh, what we call commercial casinos, not Indian casinos in Bangor and Oxford County, and I'm sure around the country th that's the same. But before this pandemic, I, I believe uh, nationally, um, I think there's about 29 states with a couple pending that have, uh, you know, Indian gaming. And um, so uh, I believe that that in, in the totality of that was about at least $40 billion in growing with, uh, I think, a a combined uh, in this about almost 30 states. I think there's probably there must be about I can't be sure anywhere from 350 to 500 tribal casinos, and it's a it's a huge success. Um, not only does it give resources to the tribes, um, some of it going to education and healthcare and infrastructure, economic development. Some of it's discretionary, but you know, um, a lot of these tribes, they just have, they, they hire just tens and tens of thousands of people around the country outside of their community. The goods and services, what they give back to the local communities in the state is huge. Um, just the millions and millions of dollars that they pay in taxes from all these, these spinoff businesses, is, it's just a huge impact. And it's been um, overall a huge success um, across the country. And like any, like any, um, any industry, whether it be uh, when we talk about gaming, whether it be commercial casino or tribal gaming, um, there definitely are some some better success stories, some that don't really work out. But overall, it's a huge success. And again, the intent of this law by the United States Congress was to help tribes, specifically in rural areas, which includes tribes right here, to have uh, some sort of anchor business, something to get economic development going. And, you know, most tribes that, that I personally, outside of the legislature, have done work with around the country, have diversified their portfolio. They've invested in lots of businesses and um, they've gone into um, government and military contracting. It's just given them resources to expand business opportunities and to really help deal with issues, as, as you'll, you'll hear later um, in this committee and in uh, other legislative committees and in debate. Um, on, on issues dealing with uh, the tribes, you'll see a huge disparity in healthcare and economics and so many other issues that have come about since we've pushed tribes into reservations and had policies very detrimental to their, their welfare for hundreds of years, you know, since they were colonized. So you'll be hearing more of that from, from the tribes and you'll be hearing from some experts who will really get into what Indian gaming does now, if this bill was to, pa to pass, here's the technical part of it. Basically, we're amending. So first, there was a main implementing act. That was the tribes and the state making an agreement um, about settling land, um, about some um, monetary compensation, which, by the way, the state didn't pay any of that. The federal government paid that. So the state wasn't on the, on the hook for that. And then also, it, it covered some of the jurisdictional issues. Um, so what it would do is it would amend the implementing act and, and just to um, also throw this in here, after we had the main implementing act with the state of Maine and the tribes, then there was the, the federal uh, settlement act, which Congress um, signed and uh, President Carter, outgoing President Carter signed that before um, he left uh, the White House. So we would be amending that to say that the tribes um, will be under the jurisdiction of IGRA which means they don't automatically just go and, and do what they want. They need to make a compact with the state. They need to negotiate with the state. Every state that has tribal gaming is different, but there's one part um, that holds true is that if a state allows class three gaming, which is the Las Vegas style slot machines and you know all the table games and, and, and so, so forth, if the state, if the state 
which the state of Maine does allow that sort of gaming already, then they have to uh, negotiate on those terms. If other states don't have uh, certain classes of gaming, then um, that's a different story and it's, and it's a different uh, type of process. Uh, for a state like Maine though, since they do allow gaming um, up to class three, um, basically probably the governor with some buy-in from the, the legislature, I would imagine would have to make a compact. They, they would negotiate and it has to be on tribal land. Um, and uh, to let you know, it's around the country, I know of very few cases in, in recent history where, um, you know, there's land that's held in federal trust for tribes. Um, th so basically on that land, they could have some gaming um, as far as as far as I'm aware of. What they, they most likely wouldn't do, and I'm not aware of many cases at all where this has happened, that tribes, it's not an easy, you just can't go down to uh, Kittery and buy a thousand acres and put it in, in federal trust. That, that never happens in any states. Um, so basically what we're talking about would be if this law were to pass, the the tribes that wanted to um, go into a compact with the state for the right to have class three casino, they would have to sit down and negotiate that with the leaders of the state. So in essence, that's that's what the um, the law does. In the past, the tribes and other um, organizations have petitioned the state via referendum or through the legislative process to uh, try to get into the uh, casino market or other forms of, of gaming. Um, but this is the first time that a, a tribe specifically has tried to get into gaming by asking for permission to be granted the right that is virtually granted to every tribe in the country. So it's really a matter of, of fairness that the tribe should be uh, treated just like their, their, their sister tribes around the country. And I would say that while it's not dealing with, uh, you know, a casino, there is a precedent in Maine um, in, in the past where the legislature has, and then they, they uh, overrode a governor's veto to, to pass the law to allow high stakes uh, bingo. And at the time, the outgoing uh, attorney general, I think it, he was uh, the attorney general tyranny, he, um, he kind of advocated for this and he said, listen, since the 1980 Settlement Act, we don't have to allow the tribes to have um, a high stakes bingo. But in light of the fact that Congress has allowed tribes all around the country to get into different uh, gambling markets, he said, I think that the legislature, out of fairness, should allow the tribes to pursue the high stakes um, bingo as a, as a means of economic development. And it had huge support in the legislature, was vetoed by a governor, but the legislature overrode that veto. And I will say, historically, uh, in about the last you know uh, 20 years or so that I've worked on these issues, the legislature on most tribal gaming bills has been highly supportive, sometimes giving two thirds support in the House and the Senate for casinos, uh, racinos, which are you know a horse track with slot machines, which is kind of the the start of um, of the, the casino in Bangor, which later was bought by Penn National. So the legislature does have a history, specifically in the last 15 years or so, of, of being very supportive of these issues. And uh, the reason I uh, agreed to to um, to put this bill in on behalf of the tribes was I think it's a simple matter of fairness. I, I believe here in Maine, it's no longer a question of shall we allow people to have casinos. It's We've already we've already answered that question, and we allow two um, large uh, casino companies, Penn National and Churchill Downs, to to have casinos. And I'm I'm glad that they're here and they provide jobs. But I don't think that's that's really the issue. Um, I think the issue is, um, you know, who's here and what they're doing is how come we haven't allowed tribes to get into this this business while all around the country. Tribes have been allowed to do this. It's been a huge success. So my question is, why would we not want the tribes to have this right? Why would we not want them to have this scenario, which which leads to a win-win for the for the tribes and the local communities in the state? Why would we deny them money to help, um, which they don't have, to help with their with their health care disparity, to help with uh, much their their high unemployment rate, to help um, build housing? Uh, and, and so much more, and to help, um, uh, as you know, none of these tribal communities in Maine have their own 
grocery stores and gas stations and so on. All the money they have goes into the local economies in Holton, in Presque Isle, in Callis, in, in Eastport, in the Old Town area. So um, my question to the committee and to the legislature is why will we not allow the tribes to prosper ec economically and to put uh, much needed revenue into the local surrounding communities and give, and give um, a good amount of money back to the state? Now in a compact, they would have to negotiate how much revenue the state um, would get out of the uh, the proceeds? So there would there would be a huge uh, windfall to the state. Uh, as far as what type of facilities they would be, they would have to be to scale, and they would have to be you know it would depend on the market. So you know if there were tribes down near near Kittery or on the border, there could be very large uh, casinos. But where the tribes are currently located. They're going to be put to scale and they're not going to be these huge, you know, Foxwood type casinos or or anything probably like Oxford or in Bangor. So they would be uh, smaller facilities that would meet the market demand. And um, but they would be they would have significant revenue to really help the tribes and to, and, and to send some money back to the local community and to the state. Um, there'll be uh, some tribal leaders and some uh, experts on this speaking later to, to answer more technical questions and to go over the needs of their community and to talk about um, how tribes all over the country do this successfully and to sort of talk to you about, you know, uh, why, why aren't we allowing them to do this while we allow out-of-state corporations to have gaming in the state. So I think it, it'll be a, a productive conversation. I'm sure you'll hear some people that represent the current uh, casinos in the state. And this is typical of, uh, it's not just here in Maine, it's anywhere where there's, where there's casinos. Whenever there's a fear of any new competitors coming into the market, they'll be very aggressive and try to stop that out because, you know, why would they want to give up a monopoly? Um, but I would um, caution you to, um, to listen to, to all sides because, um, just myself working with tribes around the country, there are some states where there's 50 casinos that tribes operate. There's some states with um, over 100 casinos that don't really have, you know, they're not even the largest populated state. So per capita, many states have um, a much larger, uh, you know, proportion of, of casinos for every resident and they all do fine and they compete. So, um, if small casinos are opened up by tribes in pretty much rural parts of the state, there might be a, a small impact, just like, you know, if um, there's a um, if there's a, a Walmart for 20 years and a Target opens up 10 miles away. Yeah, but I mean, they still all stay open and they survive and it would be very minimal. So there'll be lots of scare tactics. The sky is going to fall. I mean, uh, the Bangor Casino said this when Oxford opened up. They're still here. I hear this all around the country, but um, they, they stay because they're profitable. Also, you may hear that, um, you know, probably we shouldn't allow the tribes to um, have gaming because of the pandemic. The economy's been tough. Well, yeah, but we're, we're moving forward, and, and that's not going to determine the fate of our economy for decades going forward. So I, I just would... Uh, ask that you uh, you be open-minded. Uh, please listen to the uh, the tribal leaders and other proponents speak. I'd be happy to answer um, any questions here in a minute. And uh, I'll just want to say personally, um, real quickly, uh, why this is um, something I, I always advocate for is, um, as you know, there's a, there's a huge, uh, there are health disparities with tribes around the country. They have a, uh, you know, their, their mortality rate is, uh, is pretty sad actually. And so many people die die at a younger age as compared to the the rest of the population. Actually, when the Settlement Act was signed in 1980, I think the average lifespan of a tribal member was in the early 40s to mid 40s. It, it, you know, things have improved over the years, but it's still not great. And uh, when I first started working with the tribes, when I was a legislative aide about 20 years ago, till now, so many young people I know ha have passed away, um, and even people who aren't, you know, um, teenagers or in their 20s or 30s still have died very young in their 50s or 60s. One of them was um, a former tribal representative from the Penobscot. Uh, his name was Michael Sokalexis. He was a great athlete, uh, very uh, loved by uh, Republicans, Democrats, 
everyone at the state capitol around the state. And um, I was working with him very hard on um, some of these issues. And uh, he started getting very sick. He had many health health ailments. He, I think he had a walking stick or a, or a walker. And uh, there was a couple times he collapsed uh, on the floor of the house, walking to the cafeteria to eat. And um, he, he passed away at a pretty young age. And uh, after the funeral, his uh, widow came up to me and she said, uh, she said, Ben, uh, you know, Mike really liked working with you. And uh, it was really a passion of his to work with you to, um, to get some fairness, to get some equity, to allow tribes to have gaming. And um, I, you know, please promise me you'll continue to advocate for it. So I gave my word that I would, and uh, I believe in it. And I, I ask that you open your hearts and your minds and uh, really, really um, help the tribes. It, it's a win-win. It works everywhere in the country. And I'll leave you with this. If it works so well everywhere, why on earth will we not allow the tribes to have this fair means of economic development? So thank you all for your time. Thank you for indulging me. I'd be happy to answer any questions. If there's some very technical questions, once again, I would defer to um, some of the tribal leaders Thanks. and their um, representatives. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Representative. Uh, Representative Wood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Collings, I, I'm very familiar, well, I shouldn't say very, I am somewhat familiar with the um, land claim settlement from 1980, I actually had a bill this session, LD-159, which was extending the time limits for the land that is in trust to be purchased by the Passamaquoddy and the Penobscot tribes. I, I'm not as familiar with the IGRA 1988 Indian gaming regulations. And so my question is just in passage of your bill, does this bring the tribes in Maine into compliance with all of IGRA or just a portion of IGRA? Um, I believe, uh, thank you for the question, Representative Wood. I, it's my understanding, and again, I'll have some, uh, I think there'll be a tribal attorney here uh, from the Passamaquoddy to probably expand on it, but it is my understanding that, and again, this, this bill is not to do with any other issues of the implementing or the, or the Settlement Act. This issue right. would simply um, just allow them to qualify under um, IGRA, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, I believe fully, like um, pretty much every other tribe in the country. I, I don't think there'd be limitations. Limitations on th that federal law really uh, apply to what's going on in each state and what they currently allow for um, for gambling opportunities. So I, um, there's different classes of, of, of gambling. There's class one, class two, and class three. Class two is more like bingo based, uh, where you're kind of, you know, playing against others, whether it's in, in person or kind of electronically on a machine. Class three is more like you're, you're playing against the, the house odds, like on a, on a slot machine or the table games. But depending on what the state offers. Now, if if the state of Maine didn't um, currently allow um, the class three gaming for these two private corporations, um, it would have to be a, a discussion and a whole different negotiation with the tribes if this were to be passed. But the fact that the state does allow up to class three, three gaming for two specific corporations, then they would have, the discussion would have to be around what's allowed in the state already, so. Okay, thank you so much. Yes. Representative Kinney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, are you, I, like nothing was said about the fact that the, the tribes are receiving money from the Cascade from the other casinos that are out there. It, your, and your bill doesn't say anything about if they started doing some gaming, will they participate in the Cascade my concern comes greatly around our agricultural fairs. Uh, my heart still belongs in, in the ag world um, as I am still a farmer myself and seeing the Cascade help out those fairs is extremely important um, to our state, to our state's economy. And as much as it you know, would be great to let them have some more gaming potential, I don't believe we get a cascade. I, I may be wrong because I am newer to this committee, um, but I, I am concerned about the, the 
the rest of the state that all have to work together. And per, I am just wondering if you're aware of the amount of money that the, the nations are receiving from the cascade from the casinos that are currently in place. Yes, um, thank you, Representative Kinney. Um, so what I know, and, and others can answer this, and I think some members have been on this uh, committee for uh, for a while, including Senator Lucchini might um, be more articulate on this, but um, from what I know is that it's it's not the uh, Penn National uh, Casino in Bangor, it's the, uh, the Oxford Casino, Representative Kinney, that does give uh, a percentage a small percentage of their of their take to the uh, specifically the Penobscot and Passamaquoddy. Uh, it does not, in, unless it's been changed without my knowledge, it does not go to the Micmac or Maliseet located up in Aroostook County. Um, and uh, so, yeah, Bangor does not give give it to them. It's the uh, the Oxford one, and I I don't know what the um, it, it would be on what the law is specifically for that casino and the in the terms of that cascade if they were to. Um, if this were to be passed and then a compact was successfully negotiated with the state, then th the terms of that law would apply to what would happen next uh, if they would keep that or if that would go away. Um, and then as far as the uh, the money, I, I know the uh, more so, I believe, in the uh, the first casino in um, in Bangor, which was really truly about, um, you know, having machines at a racetrack, which uh, technically doesn't happen now. It's, you know, off at that at the that center there, um, a lot of that money really did, did was about um, the horse industry and agriculture that supported that industry. Representative Kenny, which uh, I, I was a, I was a gr big supporter of, and I've worked with those um, those stakeholders over the years. Um, so, and there might be some I, I don't know. I'm not 100% knowledgeable of where all the money goes from the Oxford. I know some goes to education and whatnot. I know. If some goes to agriculture, I know most of it comes from the uh, the Bangor facility. Uh, as far as what would the overall impact be, would um, you know, would um, if some smaller facilities were open up near Presque Isle or Holton or up near Callis or whatnot near the Canadian border or around Old Town or, or whatnot, what how much of you know what would the the what we say the cannibalization <laughs> of, of the market would be? How much would we these other smaller facilities take away um, from the revenue coming into um, Bangor or Oxford. I, I would imagine it would be, uh, I don't think Oxford would, would really be that much. I don't think Bangor would be impacted significantly just based on my knowledge of um, gaming throughout the, the country. But um, there would be, there could be a small um, impact. Um, but I, I think with strong marketing, they, they would remain competitive. And I think if there'd be any, decrease to the revenue to um, Bangor or Oxford, I truly think it, it would be minimal. So I, I don't think there would be, um, it'd be very detrimental overall. And, um, and besides the, um, you know, the current facilities, um, I, I think some of the, uh, the issues we're bringing up here about fairness is not so much about um, what already exists, but just the spirit of, of this law that was meant to really help struggling uh, Native American communities in rural areas. And, and actually in most states, uh, it's kind of the opposite of Maine. Most states, uh, the tribes are, are more the ones to have the gaming and then, you know, other commercial casinos may come in, but usually the tribes are given preference and at least most states. Uh, obviously there's, you know, like New Jersey and, and Las Vegas, which are different, but for a great majority of other states, um, the the tribes have had the. Uh, it's just kind of what the spirit of the whole law is. So, um, but that's sort of what I, I can answer at this time. Thanks, uh, Representative Collins. We'll get for the work session a breakdown of the cascades as well as a study on the on the size of the market. Um, but there is, I believe, a provision that says if the tribes uh, were to get a casino, they'd no longer get the distribution from Oxford. Um, so, Representative Dolph, do you have a question? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, you answered one question with the cascade money because I was going to ask if they could continue. My other question is, is um, it came up last session and it's in regards to the tribes paying the same amount for their licensing um, and any fees like the other two casinos do now. Um, 
if I remember correctly, they were looking not to pay as much also. Um, so I was just wondering, in fairness, are they going to pay exactly for their license and everything else they have to do and give back to the state as the other two casinos do now? Uh, thank you, Representative Dahl, for, for the question. Um, so honestly, all, all I could say is that if this law were to pass and it was a compact was su su uh, successfully negotiated, those terms would be negotiated um, in the compact. And um, what I do know is, is uh, I don't know if exactly what it would be. In, in some other states where there's, uh, you know, in a great majority of states where they have the tribal gaming and they've had compacts, I mean, it, it varies, um, you know, per the, whether it's table games or the slot machines. I mean, in Connecticut, they do give, um, to, I know, which is one of the closer tribal casinos to Maine, uh, the Mohegan and the Pequot from Foxwoods give, I believe, still 25% uh, to the state. And um, I think in some states, it's a little lower than that. Some places, it's higher than that. Um, so that would have to be in, in the negotiations. And I'm very sure that the state in the negotiations would bring up what the current rates are. I would say the difference though, between tribal gaming and um, and, and the commercial casinos, which are, are non-tribal is that the those the, the commercial casinos are, are run by corporations and mostly like the money goes to the owners and the stockholders. But the spirit of um, tribal gaming is really to give money that is is very greatly needed to education to healthcare. It's to really help struggling communities in, in economically depressed areas. So that's all taken into consideration, Representative. The needs of the tribe, where they're located, and then also look at what exists in the state and to come up with a balance that would be fair. So um, myself not being uh, the governor, I, I don't know what she would think um, and what the legislature would back up, but. Um, I would imagine it would be somewhat close to what the current uh, rate is of um, kind of the blended rate of what um, Oxford and um, and Penn National are paying. So, right. And we have uh, attorney uh, Corey Hinton on on the Zoom today, I think, who's an expert on on the compacts and how they're negotiated. Is that correct, Representative Collins? Uh, yeah. To my knowledge, yes. Sure. Great. Any other questions for Representative Collins? Seeing none, thank you for bringing your bill, Representative. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, next we'll bring in a uh, co-sponsor, uh, Representative Newell, welcome. Good morning, thank you for having me. Good morning. Good morning, Senator Lucchini. Representative Chiazzo and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Veterans and Legal Affairs. My name is Rena Newell and I represent the Passamaquoddy Tribe. Thank you to Representative Benjamin Collins of Portland for the presentation of this proposed legislation. As I feel it is my duty within my role to foster positive tribal state relations and encourage the tribe's right to self-determination, I am before you today to testify in support of LD 554, an act to create gaming equity and fairness for the Native American tribes in Maine. Today, you will receive additional testimony from tribal leadership and others. So my testimony will be brief. What this bill seeks to do is create gaming equity and fairness for the tribes in Maine. I have included in my testimony for this committee's review Maine Casino Game Gambling Legislative History. This legislative history contains proposed and enacted legislation from 1993 to present related to the regulation of casinos under Maine statutes and the authorization of casinos to operate in Maine and slot machine gaming. You will find contained within this history proposed legislation, which began in 1993 with LD 1266, an act to allow a casino to be constructed by the Passamaquoddy tribe in Calais for the purpose of gambling, followed by continuing proposed legislation to date. I would highlight 
that since 1993, two non-tribal casino initi initiatives received enacted legislation and are in operation within the state of Maine. However, despite the initial attempts by the tribes, this legislative history continually reflects opposition to tribal legislation in support of gaming operations. Why is that? If the state of Maine allows gaming, would it not be just or appropriate to support the federally recognized tribes as well? History has shown this not to be true. Yet here we are again, 28 years later. As stated by Representative Collins and in the summary of this proposed legislation, this would amend the main law to provide gaming that is under allowed under the terms established by the Federal Indian Gaming Regul Re Regulatory Act. I have also included a link to information relating to the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. And I would also mention, as previously mentioned, a Passamaquoddy tribal attorney, Corey Hinton, is in the room um, to answer any questions related to the Indian Gaming, Tour Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. Therefore, I'm going to skip that part. The opportunity for the tribes to exercise their right to participate in gaming is an important one. As previously mentioned, it provides an opportunity to promote tribal economic development, self-sufficiency, and strong tribal governments. In addition, as seen throughout Indian country, the benefits of resources received are not limited to only the tribes, but to its neighbors as well. In closing, I humbly call upon each of you to give consideration to the continuance and elevating the standard to improving tribal state relations through equity and fairness by raising your voice to support LD 554. I'll be happy to answer any questions that the members of the committee may have at this time. Respectfully presented, Willie Wynn. Thank you, uh, Representative Newell. Uh, Representative Kinney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, I'm curious, how, how many casinos do you think that the tribes are looking to uh, put into place if we were to pass this legislation? And you also mentioned that the two casinos we have went to statewide referendum and were passed that way. If, would you be all right if we were to put this, that this has to go to statewide referendum and if we were to put through additional casinos? And furthermore, I just got a comment. When I saw you in the ladies room last week with your hair down, so gorgeous. It's, it's I, I wish it were down. You have absolutely beautiful hair and I'm impressed <laughs> that you got that all up in a little bun. Thank you, Representative Kitty. Now that you've completely distracted me with that comment, could you please um, just uh, reiterate your first question, please? Sure thing. Um, how many uh, casinos are the tribes looking to possibly put into place? I'm sure Passamaquoddy is looking for one, but this mentions Passamaquoddy, the Penobscot Nation, the Micmacs, the Maliseets. Um, are, are you all looking to put in casinos? Are you looking to band together just into one big casino? Are you looking to do multiple casinos per, per tribe? Just kind of wondering how many we're, we're looking at possibly adding to the state. Thank you for that question, Representative Kinney. Uh, I believe you will hear directly from the tribal chiefs um, following uh, my presentation of my testimony. However, um, I think it's this proposed legislation gives the tribes the option to pursue gaming. So I think that's where I will end with that, that my response to that. And your second question, Representative Kinney. Oh, was in regards to referendum, referendum where the other casinos went to referendum. <laughs> Again, I would defer to um, the tribal chiefs relating to that particular question. Thank you so much. Thanks. Any other questions at this time? Uh, uh, Chairman Chiazzo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good to see you again, Representative Newell. Sorry we didn't get a chance to connect uh, last week but uh, uh, I, I appreciated the corner caucuses that we had last, last session for sure. 
Um, I didn't see your written testimony in, so I'm not sure if there was, um, if you're going to submit that or um, whether you've, uh, it, it didn't get submitted cor correctly. So if you could please make sure we get a copy of that, that would be very much appreciated. Thanks. Thank you. I, I will certainly do that. Thank you. And it was great to see everyone last week, although we didn't all connect uh, okay. somewhat at a distance, however. Thank you. Great. Seeing no other questions. Thank you, uh, Representative, for presenting this bill. Thank you so much. Yep. Okay, next we'll recognize, uh, uh, let's see, so we'll go. Okay. So next we'll recognize Chief Kirk Francis from the Penobscot Nation, uh, and then we'll, we'll recognize Chief Clarissa Sabatis uh, from the Holton Band of Maliseet. Welcome Chief, thanks for being here. Thank you, it's good to see you. And um, uh, Mr. Lucchini, uh, Mr. Chiazzo, uh, good morning to the members of the Legal and Veterans Affairs Committee. Uh, my name is Kirk Francis. Um, I proudly served as the Penobscot Nation Tribal Chief for 15 years now. And I uh, want to thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak today about the restoration of our tribal nation's inherent right to conduct gaming as a governmental economic tool. And I, of course, support this LD. Uh, in my opening, I mentioned the restoration of rights. This continues to be the underlying goal of the, of the main Wabanaki tribes. The most recent effort to restore the exercise of our inherent governmental rights occurred with the creation and work of the Tribal State Task Force over the past few years, as directed by the Legislative Resolve. In this effort, we are not seeking anything new or special. We are simply trying to restore uh, uh, the recognition of our, our legal inherent rights and our rights to self-governance on par with those tribes all across the country. Prior to the Maine Indian Land Claim Settlement of 1980, the courts acknowledged that the tribes in Maine possessed inherent rights of self-governance within our own territory, similar to those of every other federally recognized tribe in the country. These rights of self-governance included the exclusive jurisdiction of the tribes to conduct economic development within our own territory, including through gaming activities. Between the time of recognition by the courts of our inherent rights of self-governance and the passing of the Settlement Act, the Penobscot Nation had two established gaming operations at the time. We had a slot parlor and we had a high stakes bingo operation. After the passage of the Settlement Act, the state deemed those operations to be illegal based on its view that the exercise of our gaming rights was not an internal tribal matter as contemplated by the Settlement Act. The tribes obviously did not agree with this position and never understood the Settlement Act to deprive us of our inherent rights to self-governance, including conducting these gaming activities. The tribe's position is gaming is a governmental activity used to generate funding for the operation of our government and the betterment of our citizens, similar to how the state generates funding through its state lottery. As a governmental activity, it should fall within the internal matters language of the Settlement Act. Unfortunately, the Maine Supreme Judicial Court did not agree ruling against tribal gaming in Penobscot Nation versus Stilfen in 1983. It is interesting to note that subsequent to this court decision, the Maine legislature acted in 1987 to restore recognition of our right to conduct high stakes bingo operations. A further note, the US Supreme Court that same year, 1987, ruled in a very historic case in California versus Cabazon that gaming is an attribute of tribal governance and can be conducted, conducted exclusively under the inherent authority of the tribes. This Supreme Court ruling undermined one of the underlying tenets of the main Supreme Judicial Court decision against tribal gaming. Following the Cabazon decision, Congress in every act to regulate tribal gaming. Uh, it's important to note that IGRA is a response to that Supreme Court decision um, at the request of states. So IGRA created the framework for tribes and states to work together to create mutually beneficial outcomes and activities. In line with tribal, the tribal goal of restoration of rights, the purpose of this current bill is the rec recognition of a right we should already possess as a tribal government. And the framework is there for the state and the tribes to work together under IGRA. 
Unlike commercial casinos, IGRA requires by statute that a majority of the funds generated by gaming be used for tribal governmental activities and to provide services that will ultimately benefit both our communities and the state as a whole. In other words, most of the money stays in Maine. The tribes of Maine have lived here since time immemorial and don't see us going anywhere anytime soon. There are numerous examples of states and tribes using the statutory framework of IGRA to structure arrangements that benefit everyone. For an example, in states like Michigan, when we ask the question about how many casinos, there are 21 tribes in Michigan that have all negotiated separate compacts, everything from geographical locations to amount of revenue share, etc. It works. The title of this bill reads, An Act to Create Gaming Equity and Fairness for the Native American Tribes in Maine. For many years, long before anyone else, the tribes in Maine have worked to restore our rights to conduct gaming. These efforts have failed time and again for various reasons, including the protection of other interests. The legislative resolve creating the Maine Tribal State Work Group mandated that the group find ways for the tribes in Maine to be restored to a place where we enjoy the same rights, privileges, and immunities as every other federally recognized tribe in the country. There is really not a more glaring example of inequity than what has occurred with respect to our gaming rights being taken away and never returned. The time has come for the state and the tribes to truly roll our sleeves up, find solutions, establish equity and fairness for the tribes in Maine, and find a mutually beneficial situation. I wanna thank you again for the opportunity opportunity to speak today in favor of this, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chief Francis. Uh, any questions from the committee at this time? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. You're welcome. I will next recognize Chief Clarissa Sabatis. Welcome. Good morning. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Good morning, Senate Chair Lucchini and House Chair Chiazzo, members of the Committee on Veteran Legal, Af Legal Affairs. Uh, my name is Clarissa Sabatis, and I am the duly elected Tribal Chief for the Holton Band of Maliseet Indians. Um, today, I'm here to testify in support of LD 554, an act to create gaming equity and fairness for Native American tribes in Maine. Um, I just want to thank uh, Ben and, um, I'm sorry, Representative Collings and Representative uh, Newell, as well as, as um, Chief Francis. Uh, I'll try not to um, be redundant with my testimony. So, um, you know, in, if enacted into law, this bill would set the stage for the tribes to engage in gaming enterprises within the state of Maine in the same manner that other tribes do across the nation. It would also continue to approve and honor the government to government relationship that should exist between the tribes and the state. And this act would require class three gaming compacts between the two parties that would mutually benefit and um, furnish both of us with added revenue to provide much needed services to our citizens that we serve here in Maine. Um, and I just wanted to, um, well, I'll speak to that afterwards. Um, the gaming monopoly that's been created here in Maine has uh, circumvented any efforts by the tribes to establish gaming within the state. Um, and the 1980 Land Claim Settlement Act, which we've heard about from, from other testimony, uh, was a result of a system that was not built to look out for the needs of our people, but to maintain control. And I believe that LD 554 is um, a step towards a fix and for sovereignty for our tribes. So as tribal nations, our, our only ask is to be treated with fairness and equity, the same equity that's benefiting out-of-state tribal gaming enterprises and tribes, um, the Restrictive Settlement Act that has barred us from gaining access to over 150 beneficial acts uh, meant for um, the benefit of Indians over the past 41 years, including IGRA, leaves us stuck in the past. The United States has seen the need to enact bills like this to support economic growth, self-determination, and stronger tribal governments. Um, we sit on the sidelines while nearly 570 tribes across the U.S. have access to these laws. I think that at this point, it's now a matter of um, right and wrong. And while we've been able to create complex infrastructures to care for our nations, as governments, we are stifled 
from realizing our true potential due to simple economics. If we choose to enter into gaming as a tribal nation, this would be another way to create revenue to care for our citizens and surrounding communities, just as the state is able to do through the lottery and privately owned casino cascades. Without a tax base and limited economic development opportunities, it's difficult to generate funding to supplement already underfunded programs such as housing, health, and education. Um, and many times addressing those priorities of, uh, of our people through activities like cultural preservation and language, which are the foundation of who we are, are dependent upon com competitive national grant um, causing us to compete against other tribes for our cultural survival. I envisage, I envision the passage of laws that honor our self-governance, the start of a partnership that can bring this state to a new level of success and growth. <laughs> source of job creation, economic prosperity, not only for us, but our surrounding towns and counties. Um, we see what our indigenous brothers and sisters outside of Maine are able to do for their nations, as well as towns, counties, and states that they reside in. And it leaves me baffled at what the motive is to keep us suppressed. For years, we've been told Maine is not a gaming state. When that changed, now it seems that Maine is not an Indian gaming state and that needs to change. So thank you for the opportunity to testify today. And I urge you to look at, look at this, not simply as legislation, but a step towards honoring our sovereignty and self-determination as tribal nations. And I also just wanted to touch on um, the question about um, having a referendum, if that's, if that's okay. I, I, um, I think that the spirit of IGRA is that it's a nation to nation relationship where we sit at the table and negotiate. Um, not to mention a referendum, in a referendum, we would be outspent by millions um, from corporations who have, have interests in their own personal gains versus um, tribal governments who really are trying to create revenue so we can take care of our people. So I thank you um, again for the opportunity to testify today. And I am open for any questions. Great, thank you, uh, Chief Sabatis. Any questions from members of the committee at this time? <clears throat> Seeing none, thank you for your testimony and, and thanks again to Chief Francis and Chief Sabatis for coming in today. Thank you. Okay, next You're we'll- Very welcome, thank you. Yep, thank you. Next, we will uh, recognize um, Penobscot Nation Ambassador Molly and Dana. I am here. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, Senator Lucchini, Representative Chiazzo, and members of the committee. My name is Molly and Dana. I am the Penobscot Nation Tribal Ambassador. And I'm in a, a bit of a sweet spot today because I get to follow all the tribal leaders and representative um, callings. And then after me, you'll hear um, some experts on the mechanics and all that. So I, I did submit, submit written testimony. A lot of it is about fairness and equity, self-determination, self-governance, tribal sovereignty. And that is at the core of what we're trying to do here, as you've heard uh, put so eloquently by our tribal leaders. And thinking about gaming, it is a controversial issue. Um, it is unpalatable to a lot of people. Um, a lot of people are against it from a moral or ethical standpoint. At the core of this bill and this effort, it truly is not about any of that. It is about the right of the tribes in Maine to act like other federally recognized tribes because we are federally recognized tribes. We did not sign away our status when we signed the 1980 Land Claim Settlement Act. And um, this portion of things is part of larger attempts to um, amend that act, but this really kind of stands on its own because it is such a specific focus and it really is about addressing economic development equity uh, along the spectrum of equity, but it, but it is truly about that. And I was sitting here thinking about um, my personal history on this topic. And in 2003, I was 
19 years old, and my father, Barry Dana, was serving as the tribal chief. And there was a uh, referendum question on the ballot to uh, have a casino owned by the tribes. We were question number three. The Bangor efforts to expand their gaming was question number two. And I remember um, standing on a highway overpass, <laughs> holding a yes on three sign, uh, campaigning the weekend before the vote. And uh, you know, my dad was probably getting uh, very cheap labor out of me at <laughs> 19 years old to help out this effort. Um, but it definitely, you know, the bug bit me for politics, campaigning, and this excitement around people coming together to try to solve a problem. It is a problem that there's poverty in tribal communities. It is a problem that this 1980 settlement has been restrictive. There are ways to solve this problem and a big solution is economic development and having this kind of um, self-determination in that area. We had a gathering to watch the results that night and uh, question number two for Bangor passed by uh, a great big margin. Question number three for the tribes was soundly defeated. And it, it was crushing, you know, my father is, is a cultural leader in the tribe. Certainly gaming is nothing that's in line with who he is as a person, but he believes so strongly and so passionately about our rights and our sovereignty that seeing him so crushed by this result left a huge impression on me. So it's fitting that I get to come full circle and that I have the honor of serving as tribal ambassador now uh, much later in life. And that I get to come here and, and speak with you today as colleagues, as neighbors, as fellow Mainers um, to talk about, we are in uh, a pandemic. We are trying to climb out of this. So why not look with an attitude of abundance rather than scarcity? I feel like there's a lot of fear around tribal gaming. And you'll hear in testimony that if we open more casinos, it'll take away from, from the two major casinos. And I just feel that's not really based in, um, you know, anything more than this fear of the unknown. So I would urge you to vote ought to pass. I would urge you to think about this from a place of rights, a restoration of rights and equity and fairness. And I am certainly open to answering any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, any questions from the committee at this time? Seeing none, thank you, Ambassador Dana. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, next we'll move to uh, uh, into the, the public hearing portion of the testimony. And, and just a reminder that when you're called upon, please state your name, your residence, and uh, the organization you represent, if any. And a reminder that uh, testimony is uh, limited to three minutes. So we will bring in first, uh, Corey Hinton will recognize next. And he'll be, Corey will be followed by Diane Alterzewski, which I probably didn't pronounce correctly. Apologies. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Hinton. Thank you very much. I was just disconnected for a moment. Is it, is it my turn to, yeah. okay. You're up. Yeah, sorry. It, it's a weird transition when you come in, you lose everything, so. Uh, it's totally fine. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be with you all here today um, to really, I think, follow up on the discussion that, that I started with your committee last year um, when I spent at least an hour going through the nuts and bolts of what tribal gaming is under federal law. And so today I'm in, and I'm prepared to provide a full technical overview, but given the time restraints here, I'm gonna to respond to the specific questions that I've heard come up. Um, and I'm hopeful that uh, when we reach a work session, we'll be able to dig into the mechanics because I want you all to know that in my practice as an advocate and attorney for tribal nations, um, one of my specific areas of expertise is in tribal gaming. Um, I actually began working at the Federal Indian Gaming Regulatory Agency when I was 20 years old. Um, actually, no, I think I was 19. Um, and it's a part of my job to negotiate tribal gaming compacts. In fact, uh, I just, uh, on behalf of one of uh, my firm's tribal clients in the state of Michigan, completed a gaming compact in the state of Indiana. 
It was a state where uh, Indiana has a, a mature gaming market. I believe five or so privately owned gaming casinos. Um, and, and the state saw fit to negotiate a compact to welcome in a new Las Vegas style casino to bring in that revenue. And I think that provides a, a great story to tell because it really shows what's possible in a state where there's already an existing gaming market. Um, one of the questions raised earlier was whether or not enactment of this legislation would put the tribes in compliance with the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. And I, I think that the best answer to that is the tribes must first choose whether they can and would like to conduct gaming. To be very clear, the legislation before you would not automatically permit the tribes to conduct gaming. Under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, the tribes would be required, assuming that this legislation is passed, to pass their own law, what's referred to as a gaming ordinance. And this is a law that must comply with the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act in all respects, and the tribes would not be able to uh, conduct or begin to conduct or really develop any gaming until they have that tribal law um, approved by the federal government. And the federal, that law must ensure that tribal gaming revenues are um, the sole, the primary beneficiaries of tribal gaming are tribal communities. The sole owners of those facilities must be tribal communities. In the state of Maine, 40% of your gaming revenues go to the state, 60% of your gaming revenues go to out of state corporations. The Indian Gaming Regulatory Act requires that those gaming revenues, the significant primary beneficiaries are the tribal communities and the areas in which those gaming, um, the gaming is conducted. Tribal state gaming compacts give the state of Maine the express ability to negotiate what's referred to as revenue sharing under tribal state gaming compacts. And in fact, in states like Connecticut, um, between one and $2 billion have flowed to the state since the beginning of tribal state gaming. Um, and, and those numbers really go up as you look across the United States. Um, I know that I'm over the time, but I, if I, I can stop or and take sure, the questions, um, but I have notes on the question, so I can. Sure, thank you, Mr. Hinton. We can, we can go to questions and then you can elaborate on your, sure. your notes as well. I think that you were about to get into something that's an important point, um, that simply passing this law wouldn't allow for casinos to pop up on every street corner you know, and, and everything like that. Can you uh, explain a little bit for us um, just how those compacts work? Absolutely. And, and to be really clear, a, a tribal state gaming compact is necessary for what's referred to as class three gaming. This is your, your Las Vegas style casino, like what you see in, in Bangor. Um, and, and tribal state gaming compacts, they, they must include consideration of certain sorts of issues. One is impact on local and state governments. So you will almost always, and I think almost every compact I've ever seen, directly provides revenue to local governments and to state governments to offset everything from traffic impacts to law enforcement costs um, to the cost of regulating the gaming from a state perspective. Because the other fundamental component is tribal state gaming compacts require state gaming regulators to work with tribal gaming regulators. And it's really important to know that that tribal gaming law that all tribes must have federally approved before they conduct gaming it requires the creation of a tribal regulatory commission that would effectively be akin to the state gaming, uh, the, the, reg, the gambling commission, gambling control commission. I um, mean, all of that would need to be included in a gaming compact. Gaming compacts also very frequently include provisions related to public health, um, environmental issues to make sure essentially that, you know, the uses of the land are, are respective of the appropriate environmental and land use considerations that the surrounding landowners have considered. And so oftentimes you'll see specific agreements included um, on compacts on those issues. Um, with respect to class two gaming, um, class two gaming is as uh, I believe representative Collins said, not your Las Vegas style casino. This is really, you know, this is high stakes bingo. Um, it might be bingo on, on a machine but it's players playing with each other as opposed to, you know, your blackjack, your, your games where um, you've got players playing against the house. There is no requirement in the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act that class two gaming be conducted pursuant to a tribal state compact. Um, it's, a, it's a much smaller scale of, of gaming. Um, it is of less economic benefit. Um, and so the law is structured to really um, promote the negotiation of those tribal state gaming compacts. 
Um, and so I, I think, uh, Senator Lucchini, that answered hopefully at least a part of your question, but I'm happy to expand further anywhere you'd like. Thank you. No, that's, that's really helpful. And I learn a lot about compacts every time we speak. So it's great to have you here and hopefully at the work session too. Um, Representative Tuttle. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Hinton, I really appreciate your knowledge of this issue. Uh, Bob. I'm, I'm interested about the referendum aspect of the issue as Maine compared to other states. Now, do other states require referendums like we do here? It's a great question, Mr. Representative. Thank you very much for it. At the end of the day, in order to have the sort of tribal state compact that I've referenced, the state must agree to it, right? And, and generally what you see is, is individual states taking sometimes slightly differing approaches. Most frequently, what you see happen is that a, a state legislature will pass a law to authorize a compact. Um, and, and that state law generally is, is saying to the governor's office, you know, either you have authority to negotiate or we approve what you have negotiated. Sometimes there's two laws. Sometimes there'll be a law that authorizes the governor to negotiate and then to bring a, a, a negotiated deal back to the legislature for approval. What I don't see as frequently is, is a referendum to authorize a governor to enter into a compact or to approve a compact. But to be fair, that would be within the province of the state sovereign to decide how they would like to essentially authorize that form of gaming. Uh, because for the work session, I would like to further get our legislative analysts to re research on how other states are uh, Will they uh, have the referendum or not? Because it's really uh, uh, been a disadvantage, I feel, for the Native Americans in the past to be competing against other interests that have considerably more money. And uh, it, I, I remember, I know the young lady had mentioned that her, when her father was chief, I remember that, and it was a, a real tough situation. and. I think we have to do things better in the state of Maine. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Representative Tunnel. Any other questions for Mr. Hinton? Uh, I, I've got a quick one for you, sir. Um, how How is this relative? I, I, I've heard it's not relative to the 1980 compact. Um, can you Can you explain why this would be separate from that? If it's If it's an If it's a different negotiated agreement. Does that have that, why that doesn't have any impact on this particular legislation? This this would be an amendment to the main implementing act. And because it would be an amendment to the main implementing act, it would need to. Um, I mean, even before the tribes, you know, passed the law to conduct gaming, it would need to be the law itself. You know, this piece of legislation before you would need to be approved by the tribal communities, which is that's the process that was taken to approve the settlement act at the beginning. Um, this legislation has just been broken out from the separate piece of legislation that deals with other aspects of the main implementing act. Um, and that was a, a decision of the chiefs to um, just have a more concentrated conversation on, on this issue. But it is very much uh, would be an amendment to the implementing act. And, and so would this also require any kind of federal approval as well, or would this be independent of that? That's a great question. And the, the lawyers that have been working on this would say that the, the Congress gave express approval to the state and the tribes to work out civil jurisdictional issues. Um, and, and, and the conduct of gaming is, is legally speaking a civil regulatory issue now that the state of Maine permits gaming in multiple places for, for many entities. Um, so um, in, in that regard, um, my position would be that, that Congress has given advanced consent for the tribes in the state to sort of negotiate this. Um, yeah, I, I think that the, the Attorney General's office, um, you know, might have a slightly different um, position on that, but we worked with the Attorney General's office um, prior to the shutdown in the legislature to make sure that, um, you know, that, that laws that the state and the tribes were negotiating, like the IGRA law, for example, to make sure that um, appropriate protections were being included in the legislation to ensure that um, the, the policy decisions of the tribes and the state could be hopefully effective without needing to go to Congress. But we, we certainly appreciate that that may be necessary and, and we're prepared to do that. Okay, thank you. Representative McCray. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Attorney Hinton. Good to see you again. Um, this is probably redundant, but could you just make sure I'm accurate that we need this law to, for the tribal people to do any gaming? We're talking a lot about casinos, but class two as well, this would be necessary. Is that right? Uh, that's partially right. Um, it's, it's important to note that currently state law permits um, the Passamaquoddy tribe and the Penobscot tribe. I'm, I, don't, I don't believe that this applies to all of the tribes. It may, but the tribes are permitted to conduct, I believe, up to 27 week, weekends per year of, of high stakes bingo currently. Um, they're not allowed to do that every weekend, um, and they need to essentially have special permission from the state to be, they need permits from the state to even conduct those 27 weeks. And then the tribes are also permitted to, for two hours before and two hours after each event where they offer bingo, they're permitted to allow their players to purchase what are called pull tabs, you know, literal pieces of paper from a machine that you would have seen in a casino in like the 1980s. Um, the tribes are permitted to use those old devices for, like I said, four hours on each weekend um, or each day when, when gaming is, when the bingo is offered. Um, but, you know, that's proven to be very, very limited. And so, you know, like the tribes, for example, um, a few years ago, um, there was an effort to, to buy new machines. So, you know, the tribes can use these pull tab machines or lucky seven machines. You literally, you don't see them anywhere anymore. Um, it's hard to repair them and, and it's hard to keep them in operation until the tribes had sought to update those machines um, by literally purchasing something, you know, built in the last 20 years. And, um, and, and there was a bit of a brouhaha over it. And so the tribe's ability to just, you know, stay competitive in any way has been severely limited by the fact that these state gaming rights, um, well, they're embedded in state law right now, and they're not really subject to the discretion of the, the tribes in, in really any situations. So this would give more discretion. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Representative McCrate. Any other questions for Mr. Hinton? Um, one, one, one further note, if you could, Mr. Hinton, for our work session, I know um, Representative Tuttle had asked the analyst to, to look at other states. Uh, this is going to, if you have anything you can contribute to that, that would be greatly appreciated as well, please. I would be happy to. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, seeing no other questions, um, we have Diane Altrzewski, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, up next, and she will be followed by Andrew Adams. Thank you, Chairman Lucchini, and to all, to your co-chair, Kayatso, and to all the members of the committee, uh, Chiefs Francis and Sabatis, Ambassador Dana, and um, Mr. Hinton. I wanna preface my comments by, I'm sorry, my name is Diane Altrzewski. I live in Belfast and I'm a member of the Friends Committee on Tribal State Relations. I wanted to preface my remarks with a quote from the inaugural poem. Amanda Gorman writes, being American is more than a pride we inherit it's the past we step into and how we repair it. So our friends or Quaker Committee on Tribal State Relations welcomes this bill, not because our members universally favor gambling, quite the contrary, but because of the principle it enshrines, namely that it is not the place of non-native people to decide whether to grant or deny Wabanaki people and nations the right to participate in gaming. Friends reject that paternalistic attitude because it denies tribal communities the freedom to determine their own economic destiny, a freedom implicit in their sovereign status. The bill is clear. Any law of this state that is contrary to the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act does not apply to the conduct of gaming activities by the Passamaquoddy tribe, the Penobscot Nation, and the Holton Band of Maliseet Indians within their respective Indian territory or trust land. Maine's obstruction of legitimate tribal activity as described and regulated under IGRA has been a misinformed abuse of power because it violates federal Indian law. So LD 
554 is a simple but necessary correction and a reminder to state government and the citizens of Maine that what happens on tribal land is the sole mutual concern of the federal government and any federally recognized tribe or nation directly involved. That said, as we've been learning, IGRA mandates that tribal state agreements be negotiated uh, for each tribally owned casino. And across the country, so many dollars have been shared with local and state governments through these compacts. Regional economies undeniably benefit from the activity. Most importantly, Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, and Maliseet leadership and their legal teams have demonstrated their common sense and deep commitment to open-ended, respectful consultation with state and local officials to reach such mutually beneficial agreements. It's time we meet them halfway with our own commitment to defer to the well-established canons of federal Indian law. Let 2021 be the year in which Maine awakens to these legal realities and acts accordingly. It will be a welcome sign that Maine has finally understood its historical overreach and intends to move forward fairly and honorably with the respect that is due to Wabanaki people and communities. We strongly urge ought to pass for LD554. Thank you very much. I should probably unmute first. Thank you, Mr. Alt uh, Ms. Altrazeski for your testimony. Any questions from the committee? All right, seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, up next, we have Mr. Andrew Adams. Uh, my apologies, Mr. Ad Mr. Adams, for the delay. I, I, I appreciate you joining us from so far away. Uh, and then after that, we will have uh, Michael uh, Kibi from the uh, ACLU. So Mr. Andrews, when you're ready, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to thank all of you for um, uh, having me this morning for for hosting um, this legislation and you know feel uh, you know honored to be in your presence. You know, want to thank uh, Representative uh, Benjamin Collins for inviting me um, to speak. And um, I guess just a little bit of background. I, I I'm gonna uh, I practice uh, federal Indian law. Um, in the Twin Cities represent um, a number of tribes uh, nationally um, with, you know, their tribal governance, um, issues that they have with the United States and whatever respective state they um, are physically located in. And, um, and I also um, assist tribes with their, their, their gaming enterprises, you know, being in compliance with their own laws, um, with, with federal law, um, and I, the message that I would like to bring, um, you know, to the committee and to um, Maine government is that, I mean, uh, Indian gaming has been the most um, effective tool of self-determination for tribes nationally for a generation. Um, I mean, President Nixon passed the Indian Self-Determination and Educational Assistance Act in the late um, 60s, but it wasn't until the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act of 1988 was passed that um, essentially was the, the next significant step in economic self-determination for tribes. And in my experience, um, I represent uh, quite a few tribes in the Great Lakes that have um, smaller tribal facilities that will be located in, um, in rural areas, because that's where a, a lot of tribes through their treaty negotiations with the federal government, where their, their treaty defined reservations or homelands are located, are not in metropolitan areas, but usually in suburban areas. And um, some of the tribes that I represent in Michigan They've got casinos that are scattered across the, the upper peninsula and also the lower peninsula. Um, but then you've got three large commercial casinos in Detroit and they're all operating um, in coexistence. So I would, I would strongly encourage you all to take up the proposed legislation to allow Maine tribes 
to benefit from the current federal um, Indian policy, which is full-fledged self-determination, to allow them to be self-determinative. And everyone on this call knows that economics play a huge part of that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Adams. Any questions from the committee? Representative Dolliff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's not so much a question, but um, Mr. Adams had pointed out certain areas. During our work session, we asked for like states that also have the Indian gaming, but could we add to the workshop the states that um, like Mr. Adams is talking about, could we add the population of those states too versus what Maine has been? I, I don't see why not. I mean, I, I assume you would ask for census data, right? 2010 census data, is that fair enough? I don't, we don't have anything new, newer than that. That's fine. Just, I'd like to see, when he talks about like Detroit having so many, well, what is the population of, you know, the census in Detroit versus what we have here in Maine? Because we have three or four tribes here, but can we handle three or four more casinos? That's my point. That's why in the work session, I'd like to see population two of the state versus well, thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Representative Dahl. Any other questions for Mr. Adams? Uh, did you have a follow up, Representative? Okay. <laughs> All right, Sarah. Thank you, Mr. Adams. We appreciate your 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 testimony. Uh, that concludes, oh no, sorry, Mr. Kavide, sorry. I, I, I forgot I promoted you up there. Please, sir, whenever you're ready. No problem. Uh, thank you, Representative Chiazzo, Senator Lucchini and members of the committee. Good morning and happy St. Patrick's Day. I'm ashamed to say that even though I live in Representative Wood's Irish stronghold of Portland's District 38, I do not own a green tie, but I promise that by this time next year, I will. Uh, my name is Michael Cabetta, and I'm policy counsel for the American Civil Liberties Union of Maine. And we urge you to support LD 554 because it'll strengthen the sovereignty, independence, and dignity of tribal nations in Maine. Uh, the Wabanaki people's homeland once spanned much of what's now Maine and New Brunswick. Native cultures were inextricably intertwined with the ability to enjoy and use broad swaths of ancestral land for planting, fishing, trapping, and hunting. When European settlers first arrived, the inhabitants of this region generously offered to share their lands. In response to their generosity, native, native lands were stolen, populations decimated, and indigenous peoples were subject to a systematic uh, campaign of genocide. Instead of being able to roam free, freely as the seasons changed, the nations that would benefit from this legislation were forcefully confined to tiny specks of their former ancestral lands. This legislation would, as you've heard, bring Maine law into conformity with federal law, which states that, quote, a principal goal of federal Indian policies to promote tribal economic development, tribal self-sufficiency, and strong tribal government. It would ensure that Wabanaki nations are treated the same as almost 570 other federally recognized tribal nations. It's the inherent right of indigenous nations to use their lands as they see fit. If you pass this bill, you'll create a rising tide that will lift all boats. I urge you to vote ought to pass and thank Representative Tuttle for this book recommendation, which just came in the mail, uh, The True Believer. I uh, have started but not finished it. It's been very enlightening so far. Thank you. Well, I read it a few years ago, so I'm glad you're updating me. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Cabetta. Any, any questions uh, from the committee, non-book related or book related at this point, if you're up? Okay, seeing none, sir, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, that wraps up uh, everybody on the in, uh, in favor side. We'll move over now to uh, against. And first up, I have uh, Chris Jackson. So I will promote Mr. Jackson in, and he will be followed by uh, Cynthia Robbins uh, as well. So Mr. Jackson, when you're ready. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Chiazzo, uh, 
Chairman Lucchini and members of the committee. Um, my name is Chris Jackson. I'm a partner in the lobby firm of Mitchell Tardy Jackson here in Augusta. I'm a resident of Bodenham and I'm here today to testify in opposition to LD 554 on behalf of our client, the Hollywood Casino Hotel and Raceway in Bangor. Um, a little background uh, for new members of the committee. Hollywood has been licensed as a slot machine operator since 2005, following a statewide referendum and a city vote in 2003, and following a countywide referendum licensed as a casino operator with table games uh, since 2012. And while much of the discussion here today has centered on jurisdictional issues, tribal sovereignty and rights, I would like to uh, respectfully sidestep those issues, if I might, and instead focus on a more macro picture of the current state of the casino industry uh, here in Maine. And to put it mildly, it is an intense industry competing for uh, limited dollars in a small rural and regional marketplace. And in fact, Hollywood casinos gross gaming revenues dropped six, uh, 16 to 18% annually since the opening of the Oxford Casino in 2012 before leveling out in more uh, recent years. However, the last 12 months has been a, a different story entirely. It's abundantly clear that the state's gaming industry has been severely impacted, much like the rest of the state's tourism and, and restaurant industry. As of today, less than half of our gaming floor is open, including the continued closure of poker, craps, roulette, and the race book. Banquets and other dining offerings are similarly shuttered. And while we're licensed to operate 1500 slots, the, the market really supports about half that number pre pandemic, but today we're operating just over 300 slot machines with about half of our 18 table games operating. The extended pandemic and corresponding public health emergency orders, although they may have been necessary, have unfortunately turned what we had hoped would be short term furloughs into longer term layoffs. And the lack of consistent business has resulted in a reduction of more than one third in tax revenues for the, the city and the state. We can see a light at the end of the tunnel and we hope that soon we're able to hire back more team members and welcome more customers into our facility in the near future. But that being said, expanding can seek casinos at tribal facilities or anywhere right now will only uh, hurt us more as we fight to get back to pre-pandemic levels. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll close quickly by saying this, this bill does not allow the citizens of Maine to have the final say on casino expansion. And in the last 15 years or so, uh, your constituents have overwhelmingly rejected time and time again, uh, opportunities to expand casinos um, here in the state of Maine. I see I'm out of time, so I'll, I'll wrap it up. Happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Uh, Representative McCrate. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and nice to see you, Mr. Jackson. Nice to see you as well. Um, respectfully, I'm not sure how you can set aside the equity issue. And I guess my question would be, do you see another way to achieve equity um, if, in your opposition to this? It's a, it's a, it's a delicate issue. Um, it's a serious question, and, and I respect where it's coming from. I, I truly do. Um, and it's something that I think we, you know, you do have to wrestle with in a situation like this. The only thing I think I would offer Representative McCrae is that obviously we, we, we would oppose any, any new casinos in the state of Maine. However, if another entity, be it a tribe or, or any other um, party, where to get a new casino license, we would hope that people would, would have to, to adhere to the same rules that we had to adhere to to get our license, that being a statewide vote, um, you know, the same exorbitant level of taxation, honoring the 100 mile radius prohibition from another facility, um, licensing fees, et cetera, on and on and on. It's, it's an imperfect answer, I'll grant you that, but it's, it's really the only one I have at the moment. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Representative McCrate. Any other questions from the committee? All right, seeing none, thank you, Mr. Jackson. Thank you all very much. Have a good day. Thank you, sir. Uh, Senator Lucchini is back. I will turn the gavel over to him. And up next, we have Ms. Robbins. 
Good morning. Uh, my name is Cynthia Robbins. I'm from Poland, Maine. Senator Lucci, Representative Chinook, Shun and dis distinguished members of the Veterans and Legal Affairs. My name is Cynthia Robbins, and I am the owner and operator of the Poland Spring Resort, Poland Spring Golf Course, Cindy Stockside in Poland, Maine. I am providing testimony in opposition to LD 554, an act to create gaming equity fairness for the Native American tribes in Maine. In addition to my concerns as a small business owner, I'm also providing this testimony as a concerned citizen as I have been a resident of Poland, Maine for nearly 50 years. I am also a member and chair of Gems of 26, a group of nonprofits, for-profit, and a government entity, including Shaker Village, Maine Wildlife Park along Route 26, Poland Spring Museums, and the resort, which are rich in history, ecology, and history. I'm also a member of the Poland Economic and, and Community Development Committee. I also sit on two tourism boards for Androscoggin and Oxford Hills Chamber. Poland Springs Resort started as a stagecoach stop way back in 1794 when George Washington was president. So obviously I'm very concerned with tourism for our area. For over 150 years, Poland Springs was owned and operated by the Ricker family. Hard times struck in World War II and consequently many ownership changes happened until my husband Mel Robbins and I began its transformation in 1972. Through the years of hard work, hardships and tragedies, we ultimately prevailed and were successful. With our staff, we have brought almost 20,000 visitors a year to Maine to enjoy our golf course and other amenities. In normal times, we employ 170 local residents in full and part-time jobs and we hope to return to full employment as the state of Maine reopens from this terrible pandemic. We are Poland's second largest taxpayer right after Poland Spring Water. The extensive number of new visitors to our region since the opening of Oxford Casino, Casino more than five years ago has provided many businesses and the businesses of Oxford Casino Hills region with a much needed shot in the arm. Many of the casino customers have stayed at my inns and eaten at my restaurants. Prior to the casino's openings in 1913, we had only a seasonal business. Sorry, but due to the year of reround traffic of the casino, we are now open for the entire year. This decision has led to more year round good jobs and it is great success thanks to the Oxford Casino. Thank you for your time and for the privilege of sharing this business owners and taxpayers view on this subject. I ask the committee vote against LD 554. Thank you, Ms. Robbins for your testimony. Any questions from committee members at this time? Seeing none, thank you for coming in today. Thank you. Okay, next up we will recognize John Williams and he'll be followed by Dan Walker. So Mr. Williams, if you can see us, uh, you have the floor. <clears throat> unmute myself, there we go. There can you go. You hear me now? Can you hear me now? We can hear you, we can't see you, but it's nope, fine if you, if you prefer it that way. That's you fine, you probably yep. wouldn't wanna see me anyhow. Anyhow, <laughs> <laughs> having said that, good morning once again, and, uh, and thank you, Senator Lucchini and Representative Piazzo, and of course, the distinguished members of the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee for letting me take a few minutes to just to uh, speak uh, in opposition to LD554. My name is John Williams. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Oxford Hills Chamber of Commerce, located in Oxford County. We cover 13 towns with over 350 business members. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'll get right to the point. I've testified here before in opposition to other casino related bills and it's important that your committee knows that the citizens and the businesses of the Oxford Hills area and the board of directors for the Oxford Hills Chamber of Commerce, we are collectively in opposition to the operation of any casino or gaming facility that could potentially impact no matter how large or how small negatively the operation of the Oxford Casino Hotel and Event Center in Oxford, Maine. 
As you're likely aware, the casino has been operating far below capacity with only 200 patrons allowed inside due to COVID-19 gathering restrictions. For context, the casino has a gaming floor capacity of almost 2,800 on a normal day. The pandemic has not just hurt Oxford Casino and Hotel. The facility is an economic engine for this entire region. And we felt the impact of restricted visitor traffic over the last year as a result of that. I am not appearing here today to offer any testimony on the legal rights of Maine Native American tribes. Absolutely not. I will say that Maine voters and regulators have set the bar high with regard to approval of any gaming facility. To me, that means a statewide vote, local approval, and the obedience to the 100 mile distance from any other facility. The Oxford Hills Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors unanimously endorsed this project from the outset because they could see the opportunities that a facility of this type would create and how it would ultimately enhance economic development in the region for years to come. We're just beginning to see that come to fruition, but this bill in its current form could potentially reverse that. This is a business in an area that still has great need, can ill afford any reduction in its production of revenue, which of course would also mean a loss of jobs and certainly diminishing development opportunities if the casino's overall performance is affected. The Oxford Casino has been a tremendous asset to these 13 communities, no question about it. That has certainly been the case with all of Oxford County with continued support for local programs and charities, representative on the Chamber's Board of Directors, and a catalyst for attracting and introducing new visitors to the Western Maine region. And also, a willingness to work with and contribute to programs that we facilitate we could not ask for a better partner. The COVID-19 pandemic has been a long, painful experience for us all. Now, just as we start to see the light at the end of the tunnel, as has been mentioned before, it's the worst possible time to threaten the precious resource that so many folks here in the Oxford Hills count on. As I look around, I realize that, you know, when it comes to jobs, which is what I am so focused on as a chamber director, we've lost nearly half the workforce have been furloughed or laid off at the casino. We don't know when that workforce is going to come back. Those people are the people that are suffering right now. That is my biggest concern. Now, respectfully, I ask you to reject this effort at casino gaming expansion, but I wanna tell you that we are here as a Chamber of Commerce to work as closely as we can with the committee in any way that is possible. Thank you so much, all of you. I appreciate you uh, giving me a few minutes this morning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Williams. Any questions from the committee at this time? <clears throat> Seeing none, we thank you for your testimony today. You bet. Thank you so much. Great. Next up, we have Dan Walker. And then after that, we'll move to the neither for nor against testimony where we have uh, Henry Baer. Well, Mr. Chairman, before we do that, I recognize. Representative that... Tuttle, you have a question? Yeah. Well, I have. Well, yes, I'm, I yep. noticed this. Senator Craig Hickman is here. Is he? Uh, yeah. I see his screen. I don't know if he's on right now. There he is. <laughs> yeah. well, welcome yes. back, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Tuttle. I'm Craig Hickman. I represent Senate District 14, Southern Kennebec County, and I am absolutely thrilled to be back here. On this <laughs> yeah, Senator Hickman will be joining us again. He's doubling up with labor. Is that right? Chairing labor? That is correct, sir. It's a busy assignment. <laughs> Great. Well, welcome back. <laughs> And uh, now we'll turn it over to uh, Dan Walker. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, thank you, <coughs> Senator Lucchini, uh, Representative Caezo. And I'd like to welcome back also um, Senator Hickman uh, to the VLA committee and also um, former chair uh, Tuttle. Uh, so there's a lot of experience here in this committee. Um, so my name is Dan Walker, uh, and I represent uh, the Oxford Casino and Hotel in Oxford, Maine, which is owned by Churchill Downs. Today, I testify in opposition to LD554, uh, which will very likely expand gaming uh, in the state of Maine. Um, as you've heard, we, are just, we, we feel that the markets in Maine are saturated, and we feel like any expansion of gaming needs to go through a certain um, process by which we've gone through at, at the same time. Uh, Oxford Casino opened for business in June of 2012. Uh, since then, the casino has expanded three times and is bringing uh, economic vitality to a region, as you've heard, that sorely needed it. 
uh, Oxford County has really made uh, a real turn uh, with providing all these jobs and economic opportunity. Um, as you've heard, since the pandemic, uh, they are down from 450 jobs uh, down to around 250 jobs, and the, the, the casino is operating at just a small capacity. We've heard that it's going to be turning around, but it's been, it's been tough on the region. Um, like I said, uh, 450 folks from the Oxford region work there, uh, well over 200 Oxford County residents and over 100 in Androscoggin and also a number of other neighboring counties. Um, expansion of gaming in, in, in a saturated market will hurt existing facilities, will lose jobs and stagnate existing development. Um, we've, we've heard about, you've heard about cannibalization, but it's, it's real. There's been studies done and it would, you know, and, and putting a, a new facilities in Maine would, depending on where you put it, would really, it cut into the revenues of the existing facilities and hurt the revenue, the, the, the recipients of the, of that revenue. Um, as we've heard, we don't know where a, a facility would go. Uh, there's a lot of unknowns with this. Um, we don't know where it would go. We don't know whether or not there would be a requirement. Uh, right now, there's a hundred mile limit between the facilities uh, under, and under Maine law. Uh, there's a requirement of a state vote under Maine law, and there's also a requirement of municipal approval under, under state law. There's also license fees and a very high tax rate. So we just don't know uh, what this will entail going forward. We've heard that they could, if, if we enter into um, a compact, if, if the tribes go into the direction of casino gaming, uh, that a, a compact will be necessary. And some of these, could, some of these issues could be negotiated in a compact. Um, but we just don't know where the facility would go. We've heard that, um, you know, we know that the, the tribes have a right to purchase more land under the Indian Land Claim Settlement Act, or that's, that's, being, worked, that's being worked out in, in another bill, and there's an opportunity. So we don't know where it could be. Certainly, something like this could go onto, the, onto their Indian lands and their reservations. But the trust lands uh, could be developed uh, in other places, for example, in, in southern Maine. And we don't know if that would, would require municipal approval or otherwise. Also, one last point I'd like to make is that um, it, a compact is required for class three gaming, which are casinos. Anything less than that, which includes electronic Beano, for example, which are just like slot machines. And we, we went through that a couple of years ago on determination of what electronic Beano is, would not require a Beano, would not require a compact. So I put that out. There's a lot of questions out there that we think are still unanswered. So we would ask you to oppose uh, this legislation. Thank you. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Walker. Any questions from the committee at this time? Seeing none, thank you for coming in today. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Henry Bear. And I believe that will, will be the final testimony. So welcome. Oh, oh. Welcome, yeah. Chairman Lucchini. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Thank you. Uh, and respected uh, members of the committee, especially seeing uh, Representative Tuttle again and all our friends uh, from when I served uh, on the committee uh, for a short while uh, ago. Uh, but I have that perspective uh, to call upon as I make my brief presentation to you all today. First of all, I, uh, I, I registered uh, to be a neutral so that I could speak last. And I'm glad so far that this is working. Uh, and uh, there's a reason for that. I wanted to hear uh, all the perspectives before I, I made my comments. But briefly, my position is that uh, on behalf of the Maliseets, and my name is Henry Bear, and I'm speaking to you from the Aristic Treaty Education Center. And I am uh, in Aristic County, of course. And uh, I am going to just say uh, basically three things. One, the tribe has enacted a tribal gaming law uh, back in 2013, 
and it is to conduct uh, casino gaming on land specifically set aside by the United States and trust for the purpose of operating tribal gaming. And uh, that is the current law for the tribe. It is a valid law. Second, we have the Cabazon uh, ruling by the United States Supreme Court, uh, which uh, authorizes such gaming on tribal lands. And that preceded uh, the enactment of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, which Maine is not a party to uh, by its own design. As I recall, Susan Collins uh, uh, involved uh, intervened to make sure that it did not apply in Maine. I think that was a mistake. Uh, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, third, uh, I have taken the time in preparing uh, my perspective over the past period by actually going to Southern California to Fantasy Gardens Casino, which is owned by the Cabazon Mission Indians, and met with both their leadership and their legal counsel in preparing a position that I've put uh, on for everyone to be able to access here today, uh, my brief, which lays out the history of our tribal gaming uh, activities since before uh, John Giles was captured by us in Pemaquid and brought up here to Aroostook County in 1698, uh, where he records in his diary how, you know, we just spent a lot of time, you know, with uh, dice and bones and uh, uh, gambling uh, and also uh, using uh, these uh, gaming activities as a way of resolving disputes as to hunting territory and other issues. So uh, we have a historical record of uh, gaming as one of the uh, primary activities, economic activities of the tribe, uh, going back for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. But please take time to read that. Uh, and I bring that up because after completing, uh, because I drove out there in the back of my Chevy van, and they put me up in their beautiful uh, multi-story top floor presidential suite uh, to be able to write my submission over an eight-day period. They didn't charge me a penny. They even gave me gas money to drive back to Maine, uh, where I was then going to be standing by for oral arguments should the court decide to hear the question which the House, uh, in House paper, I think it was 93, a correction, House Order 72, two years ago, had posed the question to the Supreme Court. Mr. Bear, I, I, Mr. Bear, I'll just remind you, your three minutes have concluded, so if you can wrap up your testimony, that would be appreciated. Yes. I'll just ask you to read that, read the support that we have. I've also posted from local industries uh, to realize that in conclusion that uh, uh, the bill, I think, has been improperly worded. It should be named uh, the state is seeking uh, to uh, create equity for itself uh, in that right now the Cabazon ruling denies jurisdiction to the state with regard to tribal gaming on tribal lands. And this bill should read that the state wants to be treated equitably as compared to all the other states in the United States, because we already have Supreme Court rulings which are superior to legislation that applies in Maine, even without the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. So the Passamaquoddy ruling in 96 is not relevant to uh, affecting the Cabazon uh, law, which we benefit from. And I would urge tribal leaders uh, that if this initiative fails to consider uh, undertaking development, uh, you know, and go full speed ahead because there would be a serious doubt as to jurisdiction. And the entire House of Representatives two years ago agreed that there was a question that main law could apply to deny tribal gaming. So those are my submissions. I'm standing by for any questions and I can provide uh, information if called upon to do so uh, by way of email response to bearlaw2 at yahoo.com. But thank you, Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. Great to see everybody. It's good to see you. Uh, Representative Tuttle has a question. <clears throat> yeah, Henry, good to see you again. I had asked- uh, You too, previous John previous speakers about the uh, referendum aspect of our laws as compared to other states, Henry, because I, I see it as a big disadvantage for the native tribes uh, in the past. Would you agree? 
Well, I think that's obvious. The numbers uh, would not favor us in millions of dollars that's been spent uh, by the Passamaquoddy uh, and the tribes generally uh, to try to make the case to Maine voters. But this is too important a question uh, to leave to a referendum. Uh, clearly, Supreme Court has already heard all of the arguments that Dan Walker and uh, the uh, you know lobbyists for Oxford Casino have made, and they have lost those arguments. The policy of the United States towards the tribes is that we are not going to be on the street panhandling. We are not going to have to beg, and that tribal gaming is a legitimate government effort to generate critical resources to fill in gaps that uh, are kept program dollars just don't provide us the health care and housing. We have homeless. We have dental work that's needed. You're going to hear a lot of this uh, over the next period. Now that I know how to use this, uh, this uh, uh, computer link up, you know, I've given you guys a break by uh, uh, being an apparent uh, uh, hiatus, but it's only because it, I'm a slow learner with regard to this technology. But now that I'm on the line, uh, those are my uh, you know, comments as to that question, John, that this question has been asked and answered. Mainers approve of gaming. And the Supreme Court says when that happens, especially with regard to, as Corey Hinton points out, the class three gaming uh, type, then uh, the state must enter into a, a compact approach. If, if uh, we even want an IGRA to apply, I would urge the chiefs not to. Uh, right now, Cabazon, the Supreme Court ruling applies. Maine is not, uh, doesn't have a right uh, by way of IGRA to uh, ask for a compact. That's why this legislation should be reworded to give Maine a chance. Right now, the chiefs, our people, don't have to share a penny with regard to Cabazon-based, uh, Supreme Court-based uh, gaming activity. You would be gratuitously uh, treated by the tribes if we were to agree to this bill being passed and, and submitting to federal jurisdiction. Whereas right now, uh, the legislation clearly does not apply to Maine, and therefore Maine, under IGRA, does ha doesn't have any standing to enter into a compact with us. So I think the the chiefs, the people are in the driver's seat legally. And I only say that because I did a little study the past two years when I got my Master of Laws degree. You may not know that I've been away, uh, you know, studying, and I've graduated specifically researching this and treaty law and Aboriginal title issues and federal law. There are limits. And the Supreme Court has limited both federal jurisdiction and state jurisdiction and preserved because it's darn good policy that tribes are self-sufficient and they also recognize our sovereignty. Thank you for the question. Any other questions? Representative uh, Wood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually, I don't have a question for um, Mr. Bear, but I was slow on my raised hand with the last um, speaker uh, who was questioning where in the state it could be. And I just wondered for the work session, if Janet could provide, I think there's maps out there that show tribal land and the land and trust for the tribe so that we could just see where all that is. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Representative Wood. We can uh, get that information for the work session. Um, and I believe we've been given some of that information previously during the, the tribal task force as well. So um, with the maps, is that what you're asking? I, my internet broke up for a minute there. I missed. Okay. okay, sorry, thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions at this time? Okay, seeing none, thank you. It's good to see you, Mr. Bear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, and at, with that, it looks like that is all that we had uh, signed up to testify. Uh, just to double check. So, yep, that, that looks like it. So we will close the public hearing on LD 554. So thank you everybody for your testimony. <clears throat> And I believe we have Representative McCrate here. She's been in multiple committees this morning. <laughs> um, so we will open the public hearing on LD 
623, an act to amend the advanced deposit wagering laws, and that is uh, being presented by Representative McCright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Apparently, I didn't need to worry about being back in time. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you're all set. I don't think it will. Uh, Senator Lucchini, Representative Chiazzo, today I present LD 623, an act to amend the advanced deposit wagering laws. I was asked to sponsor this bill by Churchill Downs with the support of off-track betting facilities. And the off-track betting um, folks have suggested one um, concern that I'll mention later. Advanced deposit wagering is a form of parimutuel wagering on horse races. It's a system in which all bets are pulled together and winnings are shared in proportion to the wagers. With ADW, wagers are made online. The ADW account holder deposits funds into a wagering account administered by the ADW licensee. Wagers are made on behalf of the account holder by the licensee and winnings are paid to the account holder's ADW account. The bill proposes repeal of the 2016 provision that directed the Department of Public Safety Gambling Control Board to initiate a competitive bidding process in which one bidder was to be awarded the, the license to conduct ADW. The bill was awarded in 2020 to Penn National Gaming Incorporated. This bill proposes instead that any entity with the appropriate qualifications would be eligible to apply to the board for a license to conduct ADW. Eligible entities would be those with a licensed commercial track, an OTB facility license, or those who are licensed to conduct ADW in another state. The rationale of allowing more than one licensee is that multiple licensees will provide more options for wagering and afford greater revenue to the state. The proposal before you also sets out requirements and conditions of any licensee, including the amount of the non-refundable application fee, license and renewal fees, bonding requirements, background check requirements, and licensing requirements for employees. It also specifies that any entity awarded such a license will remit 5% of their gross ADW income to the Gambling Control Board for distribution by that board. Uh, the, as I mentioned, the OTBs um, were concerned about, in, um, would love to see included something about um, the companies that are licensed to conduct ADW in Maine must make available any and all racetrack simulcast signals in which they own or represent and to, to present those to Maine paramutual operators at a rate no more than half of 1%, oh, sorry, one half percent higher than it sells to the lowest priced customer. And I leave that to the committee for discussion. Thank you for your attention. While I'll do my best to answer your questions, I suggest that those testifying after me will be much better able to give you detailed answers. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative McCright. Any questions uh, for the bill sponsor at this time? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. <clears throat> Just looking through the list to see if we have any co-sponsors here. I'm not seeing at any at the moment. So we will move to the public hearing testimony portion for this bill. And again, I'll remind everybody just to state your name, your residence and the organization you represent uh, just so that we know who you are and where you're from. And also that we use the three minute uh, clock. So the order will we'll begin with those who are speaking in favor and we're gonna go, we're gonna go down the list. We'll start with Dan Walker, uh, followed by Don Barbarino. Oh, there he is, yeah. And then Gary Sagris. Did, oh. did you call on me? Yeah, sorry, yep, yep, oh, you're good. Sorry. Yeah, okay. you lose the sound for a second there. I always forget that, so. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Senator Lucchini, uh, Representative Chiazzo, members of the uh, Veterans Legal Affairs Committee. Again, my name is Dan Walker, and I represent Churchill Downs. Um, this time, I, uh, the focus is on one of uh, Churchill Downs' um, other subsidiaries, which is Twin Spires. Um, 
right now, um, Twinspires is the largest advanced deposit wagering operator in the United States. Uh, it operates in 40 states and over 80% <laughs> of Twinspires customers do not regularly wager at racetracks or off-track betting facilities, meaning that Twinspires is bringing an entirely new group of customers to the sport. What we've seen in the past is we've seen a folks dropping off and, and not participating as much in the, in the horse racing industry. And these new, and these new, um, uh, these online operators have brought tremendous <laughs> energy uh, to this. And I just, before I go forward, I just also want to thank Representative McCrate for bringing this forward. <laughs> I jumped, jumped right into my testimony. Um, the bill before you, LD 623, is nearly identical to the same bill that was passed by uh, basically unanimous committee report uh, last session. Uh, we made a couple tweaks to it and I can, I can talk about that below. Um, around the country, ADW operators are permitted to accept interstate wagers under federal law, namely the Interstate Horse Racing Act or the IHA. Uh, the IHA's purpose is to regulate interstate commerce with respect to wagering on horse racing in order to further the horse racing and legal off-track betting industries in the United States. So it creates a playing field so folks can, can bet on races across state lines. Twinspires would promote main horse racing across the country by allowing residents of other states to place online wagers on main races. Main residents used to be able to place bets on this platform on races around the country, such as the Kentucky Derby. Um, Churchill Downs and Twinspires wishes to resume operating in Maine by participating in an open ADW market. Um, we've worked with the bill's sponsor in an effort to revise the existing program that limits the market to only one ADW provider. This would be like having one video streaming service, like one Netflix or one Hulu. This is gonna provide more variety. Um, under this newly proposed structure in LD623, multiple providers could apply for licenses. Competition is crucial. We've proposed a 5% tax rate placed on Maine, uh, wagers placed in Maine. Um, additionally, this bill includes a provision in Section 9 that will allow multi-jurisdictional account wagering providers to maintain eligibility to receive an ADW license, despite having received waivers from Maine residents before the current single ADW license was awarded. This bill creates a clean slate to allow the ADW program to become the best that it can be. Thank you for your consideration and um, I'll take any questions that you might have. Thank you, uh, Mr. Walker. Any questions from the committee at this time? <clears throat> Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Okay. Next up, we have Don Barbarino. Um, can everybody, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can yeah. see you too, yeah. Okay, great. Welcome. Yeah, good to see you again. Uh, good morning, Senator Lucchini, Representative Caiazzo, and distinguished members of the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee. My name is Don Barbarino, and I operate the Sanford and Waterville OTBs, and I'm speaking in favor of uh, uh, LD623. Uh, the current advanced deposit wagering system, as Dan mentioned, only permits one ADW to, kind of, to operate in the state. And um, it's, it's not a, the, the, this is not the best way for consumers. When consumers have options, they are better served. And this bill would open up the market to other companies who would be licensed by the Gambling Control Board and would pay the 5% marketing fee to the main harness racing uh, industry. And this bill would also allow the proposed main commercial track to create its own website, one that would feature main harness racing, promote agricultural fairs, uh, the Sire Stakes program, and it has the potential to be a great promotional tool for the main harness racing industry. So one aspect of, of this bill is when you open it up, the main harness racing industry, the commercial track could open its own ADW if it, if it so chose. Um, and this bill's similar to LD uh, 587, which would which give the state three ADW operators. That's the same objective, opening up uh, to multiple ADW um, providers, and that would also be beneficial to the state. So thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Barbarino. 
<clears throat> Any questions from committee members at this time? Okay, seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Gary Sagris, followed by James Bass, followed by James Day. So Gary, if you can hear us, we're ready for you. I can, yes, I can hear you, Senator. There we go, now we can hear you, Gary. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Lucchini, Representative, Representative Casaltasa and distinguished members of the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee. My name is Gary Sagris, and I'm the owner and operator of the off-track bank facility in Brunswick, and I've been in the business since 1996. I'm here today to uh, support the uh, bill from, from Representative McCrit in regards to expanding the uh, off-track betting wagering in the state of Maine. I think competition is good, and uh, I have uh, customers, and I have a good relationship with uh, Mr. Jackson and Penn National, but I have customers that really, they'd like to have another site to have the opportunity to possibly wager on, other than just Penn National. Uh, I know Twin Spires has a good, very strong impact in the, in the business. And I, I think uh, personally, I think it would be good to have two or three different companies uh, involved in the advanced deposit wagering. Uh, because of the pandemic, because of the bad weather, a lot of people have had to stay home and, and they would like to play some of the races at home instead of traveling out in the cold main winters. And I, I just think from my perspective, and I've seen a lot of ups and downs in the business uh, that I think it would be good to have a, one or two more advanced deposit wagering companies up and operating in the state of Maine. Um, it's nice to see you, Senator Lucchini. It's been a long time since I've seen you and uh, hopefully things are gonna get better for everybody so that you'll be back to go to Augusta. So we'll all be able to go up there. It's very difficult for everybody under these circumstances and everybody's trying to do their best they can. I appreciate that. And I thank you for your time. I think Don Barberino and Jim Day probably could give you a better concept of where we stand in regards to this matters. But you know, Senator Lucchini, that I'm a team player. I speak from my heart. I try. I, you get what you see with me. So it's nice to see you. Happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody. And I sure hope next year will be a lot different for all of us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gary. Always good to see you. Uh, any Thanks. questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you. Thank you, sir. Take care. Yes, sir, you too. Okay, next up, um, I think it was James Bass, is that right? Yeah, followed by Jim Day. <clears throat> well, um, good afternoon and happy St. Patrick's Day to the committee. Um, Senator Lucchini, Representative Chiazzo, and members of the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee. My name is James Bass. I live here in Augusta, um, and I'm here on behalf of ExpressBet. Um, I'd also like to point out that uh, in the room is Mr. Gene um, Shabrier, who's the VP of Regulatory Affairs and Business Development at, for, at ExpressBet. If any of you have any technical questions, um, you know, please reach out to, to both of us. Um, ExpressBet is, a, is, an, is an ADW company. Um, they, are current, they are a nationwide company. They are currently licensed in 22 states. Um, their pending um, authorization is pending in Iowa. Um, and they became effective in Michigan uh, this past Monday. Um, 
ExpressBets uh, is strongly supports LD623, and we thank Representative McCrate for putting it forward. Um, as you've heard before, and as you heard, and you likely hear after me, um, it will bring more choice and offerings to Maine residents looking to wager responsibly um, and increase revenue for the general fund and other in-state entities. Um, while we uh, appreciate uh, Representative Millett's um, bill that was introduced earlier, um, we think this Senator McCrate's or uh, Representative McCrate's bill goes farther um, and really accomplishes uh, the goals that, that we think this legislation can. Um, as you know, there's currently only one provider in the state, and this limitation forces main players onto just one platform. Um, as you heard, you know, we think more platforms, um, more competition, better offerings for the state. Um, and under this proposal, the state would continue to see the same revenue uh, that the current that is that is currently allotted under state law. So there's no change to the beneficiaries, the state, uh, the state general fund, and then the other, um, and then the other beneficiaries, most notably um, agricultural fairs uh, and the harness racing community. So, um, to summarize this bill: more choice in ADW providers, more races to wager on. The state would see more rev revenue. Um, In-state beneficiaries continue to receive income. Um, we think this is a, is a win for Maine players and a win for for the state. Um, and with that, I whew, and with that, I got the cell phone from Representative Chiazzo, so I made it under the allotted time on St. Patrick's Day. I don't want to violate it on St. Patrick's Day, so happy to take any questions. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Bass. Any questions from the committee at this time? Seeing none. Thank you for your testimony. Okay, next up we have Jim Day. Welcome back. Thank you. Good morning, Senator. Good after, it might be afternoon now. Uh, yeah. Senator Lucchini, Representative Chiazzo, and distinguished members of the Veterans and Legal Affairs. My name is Jim Day. I'm a resident of Scarborough and president of LRI Inc. and operate the Lewiston OTB and used to operate the former racetrack Lewiston Raceways. I'm speaking in favor of LD623 with a proposed amendment. Um, the original proposed ADW bill or internet wagering bill did not limit the number of ADW operators. This was changed at this committee and the bill was passed as such. What we found in operations is that our customers like to have choices as to the platforms they are using uh, for ADW wagers. Rewards, promotions, tracks, types of wagers, etc. cetera, um, are different from site to site. Currently, they're not enamored with uh, the existing site and therefore are choosing not to use it. And our ADW numbers are below our anticipated uh, levels. This bill will allow more ADW operators in the market. The end result will allow the in-state users to choose which sites they enjoy most. This will benefit the entire industry in the state as we all share in the income generated. A second part of this bill is Churchill Downs asking for a legislative pardon for taking wages from Maine citizens allegedly illegally before the ADW bill was operational. While I do not condone Churchill's alleged illegal activity within the state, I can look past that behavior if we can gain your support on an amendment that would require them to provide their signal to us at a cost no more than half a percent greater than their best customer. This will provide main customers with the track signals that have been withheld from the OTBs and tracks by Churchill Downs for over a year. Their reaction to losing the bid on the ADW. Only because this bill is being heard in anticipation of our testimony did Churchill provide us with contracts last week for their signals. And it is only good through April 30th 2021, a little over two weeks. The tracks we had not been able to take are more than just Churchill Downs and the Kentucky Derby, but tracks such as Oaklawn, Fairgrounds, Arlington, Canterbury, Louisiana, there's a dozen of them, Turfway, uh, et cetera. We need the amendment because of the toxic and clearly vindictive nature of Churchill Downs and their history. It forced uh, us to, if forced to just offer us a contract, they could take us to a percentage, thank you representative, 
that is greater, so great that we would lose money on their signals. And that would be effectively denying us our signal. In wrapping this up, I hope you will consider uh, uh, an amendment that uh, has been discussed with Representative McCree. I'm available for any questions. And thank you very much for allowing me to testify again in front of you today. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Day. And uh, I just wanted to, to touch on that last comment that you, you made. So over the, after Churchill lost their, the, the RFP to, to Penn, they, they suspended the signal to all of the main uh, providers. Is that right? That is not only their signal, but all signals that they're in control of, which essentially is 12 tracks or more, including the Kentucky Derby. Very frustrating. Right, and I'm assuming that for, for your business and all the others in the state of Maine, the Kentucky Derby Day is generally the biggest day of the year. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. That's a, that provision in this bill caught my eye where Churchill got the kind of um, pardon for, as you called it, for um, previous bet taking, it seems. And their leverage on us is extreme. I'm just hoping, I mean, that they all play you know, that they'll play fair basically and allow us to, to take their signal. We were the only state in the country that it was withheld from. Um, and in so doing, I also wanted to address the percentage because they could essentially offer the signal and then make it so expensive that it's not available. Uh, so um, uh, I wouldn't want that either. You know, yeah. And, and just Right, and just so I understand, so they've offered the signal just a couple of weeks ago and they're only going to have it last through April? Is that what you said? Your contract ends in April and instead of giving us, um, so they just gave us contracts last week. Uh, we're just starting to take the signal. We had to fill out the contracts and get them approved. Um, instead of allowing us to have next year's contract with an extension, backwards of two weeks, they chose to just give us last year's contracts, which ends on uh, April 30th. And uh, I think their intent is to send us a new contract, but that's year to year. And again, how uh, it, it caught us by surprise last year when you know we weren't the judges of, of their bid or on the ADW, uh, and yet my customers and the state of Maine residents paid, paid the price. Yeah, I, I heard the same loud and clearly from many people. Um, Representative Kinney. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and um, Senator Kinney may have kind of touched on this with asking you questions I, where you were given a time, <laughs> the, the time clock. Was there anything additional you wanted to share with us, especially for those of us that are newer to the committee? I will put my testimony up. Um, uh, for you all to read. It wasn't much more. I just, uh, and I think I was able to cover it, thankfully, with Senator Lucchini's questions. Uh, again, this amendment um, is very important, I think, to protect the main customer uh, to the bill and, and, and allow their signal. And they're still not allowing the signal at um, Bangor's uh, or the ADW site. So they're not allowing, wait, current, while they are allowing my customers in our OTVs to wager, they can't go to the current ADW site. That is not being offered their signal, is my understanding, as well as uh, Penn Nationals Racebook. Okay, any other questions? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Day, for your testimony. Much. Great, and that looks like that concludes our list of people who signed up to testify today. <clears throat> All right, so with that, we will close the public hearing on LD 623. All right, so this afternoon, let's see. Yeah, so that, um, oh, actually we do have some bills for this morning. <laughs> uh, so Janet, I don't know if you're there, perhaps um, it may be best if we take a lunch break now where it's 1245, um, uh, potentially caucus if either side is, is interested in that and maybe meet back here at about between 115-ish, 130. 
Um, and we'll start work on, we have two bills before us for work session, LD 526 and LD 580. And then we have all the budget related items um, as well. So yeah, I think at this time we'll take a break and we'll come back at 1.30, I think if that works for everybody to get a bite to eat and a quick um, caucus. So uh, you can all use the same link to get back here. And uh, yep, so we'll break to 1.30.
Okay, it's a little after 1.30, so we'll get ready to uh, restart. I think we have Janet here with us. Um, just for uh, committee members' reference, Janet sent out an email this morning um, with all the committee information, um, all the bill analysis and stuff. So it's uh, if, if you need to find any of that stuff, it's all in your inbox today at 627. So if you're looking for the time. Janet had been working for six hours at that point. <laughs> okay, so I think what we'll do, we've got a number, we have a couple of bills on our agenda. So we've got LD 580, a resolution proposing an amendment to the Constitution of Maine regarding early voting. And we have LD 526, which is an act to require an affidavit for every independent expenditure influencing an election and to penalize the use of myth, mistruths. So I guess we'll start with LD 526, um, Janet, if that works for you. It's a hard title to pronounce. It does, I'm glad you said it because now I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanna show everyone there's been a slight change in how I've been directed to have materials posted on the website, which is probably, although maybe not, why Senator Lucchini reminded you about the email. I'm trying to zoom in a little. Okay, so you all know about this VLA committee material page. And if you don't, um, for example, Senator Hickman, I am happy to walk you through um, how to get here. But we now have the um, electronic LD file for every bill. So starting from now onwards for any work session materials, it will be posted there. So the way you find it is you come to this page, you click on the committee meeting materials by LD number. We're about to do the work session on LD 526, so these should all be in numerical order. I certainly hope so. You look down, oh, there's 526, you click on it, and there's your electronic LD file. I know that's several steps, but it's um, just the way we had to make the program work after we've been transitioning between different programs and trying to improve access to everything as we go. You may recognize this page. Um, this is the new page that the IT department created where hearing testimony will be automatically posted. So as people submit it, instead of it going to your email inbox, it's now being posted on this page. Anybody has access to this page if they go through the steps I just showed you. If somebody's name shows up and there's no little blue thing, that means they didn't submit testimony with that. Although you can see here, um, Director Richmond didn't necessarily submit testimony, but then later on he did, and you'll see that with the little blue um, document thing. If you were to click on that, that would show you the document. But the way that this system works uh, out of my control, out of IT's control, is that everything is listed by hearing date, which is why we have everything posted, like I said, going through the committee materials page so that you don't have to remember the hearing date for everything. We've made a link there for you. So now you just look, where is 526? Ah, here it is. Sorry, I just have this crazy way of annotating the way I find things. You can laugh, it's okay. So LD 526 is here. On the right-hand side, you'll see down arrows. That shows you what to click on to find all the materials related to it. So here we're gonna click and find everything on LD 526. Luckily, it's not a long list. You're gonna see the people who testified. If you were to click on this blue, you see their testimony. And then anytime you see an at symbol and then something that will be something our office posted. And um, if it's a really long list, if you click with this name button here, you'll either put them all at the bottom or all at the top. So you can find the things for work session that way. Alternatively, you can look at the submission date and see what's the most recent thing, what's the, the earliest thing that was posted. But as you can see here for LD 526 for today's purposes, the bill analysis is now posted here and you can find it by clicking on the document link. And then also the attorney general's office sent a letter and that's been posted here as well. Part of the reason why I'm telling you all this is so you all can find it, but then anyone else listening will also now know how they can find these documents as well. So thank you for your indulgence in going through this. And I'm happy to go through it any other time. Give me a call, I'll walk you through it. 
And hopefully this will help everybody find everything. The goal is you now have in one place the things that you would find in your folder if you were here in person, all the testimony and submissions. So as far as the bill analysis for this bill, so I'm not gonna restate the name because I can't say the M word, but uh, <laughs> section seven of this bill prohibits a person which is defined in the elections law to include an individual committee firm, partnership, corporation, association, or organization. So all of those are persons. So the bill prohibits those persons from with actual malice, making an independent expenditure to design, produce, or disseminate a communication that contains a false statement regarding any candidate. I put little A, B, C, D to show you all four of those things have to be met for the prohibition. Um, so it requires actual malice and the false statement and it has to be an independent expenditure. Um, section five of the bill additionally requires that any person using the definition above who makes an independent expenditure in excess of $250 during a single candidate's election would be required to find a writ file a written signed statement under oath stating that the communication financed by that independent expenditure does not contain a false statement made with actual malice regarding any candidate. So you can't make this statement and then you have to file an affidavit that you didn't do so with your independent expenditure. There are penalties set forth in the bill. So under section one, a person who either makes a false statement on the affidavit that's required in the bill or who makes an ex independent expenditure that violates the prohibition in the bill can be assessed a penalty of up to $5,000 by the Commission on Governmental Ethics and Election Practices. The bill directs that in determining the amount of a penalty to impose, the commission should consider the level of the intent to mislead and, and the penalty necessary to deter similar misconduct in the future, as well as the level of harm suffered by the public. Section seven of the bill also clarifies that in addition to the penalties provided in the bill, a candidate may also seek monetary or equitable relief through a defamation action. A defamation actions are um, libel actions, which is written defamation or slander, which is spoken defamation. Um, there's also several provisions of the bill that make technical corrections to try and make the statute on independent end expenditures just a little bit easier to read, but they don't make any substantive changes. So unless you ask me to, I'm not gonna go over them, but they aren't intended to be substantive in nature. So some additional information for you. Um, in this section, by the way, I try to put things I would wanna know if I were you, and I may be guessing wrong, in which case just send me an email and say, Janet, we really would love if you told us this, or we don't love it when you tell us that. That would be helpful to me. So under um, the current statute, which is attached to this bill analysis and hyperlinked there as well, an independent expenditure is an expenditure that is not made in cooperation with or at the request of a candidate or the candidate's authorized committee and that is made to design, produce, or disseminate a communication that either expressly advocates the election or defeat of a candidate or names or depicts a clearly identified candidate within a certain short time frame before the election in which the candidate's running. There are some exceptions to this definition, however. If the expenditure only qualifies in this as an independent expenditure under this part B because it names or identifies a candidate and is within a certain time. So for example, if it doesn't actually expressly advocate the election or defeat of a candidate, but it's just within this certain time frame, the statute allows the person making that independent expenditure within 48 hours of disseminating the communication to submit a signed statement to the Ethics Commission stating that the expenditure was not incurred with the intent to influence the nomination, election, or defeat of the candidate. They can also provide some supporting evidence. If the Ethics Commission is convinced, then they can decide that it wasn't an independent expenditure subject to all of these independent expenditure rules. So what are the current campaign finance requirements for independent expenditures? Under the statute, a person who makes an independent expenditure in excess of $250 in any one candidate's election has to file an itemized report of the date and purpose of each expenditure and stating whether it's in support of or opposition to the candidate. And those reports have to be filed in accordance with some deadlines established by the Ethics Commission and rules. Those reports have to be accompanied by a signed sworn statement 
signed sworn statement that they weren't made, the ex expenditure was not made in coordination with the candidate because that's the essence of an independent expenditure. Um, under the statute as well, the penalty for filing a late or not substantially conforming report is $5,000 unless the independent ex expenditure exceeded $50,000, in which case the penalty can be up to the maximum amount of the expenditure. In addition, under other law, a communication funded by an entity making an independent expenditure generally has to conspicuously dis disclose the names of the top three funders of that entity. And there are some penalties for failure to disclose those top three funders. Now the bill uses um, the phrase actual malice to de define the state of mind of the person making the ind independent expenditure that contains a false statement about the candidate. And so although that phrase is not defined in the bill, it may be helpful for you to know that actual malice is a term of art defined in multiple court cases. As the main law court has explained, a false statement made about a public official or a public figure on matters of public concern is privileged. So you generally have to, you have a right under the First Amendment to make all kinds of statements about public officials on matters of public concern. And you it usually can't form the basis of a defamation action unless you make your statement with actual malice. And that is with knowledge that it, the statement was false or with reckless regard, disregard to whether it was false or not. So as the law court has explained to prove actual malice, the plaintiff must show that the defendant either knew that the statement was false or acted with a high degree of awareness of the probable falsity. Now that shows you how lawyers think. Um, under the bill, this is hard when we're not all in the room. I can only see one person laughing. At the public hearing, there were several concerns raised. So the first concern was about timing. The Ethics Commission um, in testimony indicated that under its current rules, a person making an independent expenditure within 60 days before an election has to file the reports required by current law within two calendar days of making the expenditure. And in, if they make their expenditure within 14 days before the election, they only have one calendar day to make their report, to file their report, excuse me. And as I read the rules, weekends and holidays are not excluded from these calculations. Commission staff therefore expressed concern in the testimony that requiring persons who are making independent expenditures to affidavit that they weren't making false statements with actual malice may add to the challenge of filing timely reports under these short deadlines. In addition, commission staff expressed concern that it would be difficult for the ethics commission members as they are required to by the bill to determine the truth or falsity of statements that are financed by independent expenditures. And it might also be difficult for them to determine whether such statements were made with actual malice because these determinations are sometimes subjective, especially with a lot of campaign speech. And also to get at the actual malice, it may require intrusive investigations into the internal communications of entities making those expenditures. So that was another concern raised in testimony. The League of Women Voters of Maine, the ACLU of Maine, and the Ethics Commission also expressed concern that the bill may be vulnerable to a court challenge on First Amendment grounds. So as I've mentioned to you before, um, discussions of public issues and debate on the qualifications of candidates have the highest level of protection under the First Amendment. And because this bill burdens core political speech regarding a campaign for political office, if challenged, it will be held unconstitutional unless it survives strict scrutiny. That is, a court has to conclude that it's both necessary to serve a compelling state interest and it's narrowly drawn to achieve that end. The first question about a compelling interest, um, the Supreme Court has held that a state's interest in preventing fraud and libel carries special weight during election campaigns when false statements, if credited, may have serious adverse consequences for the public at large. So it is possible that a court would find that this um, bill is backed by a compelling state interest. Under question two, however, is this um, bill both necessary to and narrowly drawn to achieve that compelling interest? It's important for you perhaps to know that similar laws in other states that prohibit false campaign speech have repeatedly been struck down under this second prong of the strict scrutiny test. Although those cases aren't binding in Maine, the committee may find them instructive in analyzing this bill and potential amendments to this bill. 
So in 2007, the Supreme Court of Washington concluded that a state statute prohibiting any person other than a candidate from sponsoring with actual malice, political advertising, or an electioneering communication that contains a false statement of material fact about a candidate for public office was not narrowly tailored, in part because it was over-inclusive in that it was not limited to defamatory statements that tended to be harmful to the candidate's reputation, so it was any false statement, and also in part the bill was struck down because it was under-inclusive. It didn't apply to false statements made by candidates about themselves, which the court noted could pose an equal threat to the state's alleged interest in protecting elections from fraud. Similarly, in 2016, the US Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit held that an Ohio law prohibiting the knowing or reckless dissemination of false statements about a candidate during the course of any campaign for nomination or election to public office was unconstitutional. The Sixth Circuit agreed that Ohio had a compelling interest in ensuring its citizens' right to vote was not undermined by fraud in the election process, but it again, the, the law failed on that second narrowly tailored ground. There were several reasons um, for the court's decision that it wasn't narrowly tailored, including a timing reason because there was no guarantee under that law that a decision on the potential violation could be issued before the election and a finding that would occur after the election the court thought would not preserve the integrity of the election. There was also no mechanism to screen out frivolous complaints. Um, the court also noted that the law applied to all false statements, even non-material statements about a candidate's shoe size. That was the um, example given in the case. <laughs> so if you think that's material, I'm sorry, that court did not agree. Um, the court also noted that the law applied to commercial intermediaries, so like billboard companies, that doesn't really apply here, however. And um, the court also noted that the law was over-inclusive because it didn't exclude false statements made months before an election when a candidate would have ample time to challenge the statement with the truth. So although I don't think it's possible to firmly 100% ever predict the outcome of a, of a First Amendment challenge to a bill, I do think there are several parts of this bill, which under the um, analysis given in those two court cases might pre present some difficulties, including that this bill that prohibits all false statements about a candidate, not just those that are either defamatory or material to the candidate's campaign for office. The bill also applies only to false statements financed by an independent expenditure and not a false statement financed by the candidate or by an opponent of the candidate. The bill also applies to false statements made at any point during the election cycle, not just those made in the final days before an election when there might not be sufficient time to challenge the falsity of the statements. Um, if you do wanna go forward with the bill, there are two technical issues that I won't get into now that are listed here about the statutes governing independent expenditures, different ways to clean up the language a little bit more and make it a little clearer what independent expenditures are and the penalties for violations. After I wrote this, I received the um, letter from the Attorney General, which is also linked here on the page I showed you how to get to. And they also went through different court cases, two of them, well, one of them is the same that I discussed, one they discussed in a footnote, and then they also found some other cases about false statements. So that's also posted here for your review. Thank you, Janet. Any questions uh, for Janet at this time on the analysis? <clears throat> Great. Any discussion on the bill? Mr. Chair. Oh, yeah. Representative, uh, or sorry, Senator Hickman. <laughs> That's okay. I'm getting used to it as well. <laughs> um, is there any interest in addressing in this vehicle or in another that may come the need to clarify what governmental ethics said needs to be clarified regarding some of these penalties? Um, I'm not really sure exactly what they wanted to be clarified, to be honest. Um, was that in their testimony? Uh, I can clarify that. Okay. So um, 
when I was reading this bill and reading the statutory language, I was trying to find the penalty provisions and how they worked. And I had a hard time following the statute because it didn't all line up exactly. So I reached out to the ethics commission and asked how they interpreted the law. I also asked, how did they interpret what communication meant? Because communication is defined very clearly for um, the law that governs the disclosure of whether this ad was authorized by a candidate or not. But that definition of communication is not applicable to the independent expenditure statute but the Ethics Commission indicated to me that um, they read through the penalty provisions and view them as all applicable to the independent expenditure makers, even though some of the language doesn't exactly line up. It seems pretty clear that's what the legislature meant. I agree, it seems clear. It's just not clearly stated in every single subsection. And then as far as the definition of communication, they use the same definition. So they... Um, they agreed with me that the statute could be clarified and um, the director is now aware of that issue. Uh, I don't know if he'll propose that change in the future or not, but he is aware and he agrees that those clarifications would be helpful, but the commission is operating under the assumption that those cross-references and everything are sort of internally consistent, if that makes sense. Thanks, that's helpful. Yeah, that, that's helpful and I think, um... With that, if we if we do clarify, we probably would want to spend some time with the commission just on uh, drafting it since we get sued so free, frequently on some of these issues that we want to make sure with the AG's office who has to defend it every time that we do it right. I know it's come up in the past. Um, Senator Senator Farron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I obviously reading over what the Attorney General uh, put out there, and 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 just for the record, Janet, I was smiling at the lawyer reference that I was <laughs> one of those that was laughing at that. Um, I, I I do believe that this well the intent because I think we'll all agree that both sides, everything down through that has has some of these issues that the enforcement piece, the the defending piece that the AG brought up. Um, probably make this vehicle uh, a little difficult for us to, uh, to to move forward. At least it does for me. But one of the questions, and it kind of jumps on to what Senator Hickman was saying. It has a nice ring to it, doesn't it, Senator, saying that, Senator Hickman. Um, was maybe, you know, if, we, if we're trying to work through some things with um, the Ethics Commission, and I don't know if, if uh, Director Wayne's available or not, but when these independent expenditures fill out, whether it's the 48 hours before or whatever, they have to provide a, a, a bunch of information. Is this, could this be as sim simple as, you know, that they have to check a box that says, you know, all information is, is accurate to the best of their knowledge. And I know that probably doesn't mean a whole lot legally or anything else, but at least it's a click in the back of the brain that they're checking something that somebody can question that they know is absolutely 100% false. And maybe would that be any kind of deterrent at all? And, and, and I don't think this bill is the vehicle to do that. I think that's something maybe we have to have a conversation with the ethics commission on, but just my mind rambling. <laughs> I don't see Director Wayne on here, but I, I do think that's both points are valid points because I think everybody hates the way that these things come out, especially right at the end of elections. <clears throat> uh, Representative Tuttle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I agree with Senator Fair, and I, I understand where the good Senator from Rustic is coming from in this bill, having uh, dealt with negative campaigns myself, but I really don't know if this is the vehicle to do it with the uh, the possibilities of uh, it being unconstitutional. And I, I unfortunately would move on not to pass, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, so motion of odd not to pass by uh, Representative Tuttle. Is there a second? Second. Second, seconded by Representative Wood. Okay, any further discussion on this? Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, yeah, Senator Hickman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to ask if the department has submitted their regular 
omnibus bill to do sort of cleanup or not at this point? Yeah, we have um, some department bills from uh, uh, from from Director Wayne, and I I don't know if they're out yet, but I think they have four actually coming. Okay, so in other words, we have an opportunity to do some language cleanup to clarify what is consistent within their operation, but not necessarily explicit in the law. Yeah, I, I believe so. I can't say for sure what's in their bill, but I th think we do have some vehicles coming. I know I've sponsored one that's coming up. Okay, great, thank really you. Soon. Yep, Senator Farron. <clears throat> yeah, just before we, 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 we take the vote or whatever is, could, I, I guess I'd ask the, the chairs and committee members would you be opposed to, to us having that conversation with Director Wayne just about some kind of, of disclosure that we could put on the, on the standard form or through rule, you know, just, just having the conversation with them? Yeah, uh, like in a, uh, in a different bill, do you mean, Senator? Or I don't even know if we need a bill per right. se. So I, I think it's more of a conversation with the department on behalf of the committee. I mean, addressing this issue is, is it, like I said, I'm try, not trying to simplify it, but just some kind of disclaimer that, you know, the, 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 the person, the independent expenditure, to the best of their knowledge, you know, that this information is accurate. I know that probably doesn't count anything legally, but we fill out all kinds of forms for a bunch of other things. And it's just, just, in the back of someone's mind makes them think that they some, somebody might be checking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can we can reach out and ask for any recommendations on that, that if they feel they could do it in a way that doesn't violate, right. you know, the First Amendment stuff. Yeah, that's the difficult thing that unfortunately that we we deal with on on this one. Agreed 100 percent. Yeah. Um, uh, Representative Corey. Sorry, I always hit the hand rather than the mute. On mute thing. All the boxes keep moving. So it's I know they do. So, I mean, I'm, I'll tell you, I'm personally right now reluctant to, to kill the bill. I have the same concerns as, you know, Senator Farron, you know, it would be, you know, nice to, you know, get some kind of a checkoff box, you know, within some kind of a department bill. But to be honest, the department bill doesn't carry the same title or the same intent of, you know, the, the language of, of this bill, even though I completely, you know, don't think that we need the language or, or what's going on in this bill. So I would be reluctant to, you know, kill, kill this bill um, only, only because, you know, I think, I think if we're going to add, you know, something in that says that, you know, hey, you know, is this to the best of your knowledge? I mean, we all get that form from main ethics, especially, you know, those of us that, run clean that basically say, yes, I plan on, you know, not spending money about against my opponent and I'm going to, you know, take a pledge, you know, to not do that and everything else. And that certainly, you know, doesn't stop you from, you know, exercising your first amendment rights, you know, in the, the future, even after having signed, you know, that pledge. So I'm personally, you know, reluctant to kill that bill and then, you know, have, or this bill and then, you know, try to insert some kind of language in a department bill that, you know, makes a, um, I mean, for me, this, this really, you know, takes a stand on um, dirty, dirty campaigning or what we all feel, you know what I mean, is, is dirty in the end. I mean, we've all had it done against us. Um, Chairman Chiazzo. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think we're all in agreement that we're, we're trying to find that sweet spot with um, trying to keep honest people honest. I think, I don't know if checking a box is going to help that, but it certainly wouldn't hurt. My concern is that anytime we pass a law, whether it was, you know, on a local municipal level or on a state level, if it's not enforceable, it really doesn't, it, it's hollow. It doesn't mean anything. It's just a statement. Um, so I, I mean, I, I I think we certainly could work with the director to come up with some mechanism that says if we want the form realigned or something with a couple of extra boxes checked or something. I'm certainly, I'm certain he would, you know, we could have that discussion with him. In terms of maintaining the bill structure, we get a long list of bills in front of this committee and we'll have, I think we'll have plenty of avenues or opportunities or, uh, or vehicles to, to address that. So 
Um, I, I mean, I, I appreciate the, uh, the, the desire to want to keep this one open. Um, but I think if, it, if we're keeping it open for title only, then I, I would suggest that we try and find a department bill or something that we can add into and, and, and uh, maybe do some kind of, you know, bigger picture type of bill uh, that includes, a, that includes uh, everything we want in it, not just one particular issue over another. Right. And just for my two cents, I think the, the structure of the bill is incredibly difficult for the the ethics commission to try to determine somebody's motivations. It's completely subjective and it would be nearly impossible for them to determine malice just in certain instances. And it, you know, given the AG's letter, it seems to have a ton of legal issues, which we do get sued on a lot. And when you lose a first amendment case, then the state has to pay the winning side's legal fees. So it ends up being a pretty expensive endeavor for taxpayers when that happens. But that's, that's what happens when we lose um, First Amendment challenges. So, uh, Rep. Sam Corey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, it, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking about retaining the, the structure of the original bill. You know, I've been sitting in the legislature long enough to know that, you know, we've, we've completely wiped bills clean, including titles, you know, in, in order to, you know, sort of preserve, you know, what, what the intent of something is while, while still, you know, changing, you know, what a bill does on its own. So that's, that's my only concern. I feel like we, you know, bury it, you know, in a department bill and it just doesn't become a priority anymore, but thank you. Sure. And just from my perspective, I don't think we have necessarily something that works yet either. Um, Janet, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say, I don't know if this will end up being um, a report on this bill, but just to remind you, not all of the concerns had to do with the lawsuit. So um, I can't off the top of my head say whether a checkbox would be um, subject to a strong constitutional challenge or not, but I know that it would be helpful if it was only limited to defamatory statements, so not just any false statement. That's certainly something that would be helpful to it um, if you wanted to go down that road. And just thinking about, it's hard to anticipate all the possible First Amendment challenges. It gives me a little pause, but it's definitely without the penalties and without um, a lot of the other things that comes closer to potentially being defensible. I just don't know if it crosses the line, not being a First Amendment scholar, just somebody who plays that in my day job. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Senator Farron. Yeah, I think great dialogue and, and conversation back and forth and recognizing the, the pace of it and, and respectful of, of Representative Corey's concerns about it getting lost along the way. Um, I think it's, it's on our radar screen. And, and, and as uh, the chairs talked about, we have a, a number of other bills coming forward. So I'll be supporting the motion. Thanks. And we can certainly reach out and see if there's any recommendations from ethics on this. And, you know, they're, they deal with this, these laws day in and day out, and they may have some suggestions that <coughs> would help people. Uh, Representative Tuttle. <coughs> Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, we could uh, communicate with the executive director of the Ethics Commission and maybe uh, before the end of the session, we could discuss this issue and look at other bills that we can uh, possibly look at. I, I think that might be a possible compromise. Yep. Um, oh. Representative Kinney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think um, where our caucus has some interesting thoughts and where I think that even um, across the aisle, we're getting some ideas that maybe we'd like to explore a couple more options. Um, I'll make a motion to table till, till later. Okay, I'm technically tabling motions have to be freestanding motions, but so I can re-recognize you and go for it. There we go. Sorry about that. Yeah. I know that. I know better. Uh, I'll make a motion to table, Mr. Chair. Okay. The motion to table. Is there a second? I'll second. 
Uh, seconded by Representative Corey. Okay, sorry. See ya. Representative Corey. Uh, tabling's not debatable. Um, we can uh, do a roll call if Kieran is available. Hey. <laughs> Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Yay. Senator Farron, yay. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCray. Yes. Representative McCray, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Tupica. Yes. Representative Tupica, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Yes. Representative Corey, yes. Representative Dollar. Yes. Representative Dollar, yes. 11 voting in favor of the motion, zero against, and one absent, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, Karen. So we'll move on to the next bill, which is on our list. It is LD 580, proposing an amendment to the Constitution regarding early voting. And we'll give Janet a minute to get her notes. All the voting stuff straight away. And again, this analysis is also in that um, email from Janet this morning. Okay, luckily for us, LD580 was on the same day for hearing, so we're going to be able to stay on the same page to find the information. So here, you can see the list is long, so I already sorted it by name, so you can find that the Secretary of State sent some additional information, which was emailed to you, and it's also posted here, and then the bill analysis is posted here as well. So this resolution proposes to amend Article 2, Section 4 of the main constitution in two ways. First, to allow the legislature to authorize a process by which municipalities may conduct early voting, which it describes as a process allowing voters to vote in the same manner as on election day during a period immediately preceding an election. And it also, the resolution, would allow the legislature to authorize absentee voting for any sufficient reason. Currently, the Constitution authorizes the legislature to provide for absentee voting by individuals who are either absent from the state and in the U.S. or the state armed forces or who are absent or physically incapacitated for any reasons deemed sufficient. Importantly, this bill does not itself require, sorry, it's not a bill. This resolution does not itself require municipalities to offer early voting nor will municipalities be authorized to offer early voting if the voters ratify the proposed constitutional amendment. Instead, if the constitutional amendment is ratified by voters, the legislature will have discretion whether to pass subsequent legislation implementing early voting. As an additional information, just a reminder, for a constitutional amendment, the legislature, each chamber has to vote two thirds in favor of the resolution and then it would be submitted to the voters for ratification by majority vote in November. Because the governor doesn't have an opportunity to weigh in on this resolution, you cannot amend this resolution to include amendments to the main revised statutes. You could entirely amend the re resolution and turn it into the bill, but it into a bill, but it can't be both a resolution and a bill. So, um, as background for why um, this bill was put forward according to the sponsor. Article two, section four of the Constitution of Maine, as you can see, it's quoted here, provides that the election of senators and representatives shall be on the Tuesday following the first Monday of November biennially forever. And again, that same date, but every four years for governor. The article two, section four also provides for absentee voting um, for the reasons listed there. In um, Lamone versus a last name that's similar to our representative chair, 
Um, in 2006, the Maryland Court of Appeals, which is the highest court in Maryland, even though it's not called the Supreme Court, I just thought you might wanna know that, concluded that a statute authorizing early voting for a five day period before election day violated the Maryland constitution because it had provisions that established the Tuesday after the first Monday in the month of November as the date for general elections and their constitution also um, gave their general assembly authority to provide by suitable enactment for voting by qualified voters who are absent at the time of the election and for voting by other qualified voters who are unable to vote personally. Reading these provisions of the state constitution together, the Maryland Court of Appeals concluded that apart from absentee voting, in-person ballot casting must begin and end on the same day. Thus, any statute that allows for a ballot to be cast before the prescribed day must be in derogation of the Maryland Constitution. In light of this Lamone decision, the Maine Secretary of State's office has repeatedly cautioned against enacting early voting legislation without first sending, excuse me, without first amending Article 2, Section 4 of the Maine Constitution in a manner that clearly authorizes not only absentee voting, but also early voting. It may be worth noting that although the Lamone decision suggests that early voting might not pass state constitutional muster in Maine, um, at least two federal courts of appeals have concluded that state early voting laws that allow some voters to cast votes before election day do not violate federal statutes that establish the Tuesday next after the first Monday in November as election day, pre precisely because under those early voting statutes, the final selection of the winning candidate would not be made before federal election day. So for the federal courts of appeals interpreting federal statute that set an exact day for an election, um, the federal courts were persuaded that because the final determination, the final outcome could not be made before election day, that those early voting statutes didn't violate um, the federal law. The Maryland Court of Appeals was aware of these cases, however, and found them to be unpersuasive in its decision, pointing out that they involved challenges to early voting um, brought under statute and not state constitutional provisions. Um, I can't um, predict for you which way the main Supreme Judicial Court would come out on that question. Um, you may wanna know that an identical resolution, LD 619 was proposed in the 129th legislature. It received a support from a majority of this committee, but failed final passage in the house and was placed on the special appropriations table where it remained when the legislature adjourned. Um, in her testimony, the Secretary of State referenced um, various pilot projects that have taken place regarding early, early voting in the past, and their reports are linked at this website. Um, I also sent you an email with additional information from the Secretary of State, and she actually appended the reports to her um, information, so you all received that in your inbox, and it is now posted online. But these are the early voting pilot projects that occurred in the past and it tells you where they took place. I'm happy to go through it in more detail. I'm just waiting for your direction. Also attached to this um, bill analysis is information from other states. The Secretary of State sent um, information as well, but I'm just going to scroll to show you what it is. NCSL has a chart or a map showing which states have early voting versus in-person absentee voting and then all mail elections they include in their chart because um, all mail elections allow you to return your ballot before actually election day. And they had a chart that lists all the different states and it's broken out here because it's not on their website to show you which states have actual early voting, which states have in-person absentee voting, which can occur prior to election day, and then also the all mail, all mail states. So all of that information is attached. So issues and amendments were, that were proposed at the public hearing. The sponsor suggested that if concerns arise that this resolution imposes a state mandate, um, he would be open to amending the language of the proposed constitutional amendment to clarify that each municipality has sole discretion to determine whether it will permit early voting. Um, I just wanted to note for you that under the main constitution, Article 9, Section 21, which is where we get the state mandate concern. Uh, it provides that the state may not require a local unit of government to expand or modify that unit's activities so as to necessitate additional expenditures from local revenues, unless the state provides 90% of the funding for those expenditures 
or there's a mandate preamble and two thirds of the elected members of each chamber vote in favor of the legislation. Um, although this provision imposes requirements related to legislation, it does not appear applicable to constitutional resolutions as far as I can read the main constitution. But perhaps more importantly, as drafted, this resolution does not itself impose additional duties on municipalities. The constitutional amendment will not itself mandate that any municipality conduct early voting, for, ex for example. Instead, as I mentioned before, if this amendment is ratified by the voters after being passed by a sufficient number of legislators, then only in the future could the legislature enact legislation authorizing early voting in Maine. So perhaps at that point, there might be a mandate issue depending on how that legislation is worded. Um, the sponsor also proposed some amendments regarding, regarding the timing of early voting. So he indicated that he's amenable to amending this resolution so that instead of authorizing the legislature to determine, quote, a prescribed period immediately preceding an election, end quote, during which early voting may occur, instead the resolution could direct a specific amount of time, for example, not to exceed 10 days or even 14 days prior to the election during which early voting could occur. The League of Women Voters of Maine also suggested in its testimony that early voting should be authorized for at least one, one weekend before the election. It wasn't clear to me that they were saying the resolution needed to be amended to state that, but I thought you would want to know that if you were looking at the number of days, if you were going to consider the sponsor's proposal. Um, also, it's important to note that you could accomplish that goal either through amending the resolution or through subsequent legislation if the constitutional amendment does succeed and is ratified by the voters. The Center for Secure and Modern Elections proposed something completely different. They suggested that the committee consider amending the laws governing in-person absentee voting to allow in-person absentee voters to insert their ballots into voting tabulation machines rather than requiring them to use the return envelope that has to be signed by the voter and then have the clerk sign it as a witness when they um, conduct in-person absentee voting. Um, as an alternative, if the committee wanted to keep the return envelope requirement, the center proposed amending the law to allow clerks to process those in-person absentee votes immediately, rather than waiting for the time period immediately before the election that's set forth in statute. They also proposed allowing in-person absentee voting to occur at locations other than just the municipal clerk's office. I didn't find any technical issues with the resolution. And I would note that although we don't yet have a preliminary fiscal statement um, regarding the bill, because this is a constitutional resolution, I anticipate that should this move forward, you would find um, the fiscal note that we are all going to become intimately familiar with, which is if there are enough November questions on the ballot, then there's going to need to be an additional ballot page and that will engender um, a need for more money for ballot printing and distribution. Great, thank you, Janet. I don't know if you want me to, I, I can't really present the Secretary of State's information, but it is all posted there online. If anybody wanted to look at it, she provided a lot of information, 77 pages worth. <laughs> 77 pages, well. Wow. Most Great. of it's attachments. There's a two page summary at the beginning. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chairman Chiazzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Janet, so if you can guide me through the process, the difference between early voting and in-person absentee is, is, it, is it that early voting, the ballots can be counted, but early absentee, they can only be processed? What's, what's the difference between the two? I'm sorry. This is something that definitely trips me up as well. I don't believe it involves counting, but I think your best bet would be to ask Julie Flynn, if she doesn't mind answering because I see she's in the waiting room and I do not want to get this wrong. Uh, would you like, I can pull in. Uh, yeah, Deputy you could, Flynn. Mr. Chair, that'd be great. There we go. Welcome, Deputy Flynn. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the difference between early voting and absentee voting, absentee voting is that the ballot is secured in an envelope that the voter signs, the envelope flap, if there's witnesses, they're signed on the envelope. Um, where it, 
and the ballots are not counted until election day. Um, early voting is much like a series of election days that occur before election day. You go to a polling place, it's set up like a polling place. You're issued a ballot, you go into your booth and vote it and put it into the tabulator when you leave, or if it's a hand count town, you put it into the ballot box. Ballots are still not counted until election day, but they're, they're put directly into the machine. So in terms of efficiency of operations for the municipal clerk's offices, uh, early voting is much more efficient because you're not opening all those pieces of mail and you know, all those envelopes, removing the ballots and having to, you know, uh, put them into the tabulator, you know, one by one um, at some point before election day or on election day. Thank you. Uh, Representative McCray. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A uh, question for Janet. I'm, I'm just questioning the mandate piece. Um, I think what it's saying is that the sponsor is saying if the language needs to be any clearer, that's fine. But it seemed to me that the language was clear that it wasn't required of any municipality. So I'm just confused about why it would need to be any different. I believe that the sponsor said that if you are concerned, he's happy to amend it to make it clearer. I do not view the resolution standing on its own as imposing any duty on a municipality. And I also don't know that the mandate issue applies to constitutional amendments, but setting that aside, even if it did apply to them, I don't view the language as requiring municipalities to do anything. In fact, it doesn't even authorize them to do anything. It requires subsequent legislation as I read it. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think even if it passed, then it would require the legislature to do a bunch of stuff. Um, Senator Heckman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Deputy Director Flynn, maybe my memory is off, but I don't remember the suggested law amendment proposed in the bill analysis for this version of the bill to be as simple and straightforward as changing the language to allow for those ballots to go through a tabulation machine. Do you have any opinion on that? That I may have missed because I wasn't here yet? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, when you're doing early voting and, and the reason for <laughs> some of the 77 pages were our study of how early voting would work, which happened back in 2007 and a proposal for doing a pilot in the referendum election year um, but absentee voting starts 30 days before the election. And so you don't even have your tabulators all coded yet. You don't have everything tested. So to have that available for people to come in in person and put it into a tabulator, you wouldn't be ready to. And so that part of the security about absentee voting is you're sealing it in, 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 an, in an envelope that the clerk has acted as a witness or whoever you know, designees of the clerk's office that are there for, for that absentee voting period. Um, and I think early voting necessarily has to be a smaller period of time before election day because you're, you're sort of running it like an election day. You have election workers and, you know, party balance among the election workers representation for the political parties and and the ballots are not being sealed in an envelope. So you want them to be you know, given out by an election clerk, voting inside a guardrail, like you do on election day in a voting booth, and then putting it in the tabulator before you leave so that it's directly secured in the tabulator. And at the end of each day, part of what we provided to you were the security measures that we used for the pilot programs and that we now employ for the early processing of absentee ballots because we think they're somewhat similar. You, you need to be sure you know, something as simple as you can't have one person alone doing this. You have to have at least two people at all times so that you have a check and balance in the process. And so um, I think it's a different set of, of security procedures for early voting. And I think it needs to be a little bit shorter period of time than you can have you know, for absentee voting. 
where you might go into the clerk's office and there's one person working alone and the fact that you're sealing it in an envelope and you're signing it and they're signing as a witness is, is part of the security procedures for that. Thank you. Then Mr. Chair, may I ask uh, the analyst a question, please? Mm, yep. Thank you. So if there were some version of an LD that would amend Title 21A as you put forward on your sheet. Do you, is there a way to constrain the time frame without, I mean, I know you can't give me an opinion about constitutionality, but is there a way to constrain the time frame about when those votes could be put into the tabulator that doesn't contradict the Constitution? very difficult for me to say because the Lamone decision, um, as I read it, there, there are some differences in the Maryland constitution to the Maine constitution, but there are some things that are exactly the same. And it left me scratching my head with what is precisely the difference with early voting and in-person voting as well. I think in some ways, um, it depends on whether you consider the ballot cast when it's placed in the machine or only when it's counted. So I can't predict exactly how the law court would decide. So I can't tell you if you can say in-person absentee voting will now take place without return envelopes, I think is what you're proposing. So in-person absentee voting, a certain number of days, you don't have to do the envelopes. You can just put it in the machine. I don't know if that would pass constitutional muster because if that is in fact early voting and they view that as well. Oh, I think uh, Jana, we, it doesn't say that you're muted but it seemed to cut off your sound for some reason. That's different. Oh, there we go. Now we can hear you again. Okay, so I was just gonna my internet oh. connection is unstable. Mine's been doing that all day too. <laughs> I'm in the building. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so I was just gonna say that because the difference between early voting and in-person absentee voting as described is using the envelope or using the machine, that's a small difference. I mean, as far as writing it in statute, I can see what you're talking about, change that statute, but I mean, it might take a lot of pages because we're good at doing that, but that's really the difference. If that's what you're doing, then you're making it early voting. And if the Supreme Court isn't gonna be okay if you call it early voting, which is a possibility, they're not gonna be okay if you do early voting, but call it something else either, they'll see through that. So I, that's why I can't answer that question without really predicting what the main Supreme Judicial Court will do. And I can't predict because I think this is a, a question that's really close. Mm -hmm. and, and we really would have to be reading the mind of the justices. I think if you look at those early, um, pilot project reports, all of which were attached, like I said, to the Secretary of State, and it does have all of those um, security requirements and everything else. There's some discussion by former Secretary of State Summers and others about why they view this as a cautionary thing. Like it just makes more sense from their perspective if there's a possibility of a challenge to go ahead and fix the constitution first. Mm -hmm. it, it, there's nothing preventing you from rolling the dice and hoping it works anyway. I mean, because right. we don't know how the court will come out. Now I'm being laughed at by others. <laughs> <laughs> I, if I may, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, just, I guess this is for the committee. It would seem from off of the top of my head that just about anything around elections that we would do that would come up for challenge after an election wouldn't, wouldn't be retroactive to the election because courts don't want to invalidate votes based upon the understanding of those who already cast them at the ballot box. So I'm just putting it out there for us to think about how to go forward, knowing the high threshold of constitutional amendments to get passed in the legislature before they go to the people for approval. Okay, 
Uh, Jeremy Chiazzo, do you have a, did you have a question? I thought I saw a hand. Sorry, it's hard to track. Uh, yeah, I'm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm. I'm a little reluctant to ask it because I'm. I'm listening to the debate about the you know just changing the rules of absentee voting or changing the parameters of absentee voting. Uh, there was nothing in this that um, if we were if if we were to adopt early voting, there was nothing that would push out absentee balloting absentee voting farther. It would simply just replace the earlier those days that would have been absentee ballot apps allowed for in person absentee ballot would be replaced with early voting. Is that correct? Right. And maybe Deputy Flynn, if you're able to jump in, I think my understanding is that it would still allow for early absentee voting by mail and stuff, but it would also allow this in person early voting right. system. But Deputy Flynn knows right. way more I mean, than if I you, do. <laughs> if you pursue the constitutional amendment, it just gives you the authority to come back in the next legislature and or next session and adopt the framework into statute that you, that you want it to be. And I, I guess one concern I have is that because of the, the nature of, of so many of our small towns where you have a clerk working alone, it would be really difficult in probably 200, at least 200 of our towns to have early voting where people are coming in and putting a ballot you know, into a ballot box because there's only one person there and they're not open that many hours. So you're not gonna have a uniformity of process. That's all something you're gonna have to figure out and debate you know, when you come back to do the statutory um, enactment. But it may be that you would keep some combination. Some towns might just have absentee voting like they do now because they may not ever really, you know, Glenwood Plantation has five voters. So the clerk and, you know, one other person that out of five has to be there all the time to, to do, you know, early voting. So. I could, Mr. Chair. Yeah. 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 No, I think, I think my, my, my question was more, so right now it's 30 to 45 days before election day, you can absentee vote. So if we, if we add four, if we add a number of days to early voting, does that push that 45 days out? What, what constitutes election day at that point, right? Because it's not one day now, it's a series of days. Okay. Um, the law says that, that we can provide the ballots between 30 and 45 days. The reason why it still says 45 days is because we used to have the municipalities issue the ballots to the UOCAVA voters, you know, the military and overseas voters. Since we took that on, we, we always provide the ballots to the towns to, have, to start having in-person absentee voting or mailing out of ballots by about 30 days before. So it would be the last, you know, I mean, if you look at early voting as being maybe the, the last week of that 30 days, the week directly before the election, that's really when most of the in-person absentee voting takes place anyway. Gotcha. Now, most of the ballots issued before that are to be mailed to people who are not able to, to come in and vote in person. So for, for places, you know, larger communities, medium to large communities that do a fair amount of in-person absentee voting, clearly having that, that last week or 10 days, or whatever you decide it should be when you do your statutory enactment, that would be helpful for them because it's it's as convenient for the voter, and as long as you have the right security measures, it's as secure for the voter as in-person absentee voting, but it's a heck of a, a lot more uh, efficient, you know, for the town, and, and I would say less costly to administer. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Flynn, and I think uh, the bill sponsor may have wanted to weigh in on that, but doesn't look like he's quite in yet. Uh, Representative Pickman, did you have a question? Okay. Uh, Representative Moriarty, did you want to quickly just address that or? Uh, there you go. Oh, almost. There we go. Are we all set? Okay. Yeah, all set. I, I wanted to underscore underscore the the deputies. Uh, comment with reference to the smaller communities and problems with staffing. That is precisely why 
this bill is not written as a mandate and does not impose any requirement upon any municipality to in fact uh, choose to go forward with an early voting system. I recognize it just isn't going to be a fit for many towns, nor should we attempt to make it so. But it does, uh, it has in fact worked in the past as the two Secretary of State reports from the pilot projects of 09 and 07 clearly uh, demonstrate. And with, represent, with reference to Representative Chiazzo's uh, question regarding absentee voting and early voting in the final closing days, and let's say we're talking about a 10 day period for early voting, my understanding and my intention uh, is that early voting and absentee voting would proceed simultaneously uh, on their separate tracks in that final uh, home stretch just before election day. Thank you, uh, Representative Moriarty. Um, Representative Tuttle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think that the Representative Moriarty uh, uh, cleared the uh, question of uh, Chairman Chiazzo that uh, this is not a, ma a mandate because I, I think most small towns probably aren't going to do this. They haven't got the uh, access to do it. But for larger communities like myself and a number of others that can do that, that gives us the option to do that. So I I would move off to pass as amended uh, by the sponsor's recommendation. And also I believe we're gonna need a fiscal note, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Tuttle. A motion is ought to pass as amended. The amendment being a fiscal note. Thank is you. Is there a second? Yep, sorry. Thank you. There... Thank you. Uh, okay, <laughs> it's hard to see. A second by Senator Hickman. Thank you. Um, any further? I thought What's it was that? seconded by Representative Moriarty, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Joking. He knows better than that. <laughs> That's right. I would love to do it. <laughs> um, Janet, did you raise your hand? Yeah. Hopefully my audio is working. Yeah. Um, so I was not clear on the motion. Um, Representative Tuttle said, um, as proposed to be amended by the sponsor, I don't know if he wants to add in the at their sole discretion language, even though it's already clearly um, not requiring towns to do anything. I don't know if he wants to like sort of add that as like a belt and suspenders approach or whether he wants to put in the 10 to 14 days prior to the election. And if so, whether it's 10 or 14 days, because I thought he said as amended by the sponsor and a fiscal note, but then you said just with a fiscal note. So I wasn't clear. Well, well, Mr. Mr. Chair, I, I would recommend that we get the uh, author of the bill, his recommendation, and uh, we could, we could, uh, you know, uh, I could either correct it or, or change the motion then. Okay, so I think my understanding is that it was ought to pass as the sponsor brought the bill. Right. Is that right? Okay. And yep. Representative Moriarty, I, I think, are you good? Leaving the yes, language right. as it is, where it's um, not forcing any municipalities to do it, it says may. Absolutely, I, I thought that was clear. I offered testimony suggesting additional language to sort of address concerns that had been raised in material that had been submitted before your public hearing. But I don't think it's necessary. It's clearly an option and not a mandate as phrased. And I would agree, Mr. Chair. Okay. Does that work, Janet? Okay. Any other discussion? Um, what's that? Somebody's, sorry, that I heard some. Um, I'm asking for, I can't find the raise hand button. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, sorry, I, I can't. It's hard to tell which box is talking sometimes. So, uh, Senator Hickman. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And it's probably been mentioned already, but I just wanna say that a resolution to amend the constitution can never really mandate anything without a statute being promulgated to put that full force in effect. And even if it's just the establishment of a right, which would then be interpreted by the courts down the road based upon laws that were passed that may infringe upon that right, you just can't mandate anything 
um, unless the constitutional language we are voting on says so. And this one doesn't. And so I just wanna put that into the record. Any other, um, so we have a motion before us. Uh, Representative Moriarty, is it, uh, did you have something you wanted to add quickly? Just These to agree with- ready the, to vote, yep. Just to agree with Senator Hickman, this doesn't actually insert early voting into the constitution. What it does is to amend the constitution to allow the legislature to create a process for early voting, which further on, either may or may not be adopted by individual municipalities. Okay, thank you. Um, any other discussion? Um, I think Representative Hickman, your, or Senator Hickman, your hands from before, right? Sorry, yeah, I can move that, yeah. Okay, so seeing no further discussion, we will uh, get ready to proceed to a roll call. So Karen, when you're ready. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Nay. Senator Farron, nay. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCrate. Yes. Representative McCrate, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Nay. Representative Kinney, nay. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. No. Representative Corey, no. Representative Dollar. No. Representative Dollop, no. Is that, eight okay, I think in, that's. Eight oh, in favor of the motion, four uh, against the motion, and one member absent, Mr. Chair. Great, thank you. Uh, so, yep, the motion's eight to four. And for the four, um, is your report odd not to pass or somebody? I believe so, yes. Okay. Is everybody on the minority report good with ought not to pass? Yep, okay. Great, so that um, should wrap up our uh, work session on those two bills. Um, next, we have the biennial budget. We had a, a third bill, but um, the group that was supposed to meet hasn't finished up their work. So we're not gonna take that one up today, um, but uh, we can go to the budget work session and apologies to all the agencies here. I'm terrible at predicting time this session <laughs> on when we're gonna be doing things. Senator Farron, yeah. Senator so, okay, I just wanna let you know, I've got to uh, jump into uh, HHS testimony real quick, just present a bill and be right back in a few. Okay. Thank you. So we'll maybe we'll start with the lottery uh, stuff first, if that works. We'll um, we'll wait for Senator Farron to come back for the um, Devum stuff. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't even ask. I just assumed you wanted me to share. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Yeah, no, I was just trying to mute one of the background noise ones. <laughs> so again, all the information for people watching or listening at home is on the VLA committee page under budget materials. And I just wanted to let you know that up here we do have the gambling control board testimony that was presented last time. And then the proposed amendment from the secretary of state She's proposed a new one for one position, whereas last time it was for two positions. So all that information's up here in case it comes up today. This is where you can find it. Is 
we wanted to start with, um, you said the lottery and that's on um, page 46. And I believe Mike Russo's here to explain why I didn't know anything about, well, he can't explain why I didn't know, but what part B of the budget is. Hopefully he's still here. Yeah, uh, let's see. I don't know, do we have Mr. Russo on? Oh, there he is. Hi everyone. Welcome. I don't recognize you without the beard. <laughs> Yeah, yeah it, uh, it's springtime, time to get rid of it. <laughs> um, so just a quick, quick rundown on what Part B is. Uh, Part B includes reclassifications that uh, agencies have submitted. Uh, a reclassification is when someone is doing a job and they apply to HR and uh, they've actually been doing a little bit more than their classification requires. So they're, they're essentially getting their job adjusted to fit what their actual duties are. Uh, a Part B reclassification is something that they're taking money from another place that's already been appropriated and reallocating it or reappropriating it to meet the additional costs of the new, of the new classification. Uh, so they usually transfer all other funding to personal services to self-fund it. Uh, you, you only see the Part B ones if they can do that without having to request additional information. If they do require additional funds, you would see it in Part A. Uh, this budget especially, you saw a lot of them show up in Part A uh, just because personal services costs or all other transfers weren't able to cover the, the specific cost. So that, that's really it in a nutshell. Um, thanks. Yeah, thanks for that. I, I totally skipped over this one by accident when we were voting <laughs> lines the other day and then upon looking at it, I wasn't completely clear, but it is a, so it is a self-funded initiative within the, the lottery. Yes, anything that's in Part B, uh, the yeah. funds have already been appropriated. They're just moving them around in between the different classifications, all other personal services, things like that. Uh, Part A is requesting additional funding, which is why it requires legislative approval. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, we don't often get Part B stuff up here. Uh, not in this agency, other agencies tend to do a lot of it. Um, they tend to move around positions a little bit, especially if, uh, I can't really speak to all of them, but it's, it's, right. it happens for uh, other places. Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, any questions from uh, the committee uh, for Mr. Russo on this, this budget initiative um, here? If, if there's no questions, if, if anybody's ready to make a motion, uh, we can move this last item in from the, from the Bureau of Alcoholic Beverages and Lottery. Um, I'd move in, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Representative Tuttle uh, made a motion to, to move this item in. Is there a second? Second. Okay, seconded by Representative Riley. Any further discussion on this initiative? Okay, seeing none, uh, we will, we can proceed Mr. to Chair, a roll. Mr. Tuttle, Representative Tuttle, I oh. think. Did you have a I'm question? I'm voting yes, Chris. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so any, I don't see any further questions. Uh, Karen, would you please call the roll? Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Yay. Senator Farron, yay. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCrae. Yes. Representative McCrate, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Tupica. Yes. Representative Tupica, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dallas. Yes. Representative Dallas, yes. 11 in favor of the motion, zero against the motion, and two members absent, Mr. Chair. Great. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> Senator Farron, are you back already? Uh, they're they're on break until three o'clock, so I got two screens going. So oh, okay, okay, <laughs> we can come back to uh, the the stuff if you want. I'm I'm happy to wait, or we can start with some whatever you think. 
I'm good. I'm good with statin because I think a lot okay. of the, uh, con, uh, curtailment stuff uh, were yep. pretty straightforward. Okay. Yeah. So let's uh, let's start with uh, the some of the Department of Defense Veterans Emergency Management um, items. We have um, Janet's kind of put together a document uh, which is in our email. Um, and thank you, Janet, for going through all of these items. So that was from today, I do believe at 923, if you're looking in your emails, um, that just listed every item that came through the master cooperative agreement. Um, as uh, General Young kind of talked to us about in the last uh, work session, we really can't uh, dictate to the feds how much we get as a percentage in the uh, uh, of federal dollars. It has to come through that cooperative agreement. So if it's, you know, it's, it's kind of to a certain extent out of our control unless we were trying to remove positions or anything, which I don't think any of us are. So if people are good, we can, um, we can make it in one big motion because there are so many items, but I don't know, Janet, do you have the, your document that you could screen share or? I just found it. So okay. <laughs> now, now I can. And then uh, General Young, if there's anything you'd like to add, you can hop in. I will say that he sent me an email afterwards saying there are other initiatives affected by the Master Cooperative Agreement, but my rubric for whether to list something on this piece of paper was whether it mentioned that it was about the, okay. audit, the audit or whether it said that the re reallocation of funding had to do with what was allowed under the cooperative agreement. So the cooperative agreement may affect other things, but um, so many of these are initiatives where when I look, the justification statement just talked about the audit and allowable cost shares under the cooperative agreement. So that's what this little note would mean for anything like that. There were a couple which indicated that they were reclassification. Sometimes it specified a management initiated reclassification. So there was an increased cost overall for that position, but then also talked about the fact that reallocating the costs and dealing with the, the class reclassification was all done based on the audit under the master cooperative agreement. So that's there. There's another reclassification like that. And then there were two that didn't mention the audit. So 602, which is also up here with 626. They didn't mention the audit, but the justification statement does indicate that the reallocation of funding is allowable under the master cooperative agreement. So those are the ones I listed here. It was just a guess to try and help everybody move this along because there were a lot of votes that you had to take and it has to be done today because the report backs due tomorrow. Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate the, the way that you put this. And um, I think we've, obviously we went through each with General Farnham at the public hearing and then we went through them with um, General Young uh, at the first work session. So uh, if anybody has questions on these, these initiatives, please feel free to, to chime in with questions. Um, and then we can kind of go through the other items uh, one by one, just to, to make sure that uh, we, we hit them right. So uh, Representative Tuttle, did you have a question? Oh, another question. Would it be in line to make a motion now? Or would you like me to make? Wait, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I think so. We can continue to, to discuss after the, the question if, or after the motion if there's questions. So, yeah. I'd make a motion that we would adopt all the recommendations that we have uh, collaborated on and put that in the form of one motion, Mr. Chair. Okay. So that so the motion uh, is to kind of move in all those items that Janet just had. Yeah. Yep. Is there a second? Second. Second by Representative Riley. Okay. Any further discussion on those items and we can mark it up uh, to take a look at. Um, but we'll, we'll report it back to the committee. So seeing no other questions, um, we'll take a vote by roll call. If you're ready, Karen. Senator Farnham? Aye. Senator Zucchini? Yes. Senator Zucchini? Yes. Senator Hickman? Yes. Yes. 
Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Yay. Senator Farron, yay. Representative Piazzo. Yes. Representative Piazzo, yes. Representative McCrate. Yes. Representative McCrate, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dalla. Yes. Representative Dalla, yes. 11 in favor of the motion, zero against the motion, and two members absent, Mr. Chair. Great, thank you, Karen. And thank you, Janet, for putting that all together um, for us. <clears throat> Okay, uh, should we start working through some of the DVM initiatives? Um, I'll also bring in uh, Director Richmond, uh, because some will uh, relate to Bureau of Veteran Services as well. All right, trying to get all my papers together. All right. It's hard to keep, this is a big budget document. It's hard to follow exactly where we are. <laughs> and lots of separate handouts. So the first few you already voted on. Oh, sorry, just the first one, 626. 627 provides one-time funding. Sorry, let me just double check that you did vote <laughs> I don't want to miss one today. Yes, you did. Okay, just checking. So 627 provides one-time funding for environmental closure activity costs at the former Maine Military Authority site in Limestone. And this is phase one of the project. And I believe you talked a little bit about it at the other work sessions. Right, yep. And I believe this was the required DEP kind of cleanup that we had to do um, as we wind down the operations. Are there any questions um, from committee members on this one? If not, if anybody's ready to make a motion, we can do so. I move in, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Tuttle. We have a motion to move it in. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Representative McCrate. Any further discussion? Um, seeing none, we'll proceed to a vote. Um, Karen, if you can call the roll call. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Yay. Senator Farron, yay. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCrae. Yes. Representative McCrate, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey. Absent. Representative Dollar. Yes. Representative Dollar. Yes. 11 in favor of the motion, zero against the motion, and two members absent, Mr. Chair. Great. Thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm looking for the Next one in my notes that you didn't already vote on. I believe it's 593 on page 20. It 
So 593 provides funding for the approved reorganization of one vacant civil engineer three position to a facilities project manager position to reflect the changes of duties and responsibilities. And it indicates um, a part of the justification statement is that a professional engineering license is not required for the position. Okay, thank you, Janet. Uh, so this is another reorganization. Are there any um, questions on this? If not, we can take a motion. And move in, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Tuttle. Um, Second. Seconded by Senator Farron. Karen, would you, uh, any further discussion? Seeing none. Uh, Karen, uh, can you call the roll, please? Thanks. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator Hickman. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Senator Farron, yes. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCrate. Yes. Representative McCrate, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dollop. Yes. Representative Dollop, yes. 11 in favor of the motion, zero against the motion, and two members absent, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Karen. It's muted. Can right. I just can I just clarify who seconded that motion? I did not hear. Yep, that was Senator Farron. Thank you. Need to make sure I tell the truth to AFA. Yeah. <laughs> the next initiative that you didn't already vote, I believe, is reference number five ninety four. This provides funding for the proposed reorganization of one vacant engineering technician three position to a planning and research associate one position to reflect the change of duties and responsibilities. Um, the justification statement indicates it's a management initiated, initiated proposal and the agency requires a position to serve multiple sections managing databases and information <coughs> and engineering technician is not needed. Okay. So this is another management um, initiated reclass. Senator Farron? Make a motion to move in. Okay. Motion to move in by Senator Farron. Is there a second? Second. 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 Third. Okay, I think it was Representative Riley second. <laughs> uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, we'll proceed to a roll call. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Yay. Senator Farron, yay. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCrate. Yes. Representative McCrate, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dollar. Yes. Representative Dollar, yes. 11 in favor of the motion, zero against the motion, and two members absent, Mr. Chair. Are you ready? Yep, I was on mute. <laughs> okay. Ready to go. 
The next one is reference number one, provides funding for the proposed reorganization of one engineering technician four position to a facilities manager, excuse me, a facilities project manager position to reflect the change of duties and responsibilities. This is an employee initiated reclassification request funded 100% from the federal expenditures fund. The agency requests federal allocation in the event that reclassification results in a higher pay range. So this is all federal money. Great, thank you, Janet. So a reorganization all with federal funds. Um, any questions on this? Or if not, is there a motion? I move, move in, in, Mr. Chair. Okay, we have you a me. <laughs> a motion to move it in by Representative Tuttle, seconded by Representative McCrate. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll uh, we'll go to a roll call. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator Hickman. Yes. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. I think he's testifying on another bill right okay. now. Senator Farron. Sure. For Devum, actually, or for, for the veterans homes, I think, yeah. actually, at the moment. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCray. Yes. Representative McCray, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika. Sufika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dallas. Yes. Representative Dallas, yes. 10 members voting in favor of the motion zero voting against the motion and three members absent, Mr. Chair. Great, thank you, Karen. Uh, so 10-0. The next one, I'm gonna blow up a little better, is reference number 598. It eliminates all positions within the military training and operations program, main military authority enterprise fund, except one budget manager position that oversees minor contracts and other related activities. This, the justification explains that this is related to the main military authority ceasing its industrial operation operations in late 2018. Thank you, Janet. Um, any questions on this one? I as Janet explained, was when MMA ceased its operations. Um, seeing no questions, is anyone ready to make a motion? Move in, Mr. Chair. Thank you. A uh, motion to move it in by Representative Tuttle. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Representative Wood. Any further questions or discussion on this one? Um, seeing none, we'll uh, proceed to a roll call. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Yay. Senator Farron, yay. Representative Piazzo. Yes. Representative Piazzo, yes. Representative McCrate. Yes. Representative McCray, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yay. Representative Riley, yay. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dallas. Yes. Representative Dallas, yes. 11 in favor of the motion, zero against the motion, and two members absent, Mr. Chair. Great, thank you, Karen. The next one is reference number 599, same page. Provides funding for the proposed reclassification of one senior planner position to a public service coordinator, one position to reflect change of duties and responsibilities. 
Again, this is an employee initiated reclassification request funded 100% from federal expenditures fund. The agency requests federal allocation in the event the reclassification results in a higher pay range. Thanks, Karen. Any questions or discussion on this one? Or a motion? To move in, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Tuttle. And second. Uh, motion to move it in by Representative Tuttle, seconded by Representative Dolliff. Any further questions or debate? Discussion? Seeing none, we'll proceed to a roll call. Senator Lucchini? Yes. Senator Lucchini? Yes. Senator Hickman? Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron? Yay. Senator Farron, yay. Representative Piazzo? Yes. Representative Piazzo, yes. <laughs> Representative McCrate? Yes. Representative McCrate, yes. Representative Tuttle? Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley? Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Tupica? Yes. Representative Tupica, yes. Representative Wood? Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney? Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington? Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey? Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dollar? Yes. Representative Dollar, yes. 11 in favor of the motion, zero against the motion, and two members absent, Mr. Chair. Great. Thank you, Karen. 11 0. Okay. The next item is reference number 600. It reduces funding for facility maintenance and repairs on buildings and for engineering contractual services within the military operation and training and operations program. The justification statement indicates it reduces some funding for repairs and maintenance to armories and engineering contracted services. The Maine Army National Guard will adjust their maintenance and repair schedule to absorb these cuts within their annual budget. Thank you, Janet. Okay, any questions on this one? Um, All right, I'm gonna go for my walk around. The okay, uh, General Young, if you're on there, can you kind of explain this? I, is this, uh, oh, here we go. Oh, there he is, okay, yep. thanks. So, sentence, uh, good afternoon, Senator Kinney. Uh, you're talking about reference number 600? Yeah, I believe so. I think that's where we were. That, the, yeah. that, so, that, that represents um, the operations and maintenance costs for Army facilities across the state. It is part of the cooperative agreement. It's in, it's in the Appendix 1. Uh, and it's a, it's a small amount. Uh, you, you, the reason we have an amount there is we had some you know, some budget target, uh, you know, targeted budget reductions uh, for this year uh, based on the, the situation in the state and, and projected revenue. So that's why we have a projected uh, cut in 22 of around 10 grand and 23. That was just, uh, that's hardly even a rounding uh, number, but uh, uh, a small amount in 23 as well. So that's just operations and maintenance costs, um, and which we can absorb within the uh, department. Okay, uh, Rep Representative Kinney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we were told this is not a one-time cut. So with, there's two very different numbers here uh, for the two over the biennium. What are we looking at going forward for continued cuts to this program? Um, well, we wouldn't expect to uh, continue to cut in the, the following biennium. Uh, these cuts are projected for uh, 22 and 23. Uh, 20, when we get into a future, uh, future budget cycles, we'll evaluate our operations and maintenance needs and um, make requests or cuts if necessary at that time. Uh, we wouldn't anticipate right now more cuts because uh, we don't see the Army Guard losing uh, the requirement for facilities. But if, for example, we shut down a facility, a sold an armory, then that could result in uh, another cut to the program. Okay, any other questions on this? <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, Senator Farron. Make a motion to move in. Okay. Motion to move it in. Is there a second? Second. Motion to move in by Senator Farron, seconded by Representative Tuttle. Okay. Um, if, is there any further questions? Seeing none, we'll proceed to a roll call. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Yay. Senator Farron, yay. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCrae. Yes. Representative McCrae, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Tupika. Yes. Representative Tupika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dollar. Yes. Representative Dollar, yes. 11 in favor of the motion, zero against the motion, and two members absent, Mr. Chair. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Karen. So that was 600. The next few you already voted as part of the Master Cooperative Agreement audit vote. That brings, us, <laughs> that brings us to 605. This provides funding for the approved range change, range change of six military fighter fighter supervisor positions from range 17 to range 19 and three assistant military fire chief positions from range 19 to range 21. These positions have been reclassified to provide for the additional duties and responsibilities required of the positions, and it looks to be 100% federal funded. Great. It's always good when that happens. Um, any questions on this one? Is anyone ready to make a motion? I move in, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Motion to move it in, Representative Tuttle. Is there a second? Yeah. Seconded by Representative Supika. Any further questions on this initiative, uh, number 605? Seeing none, uh, we can proceed to a roll call. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Yay. Senator Farron, yay. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCrae. Yes. Representative McCrae, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Uh, yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Tupika. Yes. Representative Tupika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dollop. Yes. Representative Dollop, yes. 11 in favor of the motion, zero against the motion, and two members absent, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Karen. Okay, uh, next initiative. That brings us to the end of the military training and operations budget, and it brings us to the veterans services budget. If you're following along on your pages, it's page 30. Uh, it's not that there weren't more initiatives, but you already voted on them as part of the master cooperative agreement block vote. Are we ready right. for these? Let's, let's go. So reference number 643 provides funding for the approved reorganization of a heavy equipment operator position. Oh, sorry, heavy equipment operator one position to a heavy equipment operator two position within the same program. And um, the justification indicates it's been reclassified to provide for additional duties and responsibilities of the incumbent. Okay, any questions from the committee? Not seeing any, I'll entertain a motion. 
Move in, Mr. Chair. All right, and a second? A second. All right. A second. Moved by Representative Tuttle, seconded by Representative Dahl. And Karen, when you're ready, you can call the roll, please. Senator Lucchini. Senator Lucchini, absent. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Yay. Senator Farron, yay. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCrae. Yes. Representative McCrae, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Subica. Yes. Representative Subica, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dallas. Yes. Representative Dallas, yes. 10 in favor of the motion, zero against the motion, and three members absent, Mr. Chair. And I apologize once again, you caught me while I was writing in my notes that nobody asked any questions, so I didn't hear the second. Second was Representative Dolliff. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so that initiative has moved forward. Um, we can go on when you're ready, Janet. The next one is reference number 644 provides funding for the approved reorganization of six office associate two positions to six office specialist one, specialist one positions within the same program. These positions were reclassified to provide for the additional duties and responsibilities required of the incumbents. Any questions on this initiative? Okay, seeing none, we can entertain a motion. I move it in. Okay. Second. Motion, motion by Representative Wood, seconded by Representative Morgan. Representative Riley. Representative Riley. Sorry, Representative Riley, thank you. Okay, we're ready when you are, Karen, to call the roll. Senator Lucchini. Senator Lucchini, absent. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Yay. Senator Farron, yay. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCrae. Yes. Representative McCrae, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Tupica. Yes. Representative Tupica, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dallas. Yes. Representative Dallas, yes. 10 in favor of the motion, zero against the motion, and three members absent, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Karen. Uh, next one, Janet. This is reference 645, which eliminates one GIS coordinator position. The position has accomplished major tasking initiatives that were set forth when the position was created five years ago. A national gravesite locator is already available for patrons seeking to locate a veteran grave. Eliminating this position will free up federal funds to cover operational expenses associated with the main veteran cemeteries. Thank you, Gina. Any questions from the committee? Senator Farron. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Is uh, Director Richmond available to, to bring in or? He's here. Oh. I'm right here, Senator Farron. All, All right, right, perfect. Already there, good deal. Hey, I just want clarification. And, I, and again, some of these kind of run together as we have these conversations, but um, just setting the, the record straight, so to speak, or whatever, is that the elimination of this position is is not because of the containment efforts per se, but because the task has been accomplished and that locator service exists for our family members. Um, is that the, the correct summary? It's, it's, it's very close. It's, uh, the task is not 100% complete yet, but it's near, it's near completion. We're working on the last 
location uh, and the individual in that position has, uh, has accomplished a lot towards that cemetery. Um, so really, and I, I think we have a ongoing solution for adding future GIS information as we do new burials in all of our sections. So to answer your question, um, that position has accomplished its central uh, purpose. The person in that, in that position has. And eliminating this position frees up, uh, eliminating this position from your budget frees up federal funds for other pieces, correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah, that, this position uh, expense of around 109,000 uh, and 22 and 110,000 and 23 uh, represents about nearly half of the money that we generate on any given year in plot allowance. So we're funding um, this position and we're funding another full position and then a portion of another. So we, uh, we, we make anywhere between 170 and 200 thousand dollars on any given year in plot allowance revenue and we're ending and we end up spending roughly that on on these on these uh, positions. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Senator Farron. Any other questions? Uh, if not, then we'll entertain a motion. I'll move in, Mr. Chair. Motion by Representative Tuttle. Is there a second? Uh, I'll, I'll second it. Seconded by Representative Dollis. All right, Karen, whenever you're ready. Senator Lucchini. Senator Lucchini, absent. Yes, Senator, I'm back. Ah, no, you're back. It's not getting ready the last second. Senator Lucchini, okay, Senator Lucchini. Is that a yes? yes. Okay, oh, yeah. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Yay. Senator Farron, yay. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCray. Yes. Representative McCray, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Tupika. Yes. Representative Tupika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dollis. Yes. Representative Dollis, yes. 11 in favor of the motion, zero against motion, and two members absent, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Karen. And I will turn it back over to the Senator if he's ready. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. We can move to the next initiative. <laughs> Next initiative is, ref is reference number 646 on the bottom of page 31. It eliminates one part-time office associate two position. This initiative eliminates funding for the 100% general fund office associate two position. This position has never been filled. The position was created to help track and manage the distribution of funds for veterans homelessness prevention program. And it says the bureau has the capability to manage the program using existing resources. Right, so uh, Senator Farron. Yeah, um, I think most of the members on the uh, committee know that we had these discussions uh, we'll talk about the supplemental budget and uh, how the committee voted on that. And I think one of the things we, we kind of sent a message to AFA and some other folks and uh, I'll not be supporting moving this uh, initiative in. Uh, Representative Tuttle. <clears throat> I guess my question is uh, similar. I know we had a number of bills early this week about the homeless veterans, and I'm wondering what the appropriate thing to do uh, in this area. What do you think, Senator Farron? I'm a little bit confused here. Well, just just my personal opinion, Representative Tuttle, is that this is. Uh, this is a position that was uh, implemented uh, in the previous uh, legislature. And, and as we heard the director speak when we looked at the supplemental that they were in a position to look at filling this uh, right before the pandemic hit and, and didn't fill that. 
Um, I still believe that there is a need, especially when we talk about uh, homeless veterans and, and the issues out there and whatever we do with additional resources, I think this coordinated position is kind of the, the, the backstop for that and, and the baseline. So um, I'd hate to send a conflicting message that if we think other programs when we got one that's already in place. Right, and just to, just to add to that, I agree with uh, Senator Farron. I, you know, I understand the department was trying to make, uh, find some money where they could, um, but I think this is incredibly important um, just to help staff the office, manage those funds that we allocated last year through the, the Homeless Veterans Fund. And um, hopefully it can do, and, and hopefully they'll be able to um, help out with other stuff around the office in a way that would be uh, helpful to the department. So, so Mr. Uh, Chair, what would be the appropriate motion if we wanted to maintain that funding? You'd move it out. Move it out. I'd move it. Well, I'll move it out. All right. So we have a motion to leave this one out. Second. Okay. And is that Representative Kinney? Yeah, gotcha. So uh, Representative Tuttle and seconded by Representative Kinney. Any further discussion on that one? Representative, uh, Wood. Representative Wood, uh, Wood. Yes, thanks, Mr. Chair. Just, just to follow up on Representative Tuttle's question, I, I just want to make sure that I'm clear. I mean, we listened to a bill on Monday, LD 658, about three additional veteran services officers. That's a separate program from this program with the homeless, or this is one of those positions? Yeah, um, this would be, and Dave can speak to it far better than I could, but this would be a position that was created to administer the Veterans Homeless uh, Prevention Program. And uh, we've never actually filled it, but it's one that we wanted to. I think Dave can speak to it better. This isn't a VSO though. Okay. Uh, Director, does that sum it up all right? Or that's that's exactly right, Senator. The uh, uh, this is a, a half-time office associate two position that was created to help administer the hundred thousand dollars that was uh, given for um, homeless veteran coordination program. And the bill that we heard on Monday was uh, a proposal to create three new veteran service officer slash homeless veteran coordinators like the one that we have now. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions? Representative Supika? Thank you. Um, it wasn't a question, it's just this kind of a statement about this program and um, in the city of Bangor, when we hired a homeless outreach coordinator, um, we had uh, a lot of success. Um, so I will also be voting to move this out. And um, uh, I really want this program to uh, get the staffing and the funding that it needs to get off the ground, considering that it was just brought voted in uh, like a year or so ago. So I think, you know, cutting it off before it's had a chance to really even begin would be detrimental. And um, yeah, so I will be supporting the motion to remove this. Uh, Representative Chiazzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I don't, I'm, I, I'll obviously be supporting the move out. I just want to be, you know, I want to be clear to the, to the director, Director Richmond, this is in no way a, a, a question or concern with the way the department's being managed at all. It's not, it's not challenging anything there. It's just, I think we we fought pretty hard, or the previous legislators fought pretty hard to, to get that program implemented. And, and I think we felt that that was uh, something that was worth um, uh, going out a little, uh, taking a lead on and, and making sure we maintain that. And so it's uh, certainly not reflective of the, of the work that the department's doing. I think it's just an important priority for the legislature and, and, uh, and certainly for this caucus for sure. And this, this committee for sure. I appreciate that, uh, Representative, um, and I appreciate your support. Yep. We want we want you and your staff to have a day off every now and then, <laughs> Director. So, <laughs> any other questions, uh, Representative Supika? Did you have a question, or is that from before? Okay. Okay. Seeing no other questions, we can proceed to a roll call. <clears throat> Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Yay. Senator Farron, yay. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. 
Uh, Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCray? Yes. Representative McCray, yes. Representative Tuttle? Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley? Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Tupica? Yes. Representative Tupica, yes. Representative Wood? Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney? Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington? Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey? Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dollis? Yes. Representative Dollis, yes. 11 in favor of the motion, zero against the motion, and two members absent, Mr. Chair. Great. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Senator Farron. Oh. Yeah, Mr. Chair, just a quick question. Um, do uh, members have the two absent members of the same rules and apply for voting um, on these initiatives the same as regular bills? They have a certain period of time. Uh, no, for, for budget, it's just those people present, but we can notate in the letter where they would like to be if they wanted to. Okay, I just, uh, we have a, a member that's on AFA and I'd just uh, like that, make sure that we yeah. can. Let's lock them in, you know? Exactly. <laughs> don't, get, don't get that high. <laughs> You ready? I don't want to jump the gun again. Yep, no, you're good. Yep. Sorry about that. No, it's good. Sorry. The next initiative is reference number 647. It eliminates <coughs> all other funding for one temporary office staff position and reduces hours of two temporary groundskeeping staff positions and dates of service for the Caribou and Augusta offices within the same program. Justification explains this initiative eliminates funding for one temporary office staff position in Caribou and reduces two temporary groundskeeping staff position hours and dates of service. Office staff in Augusta will absorb additional workload from Caribou to ensure that Maine veterans and their families have the assistance they need. The two Augusta cemeteries utilize, utilize contracted temporary employees to assist with groundskeeping and burials. Temporary cemetery employee hours will be reduced to cover the additional workload experienced during the spring and summer months only, as well as reduced to cover only core crucial hours of operation. Okay, thank you, Janet. Uh, Representative Tuttle. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Chairman, I had a question. I, I know we've had issues in uh, southern, southern Maine about delays in burial. And I, uh, I didn't know if Mr. Richmond would comment because I don't want to cut these positions and make families uh, wait uh, for their uh, loved ones to be buried at veteran cemetery. So I hope uh, we could do that. Uh, I know that in Southern Maine, I think we're down a groundskeeper and equipment operator. So I, I just want to make sure we don't uh, make uh, families of veterans wait extended period of times to have their loved ones buried. Thank you for the question, Representative Tuttle. Um, the uh, this is a, this was a hard cut, and it and it went down to you know our bureau trying to do our part for the to to meet the goals of um, uh, doing our share to reduce the budget to uh, to balance it. Um, having said that, it, it it dropped the contracts from thirty two hours to twenty four hours, and um, you mentioned Southern Maine Veteran Cemetery. Um, the, one of those upgrades that you voted in just a few minutes ago was for the equipment operator uh, to be, um, it was an FJA functional job assessment for the equipment operator one, the move to the equipment that. operator two, because we had such a hard time filling that position. It was, it, we took four postings to fill it, and we finally found a young man that would. Um, agree to work for that in a market where people are getting like $35 an hour. And, uh, and basically he agreed to for on the job training and he came to work for us. So the good news is we have, we have a full staff down there of uh, full-time state employees, but the initiative to give that equipment operator some more money for the skills they learn is going to help us. The other thing that's at play now is um, because of the way the curtailment um, went for 
uh, or the uh, supplemental budget rather, we, we have a little more um, to plot allowance to work with. And that's, that's non, that won't lapse at the end of the year. So if we need to plus up a temporary contract here and there, we have a, a little, we have a few more resources that we didn't have last week. So I just wanted to put that out there that we have a little more flexibility to, um, to work with, to solve problems that may arise in the upcoming But yeah, I, I agree, David, but I'm still having concerns with Augusta and the folks in Northern Maine. I don't want to have them go through the same thing that we had to go through. What do you think, Senator Farron? Well, I, I, this, this follows along the same thing. And to reiterate what uh, the, the chair said, this is the, these comments and these votes, I, I know that the department and the director and all the staff would move heaven and earth to do what they had to do with the veterans and their families. And they're also trying to do what they think is best for the taxpayers of Maine. But uh, at, at this point, without oversight and what we can send with some of the things, I don't think they should have to to get by or, or move some things around. And um, I'm gonna make a motion that we move this item out. I, I would second that, Mr. Chair. Motion to move it out by Senator Farron, seconded by Representative Tuttle. Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, we can proceed to a roll call. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Yes. Senator Farron, yes. Representative Piazzo. Yes. Representative Piazzo, yes. Representative McCray. Yes. Representative McCray, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Subica. Yes. Representative Subica, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey absent. Representative Dollis. Yes. Representative Dollis, yes. 11 in favor of the motion, zero against the motion, and two members absent, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Karen. <clears throat> so we can move on to the next. Sorry, my computer was not cooperating. Mm -hmm. Reference number 648. Reduces funding by managing employee training, travel, advertising, and marketing and technology contracts within available resources. This initiative reduces funding for employee training, travel, advertising, marketing, and technology contracts to achieve department budget reduction goals. While a reduction in travel may inconvenience veterans in more remote locations and will decrease superintendent oversight at remote veteran cemetery locations, efforts are already being made to make every service available online or via phone. Operational adjustments necessary as a result of COVID-19 safety measures have improved the remote and online capability of the Bureau. The Bureau will continue to leverage these capabilities as we move into the future. Contracted marketing services will be absorbed by the Bureau's communications director. The Bureau will continue to operate using technologies currently utilized within the agency. Thank you, Janet. Um, <clears throat> any questions from committee members on this initiative? Um, so uh, I don't know if this would be for General Young or Director Richmond, but this initiative would essentially just uh, I guess, can you, I mean, maybe can, can you elaborate a little bit on what this is going to do? <clears throat> this would reduce uh, our <coughs> operating budget for these line items, Senator Lucchini. Yeah. So a, a large chunk of it was a, a marketing contract that we used to have that we we don't need anymore and we uh, terminated and our director of communications has picked up um, those duties very effectively. Um, some of the other ones, training, uh, 
there is there's been a development with the National Cemetery Administration where the, in some cases they'll pay for training for your uh, cemetery workers. So we we hope that we can leverage some training through that program. Um, and a lot of the other ones, the travel that we haven't been doing because of the pandemic, right. um, we've been working from home pretty very effectively actually. Our VSOs uh, in 2019 brought brought into the state for veterans 32 million in 2020 uh, while working from home they they did 28 over 28 million uh, brought to the state uh, for veterans so um, that's that's how we plan on uh, absorbing those those okay uh, representative Dolph <clears throat> thank you mr chair director Richmond though did you leave any money in this line at all? Because I know we're in a pandemic and nobody's traveling right now, but we're not, hopefully we'll be out of that soon. I hate to see you take all the money um, and maybe there's some, cause you don't have that contract anymore, understandable. But are you taking it all or are you leaving some? In um, thank you, Representative. We, we did leave some, we reduced it. Um, and to a, to a, a level that we feel like we can uh, manage around. So there, there will still be some tr travel. Our homeless veteran coordinator, for instance, we didn't cut uh, the travel budget for that position. Um, and uh, there'll still be some necessary travel for supervisors. And uh, occasionally we'll need a VSO to come to Tokus to get credentials updated. Uh, but it, so it's not been eliminated, just reduced. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Farron. <clears throat> yes, uh, Mr. Chair, this is kind of more of the, the committee of the discussion than, than to the director, but I, I look at this one here and I, I, I see the, the communications piece and we are working more efficiently. You got an old time, I, I was sitting here on an iPad and a computer today doing multiple technologies. I, I pat myself on the back. But Bill Gates over there. <laughs> I'm telling you, but but I look at some of the other initiatives we come down through the through the uh, initiatives that we have coming forward, and I I do think we got to be a little careful on on which ones we we pick uh, to make that stand in. And when it comes to veterans and cemetery maintenance and doing some of those things that drawing the line in the sand for those ones, um, this one here I you know I refer to the director and the department on. On what they can handle and can't and with that being said i'm going to make a motion that we move this one in okay. motion second, to move. second motion move in seconded by senate uh by representative tuttle uh any further discussion seeing none we can proceed to a roll call senator lucchini yes senator lucchini yes senator hickman yay Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Yay. Senator Farron, yay. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCrate. Yes. Representative McCrate, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Tupica. Yes. Representative Tupica, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dulles. Yes. Representative Dulles, yes. 11 in favor of the motion, zero against the motion, and two members absent, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Karen. The next item is reference number 649 and 650. They're connected. This reduces funding by reallocating cemetery expenses for vehicle repairs, gas, diesel, electricity, building repairs, equipment repairs, fuel, cleaning contracts, and rubbish disposal contracts from 100% general fund to 100% federal expenditures fund within the same program. 
The justification indicates this initiative reallocates those expenses from the general fund to federal expenditures fund account with a long number. These expenses are allowable under the federal plot allowance provided to the state for cemetery operations. So it's um, one is a reduction in general fund and then the other vote 650 is the same increase in federal funds. So they match. Senator so Chair. This is, well, this is just a transfer of funds from the state to the federal, is that correct? No? That's how I read it. I'd like to, if could Mr. Yeah, Sen yeah Senator Farron, yeah. Yeah, ask uh, Director Richmond. Uh, so we, what was being spent on general fund, we're now moving to plot, we're taking out of the plot allowance. Is that is that correct? That's correct, Senator Farron. And um, this relates somewhat to the initiative that eliminated the um, um, the position that was funded out of 013, the federal account. It's the same account. So um, if we make $200,000 on plot allowance on any given year, and we spend about $200,000 currently on personnel costs for those two and a portion positions, and we uh, are eliminating one of the positions that cost about one hundred and ten thousand dollars, we're we have that amount extra in the in the next two years to offset some of our operating costs. So we're um, um, really what we're ended up having to take out of the cash on hand in that account is about twenty thousand dollars that we weren't um, planning on through personnel costs. I hope I explained that clear enough, but. But we're not getting $131,000 additionally from the federal, like, no. exactly. With, with the other reclassifications, we, we, we change the percentage around and we'll get more federal dollars. Right. This is right. money from the general, reducing money from the general fund, but we're taking it from our plot, plot allowance. That's true. And I was just pointing out that we've reduced the strain on that account by eliminating a position in, in, that was funded from that account. Which so, position was that? The uh, the GIS coordinator. Um, the uh, it to, it was about one hundred and ten thousand dollars. It was initiative. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. So I'm trying to think. Did the did we move that one in? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So then it does just leave with. So this would essentially just be a net of taking twenty thousand out of the plot allowance. That's the way I look at it. And the cash on hand in that account is around four hundred, four hundred and forty-five thousand dollars right now. Uh, okay. So we, we, we have a we have a cushion in that account um, to sustain this plan going forward. And what's the was the GIS coordinator? Was that paid for from general fund? I can't remember now. Or was that paid for from plot allowance? Or it was plot. It was funded from plot allowance. Okay. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Yep. So, so Dave, I'm just I, I'm not very good at math, so I just want to follow. Is that I, I understand we took that hundred thousand dollar GSI, we moved that in, so that position went away, and twenty thousand of that was being paid under the plot allowance, or this. So I'm looking at the the, the line item on this is one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. Where's the other hundred and ten thousand dollars? So we generate about $200,000 a year in plot allowance. Um, of that $200,000, we spend about $200,000 in personnel costs for two positions and then a portion of another. Um, the GIS coordinator was one, the um, office associate two at the cemetery in Augusta is another, and then a portion of one of the admin supervisors in Augusta is funded out of that account and it's about $200,000, which we fund out of that plot allowance account. Um, we also fund other things. And we have, uh, you know, we talked about the contracts that we do for headstone installation or mowing, uh, things that come up that we hadn't, we weren't planning on, we'll, we'll take from that account too. But right now, 
uh, we're spending um, just about what we made in flat allowance in personnel costs. And it's not really sustainable if we didn't have that cushion in the account. So what we're proposing here is by eliminating the GIS position for about $110,000 a year, we'll use that money plus another $20,000 to, to, to use the, to, to um, take those operating costs out of our bot allowance account instead of general, general fund, our 010. Follow up, Mr. Shear? Yep. Uh, so, okay, I got you, I think. Um, but at the end of the day, right, regardless of those moves, what the general fund was paying for, we're now taking out of that plot allowance. Even, even if there's a balance there and, there's, and, and we're not spending as much, we're still taking that, I don't want to say burden, but that expense that was coming from general fund and setting it up to come out of the plot allowance <coughs> the next biennium. That's correct, Senator. Right. And, and I guess a potential thing that the, the committee could do where we've moved in the, the cut in that position for 100, 110,000 or whatever, we could, if we wanted to make the recommendation that the general fund still makes this whole with that extra 20, whatever thousand, um, just an option to put out for the committee where we've, we've found 100,000 essentially from eliminating that position. We'd still have to cover uh, normally would have covered about 20 something thousand out of general fund, which this would take that from plot allowance. We could rather than move the entire thing out as an option, we could say we want to keep that remaining amount in so that we don't have to dip into the plot allowance to cover this. Does that make sense, Director Richmond, or am I getting this completely upside down? <laughs> I, under, I understand, uh, um, Senator Lucchini, what you're proposing and I, I agree that we'd be spending a little bit more than what we're realizing by eliminating that position. But I'd point out that we do have a substantial um, cash on hand balance in that account right now. Sure. So it would, it would, uh, it may, it may eventually not be sustainable, but it is for a number of years, I'd say. Right, right. We just couldn't do it forever because we're just chipping away at the balance. Right. Um, Representative Chiazzo. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Director Richmond, is that money because it's federal plot allowance? Is it is it earmarked for specific things only? It's not doesn't obviously it's not like a general purpose fund, but I feel like we're using that as kind of a I don't want to say a slush fund, but we're using that as kind of a a way to move things around a little bit. Uh, are, do you have restrictions on what how that fund can and can't be used? To some extent, uh, Representative Chiazzo, there um, the way the way we view it, but um, is that we use that money for cemetery expenses. Um, so is it a requirement by the VA? Not really. It's, it's, a, it's a reimbursement to the state for um, taking on the expense of the burial and then the perpetual care of that veteran's grave. So the state, it's a re reimbursement to the state, but the way we've chose to um, implement it is to re reinvest that money into cemetery expenses. Gotcha, okay, yeah. thank you. And this plan is in keeping, keeping with that. So all of these operating costs are uh, costs associated with the cemetery system. Okay, thank you. Any other thoughts on this one? Uh, Representative McCray. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can I see the item again, Janet? Yep. So this would be not just a one-time, but a permanent change, is that right? I guess asking Director Richmond. I'm sorry. Um, would, is my, this, my, under, my understanding is this would become a permanent cut because it's reducing our, it's reducing our general fund allotment. Okay. And I don't so believe I, we called it out as, as just a two year cut. So I guess my question is, is it possible, is that something that is possible to limit how long it goes on? 
I don't know the answer to that. I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. Um, but I, go ahead. I was just going to say, I believe you can propose something like um, Senator Lucchini said, only part of the change, or you can propose that it only be one time, either one year or one biennium. I think that you have the power to propose what you want to. Okay, thank you. I think we do have an initiative coming up that was identified as a one-time cut for 22 and 23. Yeah. So I, I suspect it is, yeah. can be done. I'd prefer the one year. Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Tuttle. I'd prefer the one year. I'm not crazy about this at all, but if we're going to support it, I would prefer just the one year. Yeah. You know how other members feel. Yeah, I think from my perspective, my preference may be to leave this out and try to find solutions. Um, yep. Or just to do a small uh, amount where we make sure we still cover that, what's in excess of that position. But, uh, Senator well, Farron. Yeah. I, I, I'm <coughs> tending to agree with you, Senator Lucchini, that we move this out. And, and it gives us some time, right? We know it's going to go to AFA. Um, right. And, and we can do a little bit bigger, deeper dive as a, as a committee. And as we go through the rest of the initiatives, we can look at where we are as a whole. And uh, I just get real putting this down from and, and knowing that that plot allowance, even though we have a healthy fund in it now that we may not later, so I'm gonna make a motion to move it out. I, I second that, Mr. Chair. Motion to move it out um, by, by Senator Farron, seconded by Representative Tuttle. Any further questions or discussions on this? And I'm just checking it's a vote on both, right? Both yep. reference numbers. Yep, thanks. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> okay, any other discussion? Seeing none, we'll proceed to a roll call. Senator Lucchini. And again, sorry, the, the motion is to move it out, uh, yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Yay. Senator Farron, yay. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCrate. Yes. Representative McCrate, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Stupica. Yes. Representative Stupica, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dollar. Yes. Representative Dollar, yes. 11 in favor of the motion, zero against the motion, and two members absent, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Karen. Okay, when you're ready, Janet, we can <clears throat> slide down to the next, which may be the last, I'm not sure, for Devon. Correct, I <coughs> think it is. This is the um, one-time initiative that the director was referring to. So reference number 651 reduces all other funding one time in the Veterans Services Program General Fund. This initiative reduces all other funding one time in the Veterans Services Program General Fund. The funding was approved in Public Law 2019, Chapter 504, Section 3. This one-time reduction in all other funding can be managed utilizing resources within the Bureau dedicated to veterans assistance. In particular, the Bureau can use the Veterans Temporary Assistance Fund in Title 37B, Section 505 to assist veterans in need of temporary housing. And just to remind you all of this um, public law where the funding is, is posted on the VLA Committee's budget page. Thank you, Janet. Um, so director, this is the, the money for, that we use to pay for housing, I guess, vouchers for, or per night per veteran at homeless shelters. Is that correct? 
That's correct. It's a, it's a per diem payment to uh, transition, transition, um, transitioning <coughs> facilities or um, organizations that provide transitional housing for veterans in the state. And uh, yeah. yeah, we've, we, we stood that program up this year. Uh, we've used about $23,000 in reimbursement so far. It is, uh, it is not non-lapsing uh, funding though. So it will, um, whatever we don't use by the end of the year will, will be swept. Uh, um, and then we would, if this, if this is cut, we'll, we won't have it next year or the year after, but those are just one time cuts. Okay. So I didn't realize this is a non-lapsing account. Huh. Um, it's, it's not the, a not a non-lapsing. Oh, it's not an okay. No. Gotcha. <laughs> right. Um, is the is the temporary assistance fund? Is that a non-lapsing account? If you remember off the top of your head, I don't. Know. That is uh, that is a. I don't believe that's a non-lapsing account either. Uh, okay. A couple of double negatives here, but yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> That one's a little bit different because we can contract with a vendor and the contract will roll over into the next year if they haven't used their, uh, the funding. And so the 23,000 that we've spent, that's during this fiscal year? That's correct. Okay. So even if we did, weren't to cut the full 100,000, it's likely that a significant amount could sit, still be swept out of the account um, at the end of the fiscal year in a few months. That's correct, Senator. Okay, yeah. Okay, any other questions, um, thoughts on this one? Uh, uh, there, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Representative, you, if you raise your hand, sorry. No, I didn't, Chris, lead it off. Okay, <laughs> sorry. I can't see many squares. <laughs> Thank you. Just here. <laughs> <laughs> now I can. Thank you for deferring Representative Tunnel. I, I appreciate that. Um, so I just I just want to be clear, Director Richman. So we there was a hundred thousand that was appropriated. Of that hundred thousand, use twenty three. So the remainder is going to be swept. You're not asking for an additional hundred thousand to replace that. That's what this is, right? That's taking this this hundred thousand out. And will you be coming back again at the next in the next cycle to replenish it, or are you eliminating that program altogether? We're not, um, we're not eliminating the program, uh, uh, Representative Chiazzo. We're uh, proposing that that $100,000 be cut from 22 and also from 23. And then it was our expectation that it would come back uh, in, in our budget for 24, 25. So follow up, Mr. Chair, sorry. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so does it, my concern is that we'd have a gap, right? So if we swipe, sweep it, and there's nothing left, even if it's just short term, does it make sense for us to reduce that? If you use 23, if we put 50 in, let's say, just to keep what's kind of going, uh, I, I find it, it always seems to be harder to, to give something then take it away and then try and reinstitute it again, right? I mean, if we're not, even if we're not gonna grow the program, at least maintain with Laura, do, do you feel like there's still functionality there or is, is, it, uh, is it something that's just because of COVID and everything else, it's just, it's, it's better to start that up again later on. I do feel like there's functionality there. And our plan to continue it was to, to use um, funding that we have through the Veterans Emergency Financial Assistance Program. I believe that the statute gives us enough flexibility that we can use part of those funds to um, accomplish the goal of uh, transitional housing assistance for veterans to get us through these two years. That was our plan. Thank you, Director. And I guess maybe question for, for Janet or, or you, Senator Lucchini. How do we, is there a way for us to word this so that if we do maintain a balance, if we want to carry 50,000 over, let's say, is there a way we can preserve that and keep it from being swept? Or is that a structural that's already in place and we can't avoid that? Um, well, I think, I think if we wanted to make a note in our letter that this, that we may not spend this entire account and that it could be swept at the end of the fiscal year with a significant amount of money, then that may work. I don't know okay. if we want to take like a guess at it. I mean, I'm hesitant to cut anything out of this account, to be honest, but I think 
notifying appropriations that, you know, as hopefully we're not still working the budget at the end of June, but if we are, that there could be a chunk of money that is not used and it's in a not a not lapsing account, which I'm going in circles on now, but um, that this could be a source of funds for that. So I can I just point out I'm a little confused because if I look at the um, statute that was passed, I think it says non-lapsing, but maybe we can look at it together. See if I would, uh, you know, Janet, that was, that's been a source of confusion for, for me too, because there is actually an account, it's a non-lapsing account um, associated with the program with, with zero allotment and zero money in it. And um, right. So maybe you and I could talk about that. And I know that we've talked with our, um, with, with our accounting folks and the Bureau of the Budget um, to see if maybe that, that was a, an error when, when the account was established. And we've been assured that it wasn't. Um, so, but I, it, it did seem like the original intent was for the account to be non lapsing to me yeah. when I read it. Yeah, I was um, out when this particular amendment was drafted, so I don't know how all of this worked. Um, sorry, I had a personal matter at that time, but um, it says non-lapsing for the fund, the partnership fund, which may be, so the partnership fund is established in the bill with $500 a year, which is usually what the fiscal office puts in as a placeholder amount so that you can accept donations. And it looks like the $100,000 was created separately but if if this is totally up to you all but if you wanted all you have to do is direct me for what you want to write in the memo so if the memo says whatever it's going to say however much money either in or out but please make this non-lapsing I mean you can direct that and AFA has the people who know how to do that so it's really up to you what you want to recommend I just want to point out that it was kind of confusing to me and I feel better that the director tried to make me feel better by saying it was confusing to him too. So I thank you for making me feel better. Well, if you both are confused, I'm hopeless. Um, so. <laughs> uh, Senator Farron. Yeah, so this goes back to the overall conversation as a committee, right? Is that the, these are funds and programs that the previous legislatures fought for. And, and even though, you know, I think uh, the department, even though spent $23,000 or whatever, so far out of that with the pandemic and everything else that's going on, excuse me, just for one second. I'm in the construction trailer. Um, so, uh, I, I'm really hesitant to, to take these funds um, right now, especially with the bills that we got coming forward that we got to fight for, right? We're talking about more VSOs and, and other programs. And here we are talking about, you know, giving up on, on things that the previous legislature and, and, and everybody agreed that we had to get through. And you all know how difficult that can be in these times. So I'm, uh, I, I'm gonna make a motion to move this out um, and if, uh, along the way we find some other things to do that we can have those discussions, it's a lot easier to go back and, and, and rethink the position that it is to give it up and then try to fight after the fact. So that's my rationale. Mr. Chairman, I would second that motion and would like to speak to it briefly. Yep. Yeah, go for it. I mean, having been one of those folks along with Sandal Keeney and Representative Hickman and other members of this committee over the years, we've fought for these bills. And uh, uh, and I, I hate to see in uh, these difficult times, particularly for veterans that were cutting uh, the veterans programs. If you look at other areas of state government, they haven't done the job that we've done over the years and being very cautious and projections and cuts. So I think at this time, I think it's just the wrong time to do this. And that's why I'm seconding uh, uh, the, the good Senator's motion. Thank you. Uh, Senator Hickman. You, Mr. Chair, so just so I'm clear on what we're doing, we're actually considering cutting 
something that would support the elimination of homelessness amongst veterans? No, am I missing? I, I just, I, my, Sorry. I my, couldn't my, hear you for a second there. Sorry. <laughs> what program are we looking at? My screen says we're talking about veterans homelessness, but I'm not sure that we are. Yeah, I think this is um, the 100,000. Sorry. Sorry, who is that? I was going oh, to yep. show you. So now I have the wrong page. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I did that. So the initiative, I'm sorry, <laughs> Senator Hickman. I'm going to have a hard time with that. Um, <laughs> the initiative says the $100,000 per year that was voted in in 2019 as part of this law. Yep. For two years, the initiative says we're going to get rid of the $100,000. So two years of $100,000 cut by moving it out, Representative Farron and seconded by Representative sorry, Senator Fair and Representative Tuttle seconded, they say, no, we want to keep that $100,000 in every year. But we are dealing with money that would mitigate against veterans' homelessness. Yes. Right. Yes. And if you vote for the motion, you're saying keep the money to mitigate homelessness. If you vote against the motion, you're saying it's okay for just two years to cut it down and use the other fund instead. I got you. So I wanted to be clear that that's what we were discussing. And, you know, as chair of the committee that oversees housing and homelessness, I can't abide by doing that, especially for our veterans. So I will support the motion to move this out of the budget. Great. Yeah, and this was the bill we worked on last session, Senator, um, that does pay for those per night per diem for those uh, transitional um, housing. Thank you. I, I thought so, but I just wanted to say it on mic and make sure that <clears throat> this is what we were dealing with. Thank you. And do does the committee want to make a note that this money, you know, per the, the law was supposed to be in a non-lapsing account and doesn't appear to have been moved into that account in whatever. I, mean, I, I saw you picked up on that, Senator Fee. I know uh, you, you're very good at protecting how some of those funds go. So I could tell that caught you a little bit by surprise. So I'm, I'm all with you. That, that should be non-lapsing. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to be kind of ignoring the law at the, the moment. So, yeah. Explicitly ignoring the law. Yeah. We'll make a note. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other discussion on this one? Seeing none, um, we can proceed to a roll call. Senator Lucchini. Uh, yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Yay. Senator Farron, yay. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCray. Yes. Representative McCray, yes. Representative Tuttle. I was just cutting some corned beef, Mr. Chair, so forgive me, but yes. <laughs> Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Uh, yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Kupika. Yes. Representative Kupika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. I'm really glad that Representative Tunnel is eating the appropriate meal of the day, and I'm glad he changed into a shirt that's got green in it. And I'm a yes. <laughs> Representative <laughs> Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dallas. Yes. Representative Dallas, yes. 11 in favor of the motion, zero against the motion, and two members absent, Mr. Chair. Great, thank you, Karen. Um, so so Janet, is that is that it for the DVM budget lines? I think so. Okay, well, thanks. He's to, got them all. Yeah, there's a lot of them this year. It's a busy year. Um, thanks to, to Director Richmond, thanks to General Young for, for being here, helping us through that, so. Thank you all. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so Janet, I think 
Uh, we have remaining uh, Secretary of State issues as well as um, OMP. Right, so, there's a proposed amendment for the Secretary of State and then <laughs> one reference number and language part were tabled for OMP. Okay, so if we can move to Secretary of State's um, budget line. Um, I know there, there, there was some discussion last time about uh, potentially adding one position or potentially adding two positions. Um, we got additional information from the Secretary of State, uh, which I believe was in one of the emails that we received of what it would look like if we did just, uh, if we added one position, I know a lot of people in the committee were interested in going that route. Um, I can share that. I do have that posted as well if you want. It's up to you. Okay. Yeah. If you have it, that would be great. I can't seem to find it at the moment. So if you look at the budget page, there are two proposed amendments from the Secretary of State's office. The top one is the one with two positions. The bottom one was recently received information, <coughs> which is about one position. So that's the one I'll show you. So this um, amendment would establish one gen elections coordinator position and provide funding for related all other costs in um, the amounts of $90,759 in the first fiscal year of the biennium and $87,590 in the second fiscal year of the biennium and its general fund. Um, I can read through this justification if you want me to. I think we can. We can leave it up and take questions if that works. Uh, Representative Tuttle. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it, it, uh, not questions, but I, I, uh, I think in a matter of compromise, I think that accepting the one position is probably the way to go. I, I was really uh, concerned, but I, I think in the, uh, in, in, uh, in, doing something in a, in a compromising way. I think if we disagree, we're probably not going to get anything. So I, I would move that we would uh, accept the one position as a compromise. Okay, thank you. Representative Tuttle, is there a second? Second. 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 Okay, I think it was Representative Wood. Okay, so the motion was to move in that amendment uh, with the one position. Um, and seconded by Representative Wood. Uh, Representative Kinney. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was wondering if it could be read what, what Janet posted, brought up, just, uh, I am. Yep, we'll, we'll read it. I think we're losing you a little bit. So unless it's on my end, which it definitely could be. <laughs> um, Jenna, would you be able to read? Uh, I think it was on my end, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what I'm wondering is this. Certainly, and it, um, just to be honest, this weird spacing is not the Secretary of State's <laughs> fault. It's whatever happened when it was posted online. It got transferred into a PDF and looks funky, but that's not their fault. Um, says this position is needed to help manage and carry out new programs, conduct data gathering and analysis to inform program decisions and activities and to develop and provide guidance and training of municipal officials in about 500 voting jurisdictions. In order to comply with federal laws and ensure uniformity of process, the elections division has centralized several areas of election management. These include procurement and distribution of election, election supplies, leasing and development of a uniform system of voting tabulators, creation and testing of election media, processing of election, app, excuse me, processing of applications and issuance of ballots for uniform service and overseas Yokava voters. Also management of the central voter registration system, including oversight for data integrity of voter records maintained at the municipal level. Additionally, development and implementation of new voting programs, including implementation of ranked choice voting in 2018, the presidential primary introduced in 2020, accessible electronic absentee ballots and automatic voter registration. There has also been an increase in the number of people's veto positions, 
challenges, and lawsuits. This position is necessary to ensure that the Secretary of State continues to meet its statutory deadlines. Great, thank you, Janet. And um, Secretary Bellas, if you had anything you'd like to add on this, um, please feel free to jump in. Uh, oh, thank, there you are. There we go. thank you, Senator Lucchini. And I just want to thank the members of the committee for the really thoughtful conversation on Monday and just echo uh, Representative Tuttle in that uh, we think bipartisan support is really important and we're, um, we would, we're fully supportive of this version of the amendment. Great, uh, Chairman Chiazzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and I also um, will reluctantly support the, the amendment um, with the understanding that it's a compromise that we can all get behind. So uh, I do hope that the unanimous consent of this committee will carry some weight. And uh, certainly, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have to revisit things as we move forward with, with new initiatives. But um, my support is, is, is in the spirit of, of unanimity uh, of this committee, for sure. Thank you. Uh, Senator Hickman. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted just a quick headline briefing on the compromise from where we started by the proposal from the Office of the Secretary of State to where we have ended. Sure. Um, so I can jump in and then Secretary Bellas can correct me. But uh, so there was no actual proposal in the budget to increase headcount at the department. But as we went through the hearing, um, you know, we found that the Secretary of State's office used uh, tons of overtime hours and uh, Secretary of State Bellows has given us a breakdown of that on the committee webpage before you were um, here. And it, it amounted to about 1.4 positions basically. And so there was a question of if we should add two positions or one. And I think um, in the spirit of bipartisanship, we wanted to, to go with adding one position. I don't know, Secretary Bellis, does that sum it up accurately or? Very much so. Okay. Thank you. So are there any other questions or discussion? And I can't remember if anybody made a motion yet. We did, okay, we do have a motion. Okay, Representative Tuttle. Okay. <laughs> I have like, 40 written down on this piece of paper. <laughs> okay, so the motion is to do the amendment as as um, as Janet showed earlier. Any other questions? Um, seeing none, we'll, oh, Representative Dolliff. I don't have a question. I oh. just wanna say thank you very much to the Secretary of State um, for compromising. I'm sure you could probably use two, but we're in some tough times and we'll revisit it next year and see if we can add another one or not. So thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right, seeing none, we'll proceed to a roll call vote. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Yay. Senator Farron, yay. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCrae. Yes. Representative McCrae, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Topeka. Yes. Representative Topeka, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dollop. Yes. Representative Dollop, yes. 11 in favor of the motion, zero against motion, and two members absent, Mr. Chair. Great, thank you, Karen. Um, and thank you, Secretary Bellows and, and Deputy Flynn uh, for, for being here and apologies for the delay. Uh, I think Zoom takes a lot longer than 
in person <laughs> for some reason. My predictions are way off. So thank you both. Uh, yeah, and that is there any other Secretary of State initiatives? Forgive me for speaking, Mr. Chair. Yeah, um, yeah no problem. I was just going to ask Janet that too, actually, before I talk. <laughs> I think we covered all the other ones. Is that right, Janet? Yeah, there was another initiative, but you voted on it and you already voted on the language part that went with it, MMM. So I think okay. that's it. Great, thanks. All right. Great, so I think the final piece that we have is um, uh, Office of Marijuana Policy. Is that right, uh, Janet? Okay, and it looks like we have, um, Director Gunderson, as well as uh, oops, Jenny Boyden here from DAFS. And I think it was two initiatives that we had remaining. <clears throat> and I think the rest we, for the rest of the budget from various departments we have covered. Yeah, it's one initiative and one language part. Okay. So back to the voting sheet. The initiative is on page two at the bottom. It's reference number 180, I'm gonna blow up a little bit. It eliminates one planning and research associate position, one position, one liquor tax auditor position and three state police trooper positions and provides funding for the proposed reorganization of one public service manager three position to a director office of marijuana policy position. And then if you look, you can vote these separately, but I'll just show you if you look, um, the language is part U and it puts the director office of marijuana policy in salary range 89 and adds the director of marijuana policy. I don't know why the line doesn't show here as a major policy influencing position. So the summary says that it adds it as a major policy influencing position and it adds it to the list of positions with salaries set by the governor. So if we look back, that's part U. If we look back, I think that's the last line here or the last little phrase here in this initiative, which is the reorganization of the public service manager three position to the director position. So that's just one part of this initiative. Okay. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Representative Tuttle. Uh, Mr. Chairman, would it be appropriate to move both in or would you like to do them separately? I think we can take it in one motion if you're good. I'll do that. Oh, so moved. Thank you, uh, Representative Tuttle. So that moves in both lines, um, uh, reference 180 as well as the part U language. Correct. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Representative Riley. Um, and we also did receive uh, communication from Department of Public Safety, I should mention. Uh, Representative Kinney. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. That's what I was wondering is if we did get, get an answer back from the Department of Public Safety regarding those uh, trooper positions and whether or not they can handle the work that would come from possible violations within ONP. Um, we did get a, an email communication this morning. Uh, Karen sent it over from the department. Do you have that by any chance, Janet? Or I, can... I do. It's not posted, but I can read. It's not that long. Okay. If you don't mind, that would be great. If you don't get tired of me. <laughs> Never. Um, it says, uh, hello, Karen. At yesterday's work session, Senator Lucchini discussed the elimination of several positions, including three state trooper positions, and wanted to know if the Department of Public Safety had any concerns. These positions were added to the Office of Marijuana Policy when the OMP and Adult Use Program was created in DAPS and have never been filled. This um, email is from Kendra Coates, by the way. I discussed this with the commissioner and we do not have concerns with the elimination of these positions. The state of Maine currently has 164 authorized law enforcement agencies across the state. These agencies include departments at the local, county, and state levels of jurisdictions. Without these specialty positions, the OMP would contact whatever agency has jurisdiction of the area they are actively working. Those agencies would in turn prioritize their calls for service and respond as appropriate given the circumstance. OMP's Director of Compliance, Vern Malik, is working tirelessly, tirelessly 
with the Maine Chiefs of Police Association and the Maine Sheriff's Association to maintain, to maintain excellent working relationships with law enforcement across the state. We're confident OMP will receive the support they need to accomplish their mission. And she just asked that it be shared. Okay. Thank you, Janet. Um, uh, Senator Hickman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to see that this part of the budget is being improved upon. Um, and I know this was a hot, contentious effort last session. But my question is, is there another part of this initiative or are these three positions simply going to the one director position uh, to restructure how that person, in this case, Director Gunderson is compensated? Um, so that's part of the initiative. Jenna, can you remind me what page the initiative's on, sorry. It's on page two, I can show it again if you want. Yeah, please, that'd be great, just so we can take a look at it. Sorry to keep going back and forth. I just think you want to see each other. <laughs> uh, it's helpful to see the sheet. It really is helpful because okay. it's hard to go screen to screen. So this initiative eliminates the planning and research associate one position, the liquor tax auditor position, and the three state police trooper positions. And then it provides funding for the reorganization of the public service manager position to the director position. Um, and it looks like, if you look, it eliminates five legislative counts, so five positions total, and it eliminates $469,000 of general fund funding. We don't have um, another initiative in our portion of the budget that increases it somewhere else. And um, I, I believe when, Ms. Coates was here, she didn't talk about them putting it in somewhere else, but I'll leave that to maybe the other people who know more. I just, that's the background that Senator Hickman missed. All right. And then can we scroll down to the part you language, Janet, if you have that, so we can see the second provision. <clears throat> because that does change the uh, directors. Um, it puts them within a policy influencing uh, uh, right. position. I think this must be supposed to be underlined. I don't know why it's not in the sheet they gave to us, but you'll see the director of Office of Marijuana Policy is added to a major policy influencing position. And then also the salary range, which is range 89 here, but what the summary says is that that's a salary set by the governor. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Yep. So the salary range 89 will now encompass this position. Is that salary range as high as the funds that are being consolidated for that position? Um, oh, there we have Ms. Boyd in here. Welcome. Hi, thank you very much. Um, the cost of moving the director from the current public service executive three or manager, manager three position to the director position in range 89 is net out of the savings that are identified. So we're identifying almost 470,000 in fiscal year 22 and 485,000 in fiscal year 23. And that's net of the cost of changing that position, which in total is about $10,000. And can you tell me, <clears throat> for purposes of transparency, what the salary range of 89 is in monetary? Um, I would have to go out and look it up, but it is out on the State of Maine website under the Bureau of Human Resources. All salary schedules for state government are, are posted out there. I can send you a link to, to where to find those. That information. That would be fine. Thank you so much. Sure. And and Ms. Boyden, when when you become in a policy or considered a policy influencing position, does that require you to do a lot more financial disclosures? Um, you. I couldn't remember. I, the, I'm not sure if there are financial dis 
I, yes, you do have to do a financial disclosure form. Um, I'm trying like to think what, to what I had to do. do. You're, okay. you're an appointed position, so you serve at the pleasure, um, where right now that position is, uh, it's a confidential level position, so it, it is not the same as a bargaining unit position, but it, it's not necessarily uh, an appointed position. And there are disclosures. Okay. Yeah, for, uh, for some reason, I thought at some point there was something similar to what we have to do, but I can't mm -hmm. remember exactly when that triggers. <clears throat> um, any other questions on this or discussion? Hey. Yeah, Senator Hickman. Thank you. I will actually look up what uh, Ms. Boyden has asked me to look up, but I guess my, 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 my related question is if the consolidation of five positions into one new director isn't, or is it exactly that amount? And if it isn't, then what happens with the savings that we, I know we never filled those positions. So they're just kind of numbers on a sheet of paper. What is the difference between what's on the paper if that money existed? because it was going to people who were already filled to what it will be now if it's only going to one person who already has the position and that salary will then be established by the governor to the person. I guess I'm just trying to figure out, is there a difference? You said it was $10,000, is mm -hmm. that? And, it, and is that because in addition to salary, the other costs for that position are absorbed in that? Such as benefits? Right, it, it would include the the increase in salary, the increase in the cost of retirement. Okay. Thank you. Um, so all of those are net. And this 469,000 and 485,000, this is going back to the general fund. Yeah, okay. As a, as a de-appropriation. Got it. Right, and that's net, the, the increase as yes. well, right? Okay, and, that, and that's from the elimination, okay. Yes. I got it, thank you. Thank you for clarifying, Ms. Boyan. Um, other questions on this? Um, seeing none, uh, we do have a motion uh, to move in both lines by um, Representative Tuttle and I think seconded by Representative Riley. That's what I have here. Um, any further discussion? Okay, we will proceed to a roll call. Senator Lucchini. Uh, yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Barron. Yay. Senator Barron, yay. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCrate. Yes. Representative McCrate, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Tupika. Yes. Representative Tupika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dollop. Yes. Representative Dollop, yes. 11 in favor of the motion, zero against motion, and two members absent, Mr. Chair. Great, thank you, Karen. And I believe that that is it, Janet, for OMP's <clears throat> initiatives. Just trying to yeah. scroll through it quickly. Yes. Oh, um, Ms. Boyden, did you have a? Yes, on, on Monday you had uh, asked about the cash balance and the medical use of marijuana account and what the budgeted versus actual revenues were. Yep. And um, so I, I thought I could provide that information for you. That would be great, yeah. Okay, so the current balance um, in the medical use of marijuana fund is approximately $9.2 million. Revenues have exceeded budget by approximately 2.7 million in each of the last three years. There are two factors that are really causing revenues to be uh, above budget. And Eric can go into this more in much more detail, but that would be recent law changes, which commercialized the caregiver model and the cannabis industry nationwide has become booming since the pandemic. We expect that these 
revenues will level out um, with the adult use market capturing some of the share of this revenue. Um, so we think that these will go down, but at this point, it, we can't really gauge how much or when that will happen. Uh, additionally, the implementation of the new rule will come with a price tag, which could be upwards of $1.5 million. You know, this will provide countless resources to registrants for a smoother process, understanding that it is a new process and therefore will be a bumpy road. And there will be increased compliance costs after the implementation. In the future, not now, but in the future, there may be a need for additional field investigators to be funded through the medical account. Um, and then I do wanna note that there's also a pending transfer of a million dollars from this account in the current fiscal year. In the 129th legislature, public law chapter 514, which was an act to reduce hunger and promote Maine agriculture, transferred a million dollars in both uh, fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 21 from the medical use of marijuana account to the unappropriated surplus of the general fund, which then was appropriated uh, for the statewide hunger relief program within the Department of Agriculture. Great. Thank you for that. That's really helpful information. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> It'd probably be helpful ongoing too as we deal with some of those bills before us. Mr. Chair? Yep, Senator Hickman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Borden, what did you say was, I missed, I didn't take the notes correctly. How much are we over budget in revenue? Approximately 2.7 million a year. Thank you. Uh, Representative Tuttle. Um, um, Mr. Chairman, I wish that uh, Representative Corey was here because I <clears throat> wanted to tell him that you can always tell an Irishman, but you can't tell him much. But you've got you got to be Irish to say that. And in honor of St. Patrick's Day, may the Lord have mercy on our soul, and may St. Michael sing along, and may we be dead two hours before the devil knows we're gone. Erin Gobra, happy St. Patrick's Day, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Tuttle. <laughs> Great. Well, is there anything else we need, Janet, on the budget? I think it's kind of a, a long day today. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Boyden, and thank you, uh, Director Gunderson, for coming in today. I didn't notice if Director Gunderson tried to vote again, but uh, <laughs> <see. laughs> Uh, other than that, I think that's it for today, right, Janet? Yeah, I'll just work on the memo tonight so that it can go to AFA tomorrow. The chairs will approve the memo, then you'll be given a copy. And I don't know if there'll be an in-person report back, but the chairs can arrange that with folks. Okay, yeah, we may, we may look into that since we've made some changes uh, for an in-person one. What time Friday, Mr. Chair? Uh, Friday, we're gonna be in at Looks like 9 a.m. for, uh, we've got three, three public hearings and then we were planning like an initial work session on those uh, foreign contribution bills. I think Janet's put together a lot of great information just to break down what each one's proposing so that we can uh, look at that and think about it before we take any votes on that. If, uh, but just to get at some initial work done. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Some, Oh, it's, sorry, Senator Hickman. It's me. I, because of Representative Tuttle's last poem, as it were, I feel compelled to say that um, I started a, an a cappella group in college, and our signature song was the old Irish blessing. So I will just say, may the road wise up to keep you, and may God hold you in the hollow of his hand. And happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. I have a, a little Amen. card. I have a card with a shamrock from an Irish national runner who gave it to me in my wallet, but it's not around. I know you beat That's him, cool. Louie, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Representative Chiazzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just, for you know, housekeeping purposes, wanted to let the committee know we probably ought to plan on some Fridays moving forward because uh, we got quite a heavy bill load. 
Um, I know there was some questions about, you know, availability and stuff, but so um, we are Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and obviously as the timekeeper and the holder of the iPhone that everybody hates, I have to be the bearer of bad news and say, please reserve your Fridays for committee because we're probably going to need it moving forward for a little while. So thank you. Yeah, we just got hit with some confirmation hearings, which we had to put next Friday uh, because we have a very tight window on when we can do those. Uh, Representative Kinney. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to echo and say slancha. That is the Irish uh, version of cheers. Um, and also wanted to welcome now Senator Hickman. I'm going to have trouble with that one, too. Um, serving with him on ACF for four years out of six and serving with him for six years as Representative Hickman is going to be a tough one for me to remember to say correctly, but welcome to VLA, or technically you were here before and I'm not, I'm new, so I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you didn't get rid of me when you came, when you came back. <laughs> Put it that way. <laughs> uh, Representative Wood. Do we have any idea of how many bills that are coming to VLA? We have a rough idea. I think it's like 140. Is that right, Janet? Or is that? It's hard to say because sometimes titles never make it into bills, and mm -hmm. we've got a pile of department bills, which usually are a little bit of monsters to work on. So we've got a ton of work. We're, we're one of the busier bill load committees generally. So top five, but we're also the top performing committee. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. I've let my other committee already know that. That's right. Great. <laughs> All right. So I think that is it for today. So we'll see everybody on Friday morning at nine. Thanks for sticking it out today, everyone. Right. Take care.